radio check. One, two, three. Mic check. One, two, three. Radio check. One, two, three. Mic check. One, two, three. Good morning, Good morning, ladies and ladies gentlemen, and welcome, welcome to the 51st, to the 51st San, Diego San Diego Crew Classic. Classic. What a beautiful, what a beautiful day, for day for racing here, here at Crown, Crown Point. Point. We are going to be looking, be looking at, at an amazing day of racing with, with juniors, juniors, masters, masters collegiate, collegiate division one, two, three, and two club, club racing. racing. We have we crews have representing five different, different countries, 102 different clubs. It's going to be an awesome day. You'll be joined by Shane Farmer. My name is Adrian McConnell. We will get ready and kick off racing here in just a minute. But first, we'll go with the national anthem. If you could please rise, remove your hats, and honor our country. <laughs> Right, and here we go with our first race of the day. This is the women's under 16 eight. We have four crews on the water. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Oakland Strokes. Lane three, Marina Aquatic Center. 
and Lane 4 NorCal Crew. And it looks like we have a clean start. All boats are off, taking their first strokes out into this race. The first race of the day as we sit here in beautiful San Diego watching the sunrise over the hills to our east enjoying that warm weather every crew out here surely happy about this nice clean water that we've got this morning as these crews get off we are looking even currently through lanes one two and three we'll see how things play out in the first 500 as we all know those early strokes are just a way for teams to settle in get their bearings on the course for the day Make sure that they're comfortable and happy, and as they get through that, generally you start to see the race begin to play out as they get those strokes under them, and they start to jockey for position. That's right, and it does look like our early leader, just by about a half a deck, is going to be Marina Aquatic Center. They're being challenged right next to them by Oakland Strokes, pretty much even, and Oakland actually making a big move here right now as we come up to the first 500 meters gone. So Oakland now is your leader. So made a big push there as they cross that line. In second, we're gonna go over to lane one. That's gonna be Marin. Marin in that second place position, but not a whole lot of separation between these top three crews, Oakland, Marin, and Marina now in third. NorCal just a little bit off the back there, but still in contention. And there you're seeing a great angle of that lead crew starting to push away. Those two crews sitting at the back, there's a good opportunity when you see this side-by-side -side angle to check that stroke rate, see how crews are matching up with one another, see if you're understroking, overstroking based off of where that's putting them in position. All right, coming into view here, we're gonna see Oakland Strokes in that in lead that position now with a bit of open water. So they're in that spectator area coming through here. All these boats, again, this is a preliminary race. All these boats will move on to a final. So at this point they are racing for lanes, but it is Oakland, Oakland with that lead position. Very close here between lanes one and three, Marin and Marina Aquatic Centers. So come on down to the beach, take a look at this between Marin and Marina, too close for me to call. I'm going to give that slight advantage right now to, Mar to uh, Marina Aquatic Center for that second place position, but just barely over Marin. And right as we come across the finish line here, listen for that horn to call the end of that race. There's our winner, the Oakland Strokes. Looks like followed by Marina and then Marin in third in this race. NorCal crew starting to make their way here to the finish line. well-fought race between those crews. Oakland Strokes having about a length. Marin and Marina Aquatic Center having a hard-fought battle for that second place position. And now we have our first race of the day under our belts. See that next race lining up. This is the men's under 16, eight, the Rose Cup. And they are off in lane one, Newport. In lane two, NorCal Crew. In lane three, Pacific. In lane four, Long Beach Juniors. And in lane five, Marina Aquatic Center. Those boats now getting underway. Starting off, looks like we may have some breakage there in lane five. Oh, unfortunate here for Marina Aquatic Center. Yep, all boats have been stopped. So for those of you who might be uh, a little bit new to uh, to rowing within, and, and Shane, you were just out racing yesterday, so maybe you can talk, uh, speak to this a little bit. That first 100 meters is really crucial. Something goes wrong in the boat. Um, the boat should stop, Coxon raises their hand, the referees will assess uh, whether or not there is damage that needs to be fixed in the boat, but it does look like all crews have stopped. So we'll have a bit of a delay um, as we 
most likely will skip over to the next event and then come back to this men's under 16 eight. Yeah, Adrian, you know, this is a good opportunity inside that first 100 meters. It, it is that chance to make sure that you get a good fair race on the water. Should there be some kind of equipment breakage or something go catastrophically wrong, which doesn't happen very often. It's in it's going to be in those first few strokes. And so it gives every crew an opportunity to make sure that they are getting a fair fight in this race. And so when a crew needs to exercise that breakage inside the first hundred, you know that uh, when they reline up, you're going to have a fair race between all crews. So you'll see those crews beginning to turn. They're going to paddle off here. All right, so as those crews make their way off the course, we are going to switch those positions between the second and the third race. So the next race that's going to take off is going to be the women's under 16 quad, the Ultra Challenge Cup. That under 16 eight Rose Cup, they're gonna paddle off the course. They will be taking that third position. So here we see those quads coming into the starting boat, starting to make their way to the lanes. In this race, the women's under 16 quad, we have in lane one, Newport Seabase. In lane two, NorCal Crew. In lane three, Los Gatos. And in lane four, Long Beach Junior. All right, so we have a good cross section of California crews represented in these under 16 quads. It's good to note though, these quads are actually with a coxswain. So a lot of these crews, the under 16 and under 15s, a lot of these athletes are gonna be novices. They're in their first year of rowing. So it's definitely an advantage to have a coxswain steering that boat for you. Um, it's gonna be a little bit slower than the other quads because you're carrying an extra body, but man, does it make a difference to have someone uh, getting the boat down the course in a straight, uh, straight and direct line. <laughs> yeah, we both know that uh, when you're a novice sitting in a small boat, the last thing you want to have to do is worry about what your course or your line is going to be. And when you're new to racing, especially getting on the water, finding that comfort of trust and knowing that you're going to make your way straight down the course is extremely important to building confidence for the athletes. And so placing a cox in that boat, even though it is a quad, just means that those athletes are going to have a real opportunity to race or a much better opportunity to race rather than feeling like they need to spend the entire race worrying about are they on course, are they staying within the buoys. And this gives them a great chance to actually feel that racing pressure where each boat is lined up against one another. They're having a chance to sit side by side and do the thing that they came here to do, which is to race for placing. I'm on carpool duty for lacrosse, and I have to prep for Taco Tuesday. I'm too busy to try to chat. We get it. With Active and Fit Now, it's easy to find a gym that fits your schedule. With no long-term contracts, plus tons of on-demand workout videos, and a well-being coach to help keep you on track. Click the link and get Active and Fit Now. All right, and this is a great overhead shot here of what it looks like up at the start. What you're gonna see is the boats backing into the starting blocks. The coxswain's gonna give them direction. Looks like one of those boats getting a little bit of assistance um, from the refs and getting 
exactly where they need to be. But what's the feeling that you've got? Shane, you were just out there on the water yesterday. What it, What is it like up there at the start? You remember back to your novice years. I know for me, it was probably too long ago for me to remember, but. <laughs> That's one of the best parts of the race. It's uh, it's the nerves, it's the butterflies sitting in your stomach. You know that you're just moments away from being able to take your first strokes. It's this pent up energy that's getting ready to unload on the first few strokes and you're just pining. You're pining for those few first few strokes to be able to get that energy out of your system and get into that flow that hopefully you've achieved and found through practice and you have the ability to apply here on race day. But sitting in the starting boats, especially here at the Crew Classic, being San Diego, you got, you've got those those uh, cars overhead from SeaWorld. And so you know that you have spectators there. People are watching. People are getting excited for you. It just makes for a really great start. Yeah, and we really can't ask for better conditions right now. doesn't really look to be that much of a any push from the wind. Um, definitely a little different than it was yesterday. So we're looking at a really great morning of racing. Um, what you're seeing there on your screen right now, though, is those eights that are going to be coming back into the starting blocks after we get this race off and running. Um, but here we go, getting ready here for the women's under 16 Cox Quad. This is the Ulster Challenge Cup. We've got four crews represented. This is a prelim. All these boats will progress to the final. Um, but again, it's just racing for lanes. So here we go in lane one, Newport Sea Base. Lane two is NorCal. Lane three, Los Gatos, and lane four, Long Beach Junior Crew, and they are off. All right, those crews starting to settle in as they are about to finish off that, fir that first span of the bridge. You've crossed through two bridges here in the race, and this being the first bridge. Once you pass through that first bridge, it gives you a good indicator visually of where you are in the race. So those athletes, whether they like it or not, their peripheral vision is going to give them a little bit of perspective on where they are in that race. You know that you haven't quite hit that first 500 yet, but it is a good opportunity to be settled in now, knowing where you are, knowing whether you are at race pace and where those other boats are settling into. It looks like Newport Sea Base starting to take that lead, followed by Los Gatos in that second place position, third place currently sitting between NorCal Crew and Long Beach Junior. That's right. So two different races kind of going on here, Newport Sea Base and Los Gatos closest to each other. And then side by side, really even at this point is NorCal and Long Beach Juniors. So. A lot of these athletes in their first year of rowing, this is great experience to be out here at the Crew Classic. It's a high pressure situation, but honestly, a lot of these crews have already raced this season. Junior racing starts, I'm gonna say back at the, the end of January, they'll start to get their first side-by-side -side racing, but really unique here with four lanes across and even some of the later races, we're gonna see eight boats across. So racing here at the Crew Classic, again, putting themselves into that kind of championship mindset. So it's a good practice for what's to come for the rest of the season. But right now we're seeing a pretty good push here by Newport Sea Base and Los Gatos almost side by side. Back behind them by about a length and a half of open water, it's going to be NorCal just slightly ahead of Long Beach Junior Crew. And at this point in the race, seeing that third place position being battled for, you can, you can safely assume that those two crews are gonna be fighting for third place uh, right now, between Newport Sea Base and Los Gatos, you know that those two, those two are really going to be thinking about who's going to be able to take this boat across the finish line first in this race. Currently, Newport Sea Base looking like they've got a bit of a leg up here, looking calm, confident, those oars getting into the water. Something interesting to watch as you're looking at the boats is check out the surge as that boat lifts and settles back into the water. 
for those of you that may not be incredibly familiar with rowing, you may be here for the first time, something to watch is, again, what those boats are doing as the athlete puts that oar in the water, it is lifting that boat out of the water. It's sending it into a push. It's creating momentum. And then as that stroke is about to be finished, you're noticing that water settle back, that boat settle back down into the water. And you can use that as a bit of a perspective to understand how are the crews running? Are they surging? Are they settling? And when you see two crews side by side, that gives you a good indication of what may be happening as the race moves on. That's right. And a little bit of the angle that we're getting from the drone and from the cameras might be a bit misleading. So hard to tell um, exactly how close Newport Sea Base and Los Gatos are to each other. But Los Gatos, a program that has been focusing a lot on sculling over the last few years, very successfully, um, both here at the Crew Classic from last year and at the national level. And these young athletes definitely supporting that focus on sculling. We're seeing Los Gatos come up to challenge Newport for that first place position. And right here they are at the 500 meter to go mark and it is Los Gatos now with that lead. That looked like it was a nice move by Los Gatos there to push themselves into the lead. Now you can see some beach in the background of that shot there. That means that they are about to pass that 1100 meter mark and they're starting to hit their second bridge. Again, we're using landmarks and those athletes are using landmarks too. So are the cautions. Uh, not to mention, you also have the buoys, which will change colors as the race goes on. That's an indicator to everybody as to where they may be in the race, giving five every 500 meter indication, as well as when you hit the final meters of the race. There's a good shot of that second bridge. As you get through there, the athletes know that they can take that finish line. It's coming up on them, and they know that it's either now or never is the time to make a move and to solidify where they are. So I got to imagine Adrian Los Gatos right now, Feeling pretty good about what they made through that middle of the piece here. How do you think Newport Sea Base is feeling? Well, they both look pretty calm, to be honest. And again, if these are rowers that are within their first year of rowing, a lot of the time what you'll see is a lot of frantic movement at the beginning of the race. And anyone can do anything for the first thousand. It's really what happens at that thousand meter line that makes the difference. And that's where we see a little bit more maturity maybe coming out of the Los Gatos boat as they are a bit more calm. But Newport Sea Base pushing back here. So a lot of power coming out of both of those boats. They have pushed each other so hard that there is now a good amount of separation over Newport Sea Base, Los Gatos, between NorCal and Long Beach Juniors. So they've really left those other two crews quite a ways behind them. And here we go. It looks like Newport picking up the rate just a little bit, trying to really challenge Los Gatos for that first place position. Again, this isn't on the line for medals. This is really just for lane placement in the finals. Um, but they are putting quite the hurt on each other as they come down to the final strokes here. So they're going to be coming into view down in the spectator area here in just shortly. And as Adrian said, it can be tough with these camera perspectives to know exactly where the race is at any moment in time, because depending on where the camera is, that can be uh, sending a little bit of a different signal as to who may be in the lead. So the best thing that you can do is make your way to the beach. If you want to see the true positioning of the team, you make your way down to the beach. And as she mentioned, those crews are going to start to come by here any moment you get your way to the beach and now you get a real perspective of what's happening in that race. You're going to see who's in the lead. You're going to see those boats surging or falling behind. These athletes can pace the finish line at this point. But as she mentioned, this is not for medals. This is for placement. So there's also something to be thought about here as to how hard do I go? How much do I hold back? Knowing perhaps what my position is going to be, what my seating is going to be in a later race. So it's a real measured effort at this moment. And also the benefit here, again, we mentioned the coxswain. So the coxswain giving the strategy to the boat as they come into their final strokes, lifting the rate. So the rate is how many strokes per minute those boats are going. So for some of you that are, might be new to the sport of rowing, we're going to use some language, but maybe try and explain a little bit of what we're talking about. So the rate lifting here as they come into the final 250 meters, as soon as those buoys hit red, that is the final 250. And that's where we're going to see the rate come up. You can see that reflected in both of these boats. Newport Sea Base looking like they have a lead by about two seats right now over Los Gatos. But we're going to watch this all the way down to the line. Behind them by uh, quite a few lengths of open water, it's going to be NorCal Crew and Long Beach Juniors. Long Beach Juniors in that third place position. NorCal in fourth. 
But here we go, all the way to the line, it's gonna be either Newport or Los Gatos to take that first place spot. And here we go, coming into their final stroke, looking at the finish line right in front of them. Currently looking like Newport Sea Bay just ahead, Los Gatos right behind. Listen for that horn to indicate the end of that race. Looks like maybe one seat between those two boats. What a well-fought race. NorCal crew, Long Beach Juniors here, settling to get themselves across the line. You can see those crews still picking up the rate. Inside their final stroke. And there we go, there's another horn. All right, and in this next race, we are back to our men's under 16, eight, the Rose Cup. In lane one, Newport. In lane two, NorCal Crew. In lane three, Pacific. In lane four, Long Beach Juniors. And in lane five, Marina Aquatic Center. We got a great overhead shot of this race. Again, back in the starting blocks, but actually in real time, these guys are already almost at the thousand. So we're gonna get a good shot here of the start. And then here we go. This is actually where they are now as they just passed the, the halfway point. Does look like Newport is way out in front. They've got a good amount of open water there between themselves and Pacific. Pacific in that third place spot. In second, it's going to be NorCal, excuse me, uh, Pacific in second. In third, it's going to be NorCal, NorCal rowing out of lane two. In fourth, we're gonna move over to lane four, that's Long Beach Juniors. And then finally, Marina Aquatic Center in fifth. And here we go, we're getting a shot of what looks to be NorCal crew and Pacific side by side there with Newport having a demanding lead in this race. You can see their rate up. As you come to the beach, you're gonna be able to see that Newport team starting to come down the course. A good indicator when you see those white peaks of the tents, you know that they are making their way towards the finish and that's your opportunity to make your way to the beach. In two and three, New, uh, NorCal Crew and Pacific sitting side by side. NorCal Crew still having an opportunity to perhaps make a push on Pacific here. This would be an opportunity for them to make a move, and it looks like they are right now. You can see that boat surging. And as I say that, it looks like NorCal Crew moving right through Pacific, not able to respond to that move. Big move there by NorCal over Pacific. Bay Area rivals there. NorCal rowing in the port of Redwood City. Pacific rowing on Lake Merced in San Francisco. But those guys see each other quite often throughout the regular season. 
but it is Newport by themselves up front, Newport with quite a program, especially in the development stages um, as they feed into the varsity crews, we see a lot of speed coming out of the younger boats and we're seeing that right here in this under 16.8. This is the Rose Cup. This is a preliminary heat. Again, all boats will move on to the final, but right now this is just quite a show here by Newport as they leave the other crews to battle it out for second, third, fourth, and fifth. Newport showing some impressive power in that boat as they surge to the finish. NorCal crew here looking equally as strong as they make their push. Having made up enough space over Pacific, they could probably feel pretty comfortable in that second place position with Pacific holding on at this moment. Looks like NorCal just breaking free of the Pacific bow. So a little bit of open water there for NorCal in their final strokes. Pacific coming in third behind them by about three lengths of open water. It's going to be uh, Marina Aquatic Center actually in that fourth place position and then Long Beach Juniors in fifth. And I believe when we saw that breakage, that was that Marina Aquatic Center boat. So good to see them recover and settle back into this race. There goes the horn for Marina Aquatic Center. And coming up, Long Beach Juniors taking their final strokes. All right, and all crews across. Got the jitters out in that first attempt at a start for this race. And with novices, you're going to see a lot of that. You're going to see a lot of jump starts. You're going to see some broken equipment. So always good to get the jitters out because they're going to be able to come off of the course today, kind of recalibrate, reanalyze, okay, what can we do different in the final? There's nothing like a false start or breakage to get those jitters out. Everybody knows how that feels. You, you take those first strokes and all of a sudden everything gets restarted again bit of a blessing and a curse exactly good to have butterflies but if they're all flying in different directions not good Up next, we have our men's under 16 Cox Quad, uh, similar to our women's under 16 that we had two races ago. Sitting in lane one, Oakland Strokes. In two, Newport Sea Base. In three, NorCal Crew. In lane four, Los Gatos. And in lane five, San Diego Rowing Club. Now, as with the last race, this race is underway. So what you're seeing on the camera, a little bit deceptive as that race is a little bit ahead of where you're seeing on camera right now, but it is still a good perspective to catch what happened during that start, perhaps give some perspective as to where those crews may be when we catch up with them. Yeah, for sure. And with these young crews, again, we've got a lot of energy, a lot of aggression and excitement at the start. So sometimes you'll see a boat really jump out with a great start, but then, you know, just maybe put out a little bit too much energy and they see that come back to haunt them as the race gets further in. in. And so at this point, we're gonna catch up with these guys at about the halfway point and we'll find out where exactly they settled in and what the separation is between crews. Now, Adrian, when you got your start into rowing, were you, a, were you a junior's rower? Did you find it in college? How did you get your start? I got my start in high school. And back then, we definitely didn't skull. It was you rowed one side, port or starboard side, and that's what you were. You were married to that. There were hardly anybody that switched between sides. Hardly anyone sculled in the United States. So these were this was quite a while ago. Um, but yeah, and it was a mostly, I would say, an East Coast sport. It was considered an East Coast preppy sport. I went to a prep school, so I had to do a sport, and I chose rowing. I'd say it looked like it panned out for you. Um, it worked out pretty well, and I, you know, it is a lifelong sport, and that's the great thing about coming to an event like the Crew Classic is that we get to see these athletes in the very beginning of their career, and then as they continue through college, through the elite level, and into the Masters, we're going to see kids here anywhere between 13 
and 80 out on the water. So, you know, I hope to be one of those people still at it in my 80s. Shane, what about you? How did you get your start? I was a college walk-on. I had uh, been a multi-sport athlete and just happened to get, I was one of those guys that got grabbed by the coach walking across campus on day one of school and they said, hey, you're tall. You should think about checking out this sport. And I guess it worked out for me as well. But as, uh, as we're looking at the race now, those athletes have hit that second or third beach, I guess, as we are coming into and starting to see that close to final 500. Right now, looking like Newport Sea Bay sitting in the lead in a close second. Oakland Strokes and NorCal Crew both fighting here. At this point, I don't know that you can say that this race is called. I think we have the opportunity for any of these three crews to really make a move. So it, this is a good one to watch uh, to see where these standings are going to fall when they hit the finish line. Yeah, I think Los Gatos uh, looks like they may be trying to put on just a bit of an even press challenge here. And like you said, nothing frantic. A good way to tell if a crew is getting frantic is to look at the splash of those oars as they get into the water. The more splash you see, the more frantic it tends to be. And as I say that, it looks like Los Gatos is making that move here. So get your eyes to the finish line because this could be a real interesting finish as Los Gatos making a push on Newport Sea Bay. Start both of those crews starting to push Oakland strokes behind. Let's watch as this race comes in here. Looks like Los Gatos may have taken their way into that lead position. Cool, steady pressure got them there with no real panic. Yep, that's right. Los Gatos just kind of calmly marching their way into the lead. Newport Sea Base right there. Oakland just behind by about a length, but it's going to be pretty close. I'm going to, it's too close to call for that finish between Newport Sea Base and Los Gatos. Oakland in third. They will be followed by San Diego Rowing Club. And looks like NorCal Crew, our last crew on the water in this race. All right, and we are already underway in race number 27. This is the women's under 17 quad. None of these crews have a coxswain in this boat. It is all about the bow seat to steer that boat into a straight line. And we've got six boats on the course. In lane one, Redwood Scholars. Lane two, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane three, Maritime Rowing. Lane four, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane five, Los Gatos. And lane six, 
Channel Islands Rowing Club. So a great cross section here, California crews and then one crew from Connecticut that's maritime rowing, a very storied program perennial youth national champion medalists. So they're coming all the way out here to the West Coast to test themselves against the best of the West Coast. So take your final look at these boats here because we're going to cut to where the race is actively in just a moment here, right about the 1,000 meter mark, and there we go. You can start to see those crews. A little tough to tell from this perspective what the current standings are, but once we get a little bit more of a overhead or a side shot, we'll be able to tell a little more clearly. All right. Like Redwood Scholars may be sitting in the lead, currently followed by Marina Aquatic Center. Following them in third. Oh, looks to be an outside crew there. Perhaps Los Gatos sitting in that third place position or potentially even sitting in one of the top three positions. Tough to tell from this camera perspective there. Following yeah. them, looks like we've got Long Beach Junior behind them, Maritime Rowing. And then Channel Islands sitting in that outside lane. That's right. Channel Islands, a smaller club rowing um, out of uh, the Oxnard area, just south of Santa Barbara. So a fairly new program, um, but doing a great job here as they come down to test themselves at the Crew Classic. But Redwood Scholars out in front, but being challenged by Los Gatos on the outside lane five. They've got to be pretty savvy. That bow seat's got to look across and keep their eye on lane five because that Los Gatos boat is moving. Redwood Scholars, they are the defending champion in this event, in this under 17 quad. Um, but again, this is just a prelim. All these boats will advance to the final. Um, and again, there's a little bit of strategy in that when you are racing for lanes, you just kind of want to see what do these other boats have? Where's the, where are the moves happening? Or do we just want to execute put down a solid race and maybe keep a little bit close in terms of what our true race plan is. Redwood Sculler is a storied program rowing in the port of Redwood City as well, focusing mostly on sculling. Those athletes dominating quite a few of the sculling events nationally. And we see that expertise here as they come to the line. It will be Redwood Scholars holding on to that lead by about a length over Marina Aquatic Center, Marina Rowing, and Marina Del Rey, also a strong program, both in sweep and sculling, but I'm gonna say definitely focusing quite a bit on these smaller boats, on the quads, and here they are pushing themselves into these final strokes. It's gonna be Redwood for the win, followed by Marina, and then Los Gatos rowing out of lane five. They're in that third place position, followed by Maritime, Excuse me, followed by Long Beach Juniors and then Maritime with Channel Islands in six. And I got to give it to Los Gatos on that one. It's never easy to be in an outside lane without crews around you to be able to maintain a position like that. Um, as I'm speaking, here comes across the line, Maritime rowing, Long Beach Junior, Channel Islands sitting out there in lane six, making their way to the finish. But Adrian, it's never easy when you're sitting in a lane by yourself with nobody around you to be able to maintain your focus, know that you're still in the fight. So kudos to Los Gatos for that. It's, it's never easy from the outside lane to be able to find that kind of placement. No, that's right. And, you know, without a coxswain, again, these boats are, you know, it's a lot of internal dialogue. So you've got usually the bow seat that's um, calling out directions and kind of giving placement. Um, but they've got to be pretty savvy. The maturity in these boats is really at quite a high level. Um, so they do, they have to have just their head on a swivel, but maintain an internal focus. And All right. As, as we say that, we've got the men's under 17 quad coxless here taking off in lane one, Los Gatos, in lane two, Redwood Scholars, in lane three, Newport Sea Base, in lane four, Texas Rowing Center, and in lane five, San Diego Rowing Club. These gentlemen taking off in the race. As always, there is a bit of a delay, so we get to see the start of the race. Things sort themselves out, and then we bring ourselves to as the racing is in the heat of the moment. I think it's actually a pretty nice way of being able to catch rowing. 
Yeah, that's right. Because there is a whole lot that happens. That second 500 really tends to kind of shake things out a little bit. So again, we talked about the excitement and the aggression that comes off of the start. But then as they settle into their base pace, that's really where these boats will find their rhythm and their true boat speed. So they get down to kind of a, a maintainable rate. And it does look like right now that Los Gatos boat well out in front, these guys performing at the national level um, quite successfully. So they're showing that here as they continue to prioritize these um, these quads as, as their top boats within their men's program. And TRC, Texas Rowing Center, sitting in that second place position, followed by Redwood Scholars and Newport Sea Base, looking pretty side by side as they come in. They're crossing that second bridge. This is an opportunity for one of these crews to set themselves apart as they get into later racing. And there's a really nice angle from the drones. These drones give us a beautiful perspective on the racing. When we get those side-by-side -side shots overhead, it gives us a really great opportunity to see what is happening in the race. You can see Texas Rowing Center there sitting in that boat closest to us, that blue boat, sitting comfortably in that second place position. Well ahead right now, Los Gatos sitting in lane one, out of camera. And there we see Redwood Scholars, Newport Sea Base, stroke for stroke. Anything can still happen for these crews as they come to the finish here. That's right. So we've got Redwood Scholars and Newport Sea Base right next to each other, really just kind of pacing each other. They're about the same stroke rate. And again, we talked about that internal focus that the boats have to have. At this point in the race, it's really just about maintaining your rhythm, maintaining your focus, and keeping your your mindset on your boat not worrying too much about what's happening in the other boat because you can only control what's happening in your own and we're seeing that right now play out between newport sea base and redwood scholars right there in the center of the course los gatos well out in front they've got this race in control but right now the race is going to be in lanes two and three between redwood scholars again rowing out of the port of redwood city newport sea base rowing in the back bay of newport a uh, newer program, it's not new really anymore, but one of the younger programs, I would say, in junior rowing in uh, California. We've got Texas Rowing Center, though. They made a big trip all the way out here to San Diego. This is kind of like a prize for some of these crews, paying off their, their winter training, getting to come out um, and row on a great course here in San Diego. But look at these guys. Here comes winding it up, Los Gatos coming into their final strokes, looking like a very mature and seasoned crew. Yeah, the ability for, you know, under 17 at this age to have the level of knowledge and tenacity to sit in a race like this and find cool, calm, collected power, not easy. I don't know that I could have done that at that age. And here we're seeing as these crews come across the finish, looking like Texas Rowing Center sitting in that second place position, following by... Following behind them in third looks like it's going to be Redwood Scholars with Newport Sea Base in that fourth position. And just a quick note there, San Diego was a scratch out of that last race. So just those four boats on the course. Coming up. On the course and underway, it is the men's under 17 quad. This is heat number two in lane one, Long Beach Juniors. Lane two, Maritime Rowing. Lane three, River City. 
Lane 4, Woodlands. Lane 5, Cathedral Catholic High School. And Lane 6, Utah. And just to note, in that last race, the previous race, the top four crews advance to Final A. The remainder goes on to Final B. And same for this heat. This is the top four boats advancing to the grand final or final A, and then the remaining boats moving on to the B level final. All right, here we go. We are at the halfway point here in this men's under 17 quad. This is the second heat. Top four boats advance to the grand final. And out in front, it is lane one, Long Beach Junior Crew. In the second place position, it's going to be pretty close here between Maritime Rowing, River City, and uh, looks like Utah out in lane six. This is one of those moments where it can be tough to tell positioning based off of camera position. And so one of the best things is you can do for these races when you're not quite sure is make your way down to that beach because it's going to give you the clearest perspective of where those boats are. And as you see them, you use those buoys in a, as an alignment for your own vision to be able to tell, all right, how are these crews actually coming across as they make their way towards the finish? Looking like Utah may be in that fourth position. But Maritime and River City looking like they're battling for that second position right now with Maritime with the edge. Currently, Long Beach Jr. still sitting comfortably in that lead coming down the course. You're starting to see that beach in the background. Haven't quite hit those white tents yet, which means that they still have some racing in front of them. All right, yeah, Long Beach Juniors now with a little bit of separation between themselves and the rest of the field. Maritime pushing hard as they try to pull a little bit further away from River City. River City rowing out of lane three. Utah rowing in that bright red boat in lane six. You can see them all the way across. Again, a good program. Very small, though. Tend to focus on the small boats, the doubles, the singles, and this quad looking pretty speedy. Hoping to be in the top four as they look to get a spot in that grand final. There's nothing like taking the opportunity in one of these races to be able to put yourself in an inside lane on a race. If nothing else, that inside lane just gives you the confidence of where you stack up against those other crews. And it can make for a really great racing environment when you know that you have that grand final coming up. So it is an opportunity to solidify yourself against the fast crews because sometimes a fast crew is going to give you a nudge in the long run. That's right. It, and definitely helping you to execute the race plan. A lot of these race plans, again, as they come into the heat, it's a little bit different than it's going to be in the final. So they might want to not put down an entirely fast, you know, the fastest sprint. But we're seeing this Long Beach Junior Crew lifting the rate, making sure that they really try to execute that sprint as best as they can cleanly. And as they come across the line just behind them, it's going to be Maritime. Maritime coming all the way out here from Connecticut. They're followed by River City. And then here comes Utah. Utah followed by Woodlands, a crew from Texas, and then Cathedral Catholic High School from here in San Diego. Always nice to see some of the smaller programs making their debut here for the day. 
some of our local crews getting their initial stamp on the race for the day, knowing that they've got plenty more boats coming down the course throughout the day. All right, so unofficially, those top boats should be Long Beach Juniors, Maritime, River City, and Utah. Important to note that any of the finishes that we call are definitely unofficial, as we definitely are unofficial <laughs> people out here. We're just calling it as we see it. We sit here at the finish line with a decent perspective, but we're not the ones blowing the horn. This so is, we're just calling what we see. It's officially unofficial. <laughs> 6X Pro Solar Edition Smartwatch. From ergometers to exercise classes, Active and Fit Now provides a flexible and affordable fitness program that sets up members like you for perfect workouts. Sprint to the Active and Fit Now booth to learn more and register to win a Garmin Phoenix 6X Pro Solar Edition Smartwatch. All right, coming up, it is going to be race number 30. This is heat one of the women's youth quad. This is the Concept 2 trophy. Very, very competitive uh, event here. We've got 10 boats on the course um, between these two heats. In lane one, Los Gatos. All right, here we go. Race number 30 in lane one, Los Gatos. Lane two, Maritime Rowing Club. Lane three, Utah. Lane four, Community Rowing, San Diego. And lane five, Zlack. Got to give a shout out to Community Rowing San Diego here. One of our crews from down in the South Bay, one, probably one of the newer clubs in San Diego. Um, they are a nonprofit that has done amazing work in the community down in South Bay of San Diego bringing youth to the sport of rowing and making the sport of rowing accessible to the community. And what they are doing is amazing. You'll find that a lot of community rowing athletes are around here today, volunteering their time and their efforts to help with the crew classic. So if you see any kids running around with community rowing gear on, make sure you give them a big thank you and, uh, and compliment, them, compliment them on the work that they're doing and finding their way to the sport of rowing. And that's really the key is making rowing accessible to the most number of people. That's one of the things that's really great about a race like the Crew Classic is that we see that really good cross section. It's not just about competition. A lot of the time it's just about, you know, it's participation and finding yourself amongst the best in the nation, putting down a great race, feeling good about your efforts. Uh, Community Rowing of San Diego definitely doing a nice job of getting a lot of kids onto the water and putting them out here in an awesome competitive and supportive environment. Right now we're looking at, again, this is Los Gatos. Los Gatos, again, focusing on those sculling boats. They're really showing that this morning as we look at this women's youth quad, Los Gatos with quite a commanding lead. That is a beautiful shot as we look overhead. Los Gatos with open water over the rest of the field. They're gonna be followed by Utah in that bright red boat. So easy to spot out on the course, that Utah boat in second. They're sitting just ahead of Maritime Rowing. In fourth, it's going to be Zlack. Zlack is easy to see as well. They've got a bright yellow boat. And in fifth, it will be Community Rowing. Community Rowing out of lane four. Decent spread across the boats right now as they are settling into this race. Starting to come into that final 500 meters here. You can see those tents in the backdrop there. Lane one, Los Gatos sitting comfortably with that position. Now, when you are in a race with a with a position like that, there's not a whole lot that you need to do to continue on other than just make sure you finish this race cleanly. There's no extra effort. It's a really nice place to be, especially when you're sitting in heat. 
to be able to row across the finish line in control without having to put out everything you've got because it gives you the opportunity to save a little bit. And with the spread here between Los Gatos, Utah, and Maritime Rowing Club, each of those boats at this point can kind of comfortably say, all right, this is going to be our placing for the end of this race. It's not really worth our effort to exhaust ourselves at this moment in time. What we need to do is get a clean finish, make sure that we get across the line. We know that our placings are what they are. There's not much more that we can change at this moment in time. That's right. Being smart about the energy expenditure is definitely key here. Um, you could see in that Utah boat, the bow seat just looking across her right shoulder. She wants to make sure that they've got Los Gatos still within sight. That Utah boat blurring re really cleanly, again, pretty relaxed. Um, definitely great catches there. A lot of swing in that boat. So great effort here by Utah. A lot of the time what's going to happen is that when they get out of these, out of these heats, the coaches are going to look at the times, the spread between each crew. This race is going to be a little interesting, though, because there is such a spread between boats that, again, there might not be a need for that Los Gatos boat to put on a sprint. So not really um, going to see their true true speed on the water here as they're not really being pushed. We've got a lot of spacing between each boat. Utah, again, with a lot of space between themselves in front and back. We've got Maritime rowing there in lane two with a good amount of space between themselves and Zlack and then community rowing pulling up in that fifth place position. But here we go, final strokes here as Los Gatos just walks away with the lead. Utah still sitting in that second position now, looking comfortable, upping that rate maybe just a little bit, but also not looking frantic. Looks like they're just putting on a bit of a steady press increase in rate here, not really trying to jack it up for a full sprint. Following them, Maritime Rowing Club now sitting in that third place position, also looking comfortable, taking rate up as they're supposed to, but it doesn't look like they're putting in any extra effort there. They're just making sure that they get that thing across the line. Sitting out in that yellow boat, we've got Zlack coming down the line. One of the home clubs to Mission Bay here. One of two clubs that sit on the bay. You've got Zlack and you have San Diego Rowing Club. Community is rowing there down on the course. Take a look back. They're about to cross into that five final 500 meters. All right, and as Community Rowing is wrapping up their race here in heat one of the Women's Youth Quad Concept 2 Trophy, we are going to turn our attention over to heat two. Again, five boats on the course in lane one, Redwood Scholars. Lane two, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane three, Thunder Crew. That is a team from Canada rowing out of the University of British Columbia Boathouse. Lane four is Woodlands, the Woodlands Crew of Texas and Lane 5 Cathedral Catholic High School from right here in San Diego. So again, important to note, top three crews will advance to Final A, and then the remaining crews and on to Final B. Community Rowing San Diego crossing that finish line.
All right, here we go with uh, this second heat of the women's youth quad. We've got Redwood Scholars well out in front right now. Looks like about a length of open water over the rest of the field. Really nice racing, though, between places two and three. That's going to be the Woodlands crew. Uh, that w Woodlands in second place, followed by Long Beach Juniors, and then Thunder Crew from Canada in fourth. In fifth, it will be Cathedral Catholic High School. But right now, the race is going to be between Redwood Scholars and Woodlands. Yeah, Woodlands and Redwood Scholars looking pretty strong against each other right now. As I've mentioned in past races, sitting on those outside lanes without having a fast crew right next to you can always pose a bit of a challenge. So for those crews out in lane four or five that are making a push, you know that they are really having to look across those lanes to make sure that they are connecting to those crews that they're challenging. And Woodlands doing a decent job of that right now. Long Beach Juniors looking like they've taken a step up on rate here. Getting those blades in the water nice and quick, but all crews looking like they're responding. Redwood Scholars looking a little more comfortable out there in lane one right now. You can tell they don't necessarily have that same sense of urgency as they're coming into the finish line, feeling fairly comfortable with their position at the moment, just knowing that they have to keep those other crews off, but that they don't have to fight to try and make a move for inches here. And again, because this is not necessarily an age group category, this is an open uh, event. We could have 15, 16, 17 year olds in this boat. We've got a lot of experience in these quads. That Redwood boat sporting some athletes that have international experience. So really quite a bit of maturity. Um, and again, they wanna put down a great race, really execute, make sure that they get into that grand final. Redwood doing a nice job commanding that race from start to finish. And it looks like Woodlands took that second place position, followed by Long Beach Juniors. Thunder Crew there just crossing the line. And it looks like CCHS down there, Cathedral Catholic coming down the course still to finish their race. And Cathedral Catholic, a private school from here in San Diego. So one of the few scholastic programs, um, they really focus their season on racing at scholastic nationals at the end of the season. And coming up next, our race is going to be the men's youth quad. There are plenty of other places where the ocean meets the shore, but in Southern California, it just feels different. We think it tastes different too. With a wide range of great tasting, high quality beers handcrafted in San Diego, we here at Coronado Brewing Company have made it our life's work to bring the coastal lifestyle directly to you. So go ahead, try and find another place quite like this. Good luck trying. Until then, we'll be here. with heat one of the men's Go. youth quad. This is the Joan Ward Memorial Cup. You see these boats just getting off of the start and we've got seven boats on the course this morning. Here in San Diego, we've got eight boats, uh, eight lanes of racing available. So this is gonna be a busy one with seven boats on the course. In lane one, Los Gatos. Lane two, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane three, Redwood Scholars. Lane four, Channel Islands. Lane five, Woodlands, Lane 6, Mile High Crew, and Lane 7, Utah Junior Crew. It's always fun when you have a larger lineup coming down the course as you start to fill 
all those lanes, you start to have a little bit more excitement in the racing because there are more crews out there, more races can happen. You can have jockeying happening depending on the position. And in this one, our top four are going for the grand and the remaining will go to the petite after that. Both crews settling in comfortably as they got out of alignment. You can see that those wind conditions starting to pick up just a little bit as they're blowing uh, across some of the jerseys that the athletes have there. Really nice perspective of the start of that race. Crew settling in, getting comfortable. And as they come into that thousand meter mark, that's where we usually pick up the race as we start to know where they are, starting to see our standings and how the race is shaking out. That's right, and early on, we do have Los Gatos as your leader. They are rowing in lane one. So Los Gatos with just a slight lead right now over Long Beach Juniors. In third, we're gonna move all the way over to lane five. That's Woodlands Crew of Texas. They are in that third place position. In fourth, we're gonna move back into the inside. That's lane three, Redwood Scholars. So Redwood Scholars in the fourth place spot with a lead over Channel Islands Rowing Club. Channel Islands in fifth, followed by Utah and then Mile High Crew. So in this boat, it, or in this race, the top four boats will advance to final A, the remaining crews on to final B. So we're looking at a good push for those top four spots. The remaining three will move on to final B. And right now it does look like Los Gatos, Long Beach, Woodlands, and then Redwood Scholars are your top four boats. Gatos looking comfortable in their lead right now, sitting in lane one right behind them, Long Beach Juniors. All right, so again, this is um, what I would call more of an open category. So there's not, this is, is not an age group category. This could be anywhere between 18 and 14 years old. It's basically what I would call the best of the best in the club. So this is the most competitive quad um, within each program. And uh, Los Gatos, definitely one of the most competitive quads in the nation. They proved that last year at Youth Nationals. Uh, just next to them, Long Beach Junior Crew, also a perennial powerhouse in the sculling events. Woodlands Crew coming all the way out here from Texas. They wanna throw down a great race make sure that they get into that final A. And right now they're doing exactly what they need to do in order to get into that grand final. Redwood Scholars, also a storied program. Redwood Scholars consistently putting their scholars into the Youth National Championships, coming back home with medals, as well as here at the Crew Classic, starting out their season strong. They're in that fourth place spot. So right now looking like they will move on to that grand final, unofficially of course. And what you mentioned, it's it's quite nice when you get to put together, as you call it, a, an open lineup here where you get to take the best of the best and put them into one boat to see how fast you can make a boat move. And so these races are pretty fun because what you're seeing is, uh, is almost the fastest representation that a coach might think they can make when they show up to this race. How fast can I make a boat go? I'm just taking the athletes that I think can make this boat go the fastest. And that makes for great racing because that means across the line, especially when we have as many boats as we have, that it's gonna make for a good race across multiple heats. That's right, and that's what I was just thinking. You know, we've got these top four boats that are well out in front, but look at the remaining field. We've got Redwood, uh, excuse me, we've got uh, Utah, we've got Mile High Crew, we've got Channel Islands. Those boats are pretty close to each other. So at this point, it does look like they will progress to final B, but that's gonna be a great race as we look at both Utah and Channel Islands pretty close to each other. Just a little bit off the back, it's gonna be mile high, but they're also within contention. There's still a little bit of overlap with those boats as we come to the final 500 meters here of this men's youth quad. And important to pick up on is that usually we're looking for one, two, three, but as we mentioned, one through four go to the final here. So we're actually looking for those top four boats, which right now looks like Los Gatos in one, Long Beach Juniors in two, Redwood Scholars in three and Woodlands in four, as I'm seeing it right now. I may be incorrect on that. As always, I reserve just a little bit for being wrong. Not much. <laughs> Most of the time, Adrian, I feel like I am, right? But, you know, as we're sitting here at the finish line, 
anything could change that we might not be able to see the perfect perspective. That's right. And as they come into view here in the spectator area, Los Gatos been holding on to a nice stroke rating of about 36 strokes a minute. That's pretty aggressive, but pretty standard these days at this point in the season. So Los Gatos holding on to that lead next to them, Long Beach at a slightly more elevated rate. I had them clocked at about 38 strokes a minute. So doing their best to see if they can take away a little bit of that lead as we come to the final strokes here. Great racing here side by side between Los Gatos and Long Beach as we get towards the finish. Long, Long Beach looking like they want to put a challenge on here for Los Gatos. They're going to see what they can do in this final bit. They definitely look like they're stepping it up to give a challenge. Los Gatos may have gotten a little comfortable there thinking that they had that lead, not expecting Long Beach Juniors to make this push. As it looks to me, Long Beach looking like they may have moved their way into that position at the perfect time. Let's see if they can hold on to it as they take their final strokes coming into the finish line here. Long Beach Juniors looking like they nudged themselves ahead by a couple seats. Pushing out Los Gatos for that one position. What a push at the end there. Well done by Long Beach Juniors. And here looking at three and four coming in. Looks like Woodlands is sitting in that third position. Followed by Redwood Scholars in that fourth place. So it looks like we will have Los Gatos, Long Beach Juniors, Woodlands and Redwood Scholars all making their way to the grand final. That's right. And here comes Channel Islands. Channel Islands, again, a smaller program rowing out of the port of Oxnard. They've got a good amount of water behind them and in front of the final two crews. So that's Channel Islands right there. They're going to be followed by Utah Crew and Mile High. If you're all about messing around in boats, having a good time, having a good piece of equipment for your lake house, for your sailboat, or you know, these boats are great. I know that I've seen that you can basically pack them and carry them onto an airplane. You know, wherever you like to go, wherever you want to row, this is a way to keep rowing. You can't put your single in the overhead compartment. Rowing an oarboard is stable, safe, and fun. It converts a paddleboard into a performance rowing boat. Now you can go rowing and play in the waves. Oarboard is revolutionizing the sport of rowing. I'm stuck at work all day. I don't want to be stuck at the wrong gym. We get it. With Active and Fit Now, you can choose from thousands of gyms with no long-term contracts or cancellation fees. Plus, tons of on-demand workout videos and a well-being coach included in your membership. Click the link and get Active and Fit Now. The future is threatened by enemies often unseen. And unexpected. In the midst of an uncertain and evolving world, the need for Marines to defeat these shifting threats is critical because the need to ensure stability for our nation has never been greater. When there are battles to win for America's future, there is one constant Marines. The future is threatened.
We are coming up on race 33, the men's youth quad. As uh, the last race we saw, this is an open race. No ages here. We are looking in lane one at Brophy. Lane two, Maritime Rowing Club. In lane three, Indianapolis Rowing Club. In lane four, Texas Rowing Center. In lane five, Community Rowing San Diego. In lane six, River City. And in lane seven, Unity Boat Club. All right, again, this will be the top four boats advancing to the grand final. The remaining boats will advance to final B. And we've got a good cross section here of crews, uh, just two from California with Community Rowing of San Diego and River City rowing out of lane five and six. And then we've got Unity Boat Club from Philadelphia. This is Unity Boat Club's first official uncoxed quad race. They're going to be rowing in a beautiful Hudson quad. It's named the Howard 64. The boat's named after Howard University's 1964 rowing team, which was the first all-black rowing team. Now, there's a story for you there. These guys coming all the way out here to San Diego and looking great there rowing out of lane seven. And we're starting to see that spread happen on the boat. Looking right now like Maritime Rowing Club sitting in first, followed by Indianapolis Rowing Club, then Texas Rowing Center in that third position with perhaps Brophy in that fourth position or Community Rowing, tough to tell right now. A River City looking like they may be sitting in that fourth position. All right, yeah, now great racing here between Maritime. Maritime coming uh, from Connecticut and doing quite well on the national level. They definitely have crews and athletes that move on to the international level as well. So always great to see them out here because they are the best of the East Coast. And right now they're proving that as they hold on to that top spot. Just behind them, it is Indianapolis Rowing Club, obviously rowing in Indianapolis, Indiana. Texas Rowing Center just behind Indianapolis in that third place position. Looks like River City is holding on to that fourth place spot with Brophy in fifth, followed by Community Rowing and then Unity Boat Club. These crews right now looking at like they're settling at about a 36 on the stroke rate. For those of you unfamiliar with the sport of rowing, that stroke rate is how many strokes per minute each crew is taking. That stroke rate is just one lever that these athletes can pull in order to determine their boat speed and it is used as a way to find rhythm in the boat. And so that stroke rate is extremely important and can determine a bit of the speed. Now, it's not the only determinant of speed because it's also important that when you're on the water, these crews are able to move together. And often the fastest crews that you see are the crews that are able to move in sync, that look flawless, that look like they have no breaks in the chain. So for you as a spectator, when you make your way to the beach, when you're trying to understand what you're seeing here, one of the things to watch for is how do the bodies of this crew move together. And when you see the camera shots, or if you're standing on the beach, those crews that are moving well, that look like there's nothing happening different between athletes, those are often the fastest boats on the water. Now, it's looking like Brophy, looking like Maritime Rowing Club sitting in that one position, followed by Texas Rowing Center now, challenging them perhaps for that first position with Indianapolis Rowing Club in that third position, and perhaps River City sitting out there in that fourth place position. Now again, as in the last race, the top four go to the final here. So those top four boats are the ones that are looking to make their way to the grand. So we're not necessarily looking at one, two, three. We're looking at one through four here. All right, so again, Maritime Rowing Center as well as Texas Rowing Center together looking at the one two position with indianapolis rowing club still sitting in striking distance so indianapolis definitely don't count them out here anything can happen at this point in the race still indianapolis rowing club staying close enough 
that there's still a race to happen, which means, you know, if you have a crew that maybe was taking an opportunity to settle back a little bit, not show their cards too early, might have a late push, is definitely something that could still happen here. Maritime and Texas still battling, though, for the one-two position. And, you know, interestingly enough, Shane, those were your top two boats from last year's San Diego Crew Classic Maritime taking home the gold, followed by Texas Rowing Center, just a couple of seconds separating them out. So it's kind of cool to see that battle playing out again here um, at this year's Crew Classic Maritime and Texas right next to each other. All right, now that we're getting a little more clear perspective, it definitely looks like Maritime out in one. Texas Rowing Center in two, Indianapolis Rowing Club in three. They're inside their final 500 meters as they are waking, making their way down the course. When they hit that black flag, that is an indicator that they are inside their final 250 and buoys are changing colors. As those buoys change colors, that's a visual signal to the rowers that, hey, it is time to go. We cannot hold anything back and we need to stage our sprint if we need to change position. Now, again, if your positions are pretty set, then you don't necessarily need to stage that sprint. Crew sitting comfortably at the moment. All right, 37 strokes a minute there for Maritime. Again, the defending champion in this event. They look to hold off a charge here by Texas Rowing Center. Texas Rowing at a little bit lower of a stroke rate, maybe a little bit longer push there, a little more send in that boat. Just behind them, Indianapolis Rowing Club doing a great job as they have continued to hold tight to Texas Rowing Center. Really not a lot of change in speed between those two boats. So as they come into the final strokes, we'll see stroke ratings lift. And there we go, crossing over just a couple of seconds in between Maritime and Texas with Indianapolis in third. In fourth, it will be River City. Broken oar in lane one on that race means that Brophy has not been making their way down the course in case you were wondering where that team went. Yeah, a little bit of an unfortunate um, occurrence there for that Brophy crew because they definitely are pretty speedy in these small boats. Unity Boat Club bringing their way down the course now. You can hear the cowbells ringing for them. This is Community Rowing crossing the line now. There's their horn. They get to take their sigh of relief now that this race is done. Paddling their way through the finish. Now we are having some breakage issues through this race. So there may be some updates as to where those other two crews are. The original Broken Yoke Cafe started in 1979 in Pacific Beach and has since become a Southern California favorite for breakfast, brunch, and lunch. 
Broken Yolk Cafe is more than just a place to eat. It's a gathering spot for friends, families, and communities. Our cafes are designed to be comfortable and inviting, providing a relaxed atmosphere where conversation flows and memories are made. We are proud to be part of your mornings, whether it's a casual weekday breakfast or a leisurely weekend brunch. Life begins after breakfast at Broken Yolk Cafe. Coronado Brewing Company has been brewing abundantly hoppy West Coast-style ales and the great tradition of San Diego craft beer since 1996. Founded by Ron and Rick Chapman in their hometown of Coronado, Coronado Brewing is a local brewery committed to bringing the spirit and flavor of San Diego to beer enthusiasts everywhere. Stop by the Coronado Brewing Beer Garden to enjoy one of their award-winning beers. Coronado Brewing Company. Stay coastal. Discover Mission Bay's 27 miles of sandy shoreline and 4,600 acres of aquatic recreational space, providing adventures for all ages. Enjoy family-friendly activities and everything from boating and kayaking to paddleboarding and biking at the world's largest aquatic park. Stay, play, and dine on Mission Bay. Check out hotels, events, and more at discovermissionbay.org. Mission Bay Yacht Club's ideal location makes it a favorite venue for national and world championship sailing regattas. The San Diego Crew Classic thanks the Mission Bay Yacht Club for their many years of support and volunteerism that helps the regatta thrive in our shared home on Mission Bay. Want a flexible fitness solution that's affordable? Discover the Active and Fit Now program today. For $32 a month, you can get access to a robust fitness program without long-term contracts. Visit the Active and Fit Now booth to learn more and enter their drawing for a free Garmin GPS smartwatch. Now on the course, we have our women's youth B quad. In lane one, Redwood Scullers. In lane two, Los Gatos. In lane three, Redwood Scullers. In lane four, Utah. In lane five, Los Gatos. And in lane six, Redwood Scullers. Three crews represented from Redwood Scullers here and two from Los Gatos, with Utah sitting squarely in the middle. Got to be interesting to be Utah in this race, being surrounded by so many athletes from only two crews. Surely a lot of glances happening back and forth between these boats before the race started. So many of them know each other, I'm sure. And this is fun, too, because, again, this is just a preliminary heat. All these crews will advance uh, to the grand final. So this is really just a run down the course to kind of see how that race plan is going to shake out. Um, Redwood Scholars here with three boats, so they know how they train. I mean, when you race against uh, your your athletes with um, against your teammates every single day, they kind of know what the race plan is. They know the strengths, they know the weaknesses. So there's got to be a little bit of um, kind of internal push uh, between those Redwood Scholars boats and then the two Los Gatos boats. Now, Adrian, as you look at a race like this, you got to think about you know how much. Each of these Redwood crews, they, they know each other. Then you've got your Los Gatos crews. They know each other. They've been in training with each other. So they know what kind of speed they're perhaps capable of. But when you say that, you know, all of them are going to be going to the final, how much do you actually give in a race like this to hold back and then to be able to show up into that final and show your true speed? There's got to be a couple different decisions being made by each of these crews here about how much they hold back, what cards they show throughout this. Um, I definitely think that's a consideration. Oh, yeah. You know, and what happens at practice is not necessarily what's going to happen on race day. Anyone can have a great day and anyone can have a little bit of an off day. Um, so, you know, there could be some surprises out here 
between those three Redwood Scholars votes, the two Los Gatos votes, but we've got Utah representing their entire state surrounded by awesome California crews. So they are definitely still in the mix. That Utah boat rowing out of lane four, they currently are occupying that fifth place position. But let's get some placements for you. We've got Redwood Scholars, I'm gonna call them the A boat in lane one. They are well out in front occupying that lead position. They're followed by Los Gatos. I'm gonna call them the A boat in lane five. So lane five, that's Los Gatos. They are in second. They're followed by Redwood Scholars in lane six. Close to them, it's going to be that B boat of Los Gatos in lane two with Utah in lane four, and then finally the third Redwood Scholars boat. sitting at about a 36 now many of them inside their final 250 here looks like that might be Los Gatos sitting in the lead followed by Redwood Scholars so we'll call them Los Gatos A Redwood Scholars A lanes 1 2 I should say 2 1 in that order following them another los gatos crew another redwood scholars crew with utah perhaps and then or redwood scholars followed by utah i should say lots of redwood <laughs> Lots of Redwood Scholars here, lots of Los Gato teams. And Utah, again, important to know, they are all heading to the final. And so this is almost a tune-up for the final for these athletes. So always that consideration for how much a crew gave to get down the line here so that they could be ready for their next race. I'm on carpool duty for lacrosse, and I have to prep for Taco Tuesday. I'm too busy to try to gym. We get it. With Active and Fit Now, it's easy to find a gym that fits your schedule. With no long-term contracts, plus tons of on-demand workout videos and a well-being coach to help keep you on track. Click the link and get Active and Fit Now. The Marines are a family that fights together, finding individual purpose in a collective cause, the protection of our nation and the advancement of its ideals. Side by side, they welcome obstacles and thrive on challenges. Each Marine stands as a vital part of a united force greater than any individual, more fulfilled than ever before. Visit the USMC tent on Vendor Row to learn more. Have you seen Concept 2's new comp blade racing down the course today? The comp is a smaller size blade that feels lightweight, efficient, and stable. Unlock speed with the comp blade, available in both sweep and skull.
Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We're committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. Visit the So Sporty tent on Vendor Row to learn more. Rival Kit is pleased to be the producer of the 2024 official Crew Classic Uni. Rival Kit understands the necessity of high quality, consistent gear, which allows rowers to push their limits in training and racing. Get your official 2024 San Diego Crew Classic Uni at the Rival. San Diego Tourism Marketing District is a tourism improvement district serving all areas within the city of San Diego. SDTMD uses fees collected from local hotels to support the marketing and promotion. Promotional efforts of a variety of programs, services, and special events throughout America's finest city. SDTMD's support for tourism marketing allows San Diego to maintain its status as an aspirational first-tier visitor destination, and it's vital to the strength and success of the city's tourism economy. The San Diego Crew Classic is proud to once again have the support of SDTMD in 2024. Often unseen, Stay alert, Marine. and unexpected. In the midst of an uncertain and evolving world, the need for Marines to defeat these shifting threats is critical. Because the need to ensure stability for our nation has never been greater. When there are battles to win for America's future, there is one constant: Marines. The future. In this race, the fullest race that we have had yet today, in lane one, Maritime Rowing Club. In lane two, Los Gatos. In lane three, Long Beach Juniors. In lane four, Redwood Scullers. Lane five, Los Gatos. Lane six, Texas Rowing Center. Lane seven, Mile High. In eight, River City. Those are your eight lanes for this race. There should be some serious action here. All of these boats are going to be heading to the final. So again, a tune-up race for these crews. They are sitting ready in their stake boats. What a shot there! That is the perfect picture of what the start of the San Diego Crew Classic looks like. Right under the Sea World gondola, the starting pontoon there, and all those stake boats. Athletes sitting ready. And getting ready to take off. That's right, and this is basically a race for lanes. So,、um, as Shane said, all of these crews will progress on to the B level final.、Uh, but at this point, what they want to do is kind of get in speed order for the grand final.、Uh, generally, we'll put the fastest crew or the top seated crew in lane one, and then it progresses from there. So, this is a race for lanes, and we're sure to see a lot of action out here with eight boats across. That is a lot to keep track of. That is a beautiful look down the course there. If you look to the screens to see that overhead shot, you are looking at the starting line all the way down to the finish. When you look at it from this perspective, 2,000 meters doesn't seem that bad. And then you put yourself in the boat, and all of a sudden, 2,000 meters feels like an eternity. It always seems like a good idea until you get to the 1,000 meter line. <laughs> It's funny how in training a 500 meter piece can go so quick, a thousand meters can go quick, even 2K can go quick, and then all of a sudden you line up on the start line of a real race, and 2,000 feels like it just never makes it there. It just never ends, but that's why rowing is such a unique sport in the sense that you know it's really a training year-round for this 2,000 meter 
race. I mean, Shane, you do a lot with training um, on the ergometer and training different athletes of different levels. Uh, for these young athletes, training for a 2,000 meter race, you know, they, these guys might be just focusing on rowing all year long. Um, we don't have a lot of multi-sport athletes anymore at this level. When it gets to, to this level of junior rowing, there's a lot of kids that are just focusing um, on rowing and getting as fast as they can throughout the season. A lot of focus on training on the ergometer um, in, in the winter months. Um, and so we're really seeing this high level of fitness here. It's just gonna get even better as they progress through the springtime. Yeah, and with these junior athletes, you know, one of the one of the things that I will always be an advocate an advocate for are multi-sport athletes, giving these ath these athletes the opportunity to have a broad spectrum of fitness is so critical to youth fitness and their ability to perform. Yeah. And then when you look at an actual PK, that time domain, maybe one of the most challenging time domains that exists in athletics, and that's because you are maxing out on both the need for that sprint power, that anaerobic ability, the ability to drive power for a short period of time, but then you have to sustain it. So there's an important underlying aerobic base that's necessary for that 2000 meter race. And it brings in this real challenge where you have to balance your energy systems between those two, understanding how you're going to push, understanding how you're going to sustain and the ability to alternate between them as you move down the court and when you are racing and if you need to jockey for position, it requires that you have the ability to draw from your strength as well as from that underlying aerobic base in order to be able to perform well. And we'll pick up racing in just a few minutes. There's a slight delay at the start as things get sorted out. You can get comfortable and we'll come back to you once the racing is ready to go. Does your fitness routine have swing? Or are you still looking for that perfect workout? The Active and Fit Now program is a flexible and affordable fitness program designed to let you work out your way. Visit the Active and Fit Now booth to learn more and register to win a free Garmin GPS smartwatch. The Oarboard is revolutionizing the sport of recreational rowing. Transform your paddleboard into a performance rowing boat for the freedom to row anywhere, anytime. Stable and safe, it rows in wind and waves. Boat wakes? No problem. Training, fitness, fun, and adventure with the amazing Oarboard. Oarboard is super portable, breaks down fast into its wheelie bag so it travels as luggage and stores easily in your home. It comes with two-part carbon sculling oars for easy transport. For a challenging workout or a leisurely row, the Oarboard Sup Rower is the top choice for recreational rowing. Visit the Oarboard tent on Vendor Row to learn more.
and we have alignment. Quick start. Attention. All right, here we go. This is the start of the men's youth B quad. So uh, definitely an open open age race. This isn't uh, U15, U16, U17. This is an open race and so for some, some of the smaller programs, um, a way for them to really boost that varsity sculling program. Los Gatos is the reigning champion in this event. We also see the second place finisher from last year, Maritime, and third place, Texas Rowing Center. So we've got eight boats on the course. We're going to try and take stock of where they're at and give you some boat placements. And you've got to love those up-close shots of the athletes because it gives you a really great perspective of what is happening in the boat. There you go. There's a nice shot as you look at the screen. You can see those athletes moving together, that three seat peeking over what's happening in the lanes next to them. Now, when you have a caution, important that you keep your head on the boat often. You're trying not to change your perspective and just look across the race. You just let that caution do the work for you. But without a caution, it's important that you keep your head in the race and you understand where those other crews are so that you can race your race against the crews that are there. Now, this being an eight boat race, seeing these overhead shots is an extremely useful way to keep track of what is happening. Lane six, Texas Rowing Center, looks like they are perhaps in the lead at this moment in time. But again, early in the race, things are still sorting out. So you can't really take stock of what's happened at this point in the race to say, hey, that might be your finishing position. A lot happens from about 1,500 or 500 in to 1,500 down. And even as we just said that, there a little bit of change up here in the, the placement now. We see Head Set Texas Rowing Center um, was holding on to a slight lead, but as the race has progressed, there's a little bit more movement in between boats. It does look like Maritime in lane one is the leader. They're going to be closely followed by Los Gatos. So Texas Rowing Center slipping back to third, but again, a lot of overlap between those crews. We're still fairly early on in the race. In fourth, it's going to be lane three, Long Beach Lean Crew. They're followed by Redwood Scholars. So Redwood Scholars in the fifth place position. And then the second Los Gatos boat in the center of the course there in lane five will be sixth. And then finally, River City in lane eight there in seventh place. And our eighth place crew, Mile High from Colorado. They row there in Cherry Creek State Park. So we welcome them. They are the top junior rowing program in Colorado, and it's awesome to see them out here in San Diego. Beautiful shot there of our, our boats, and it does look like Maritime holding on to that lead just barely over Los Gatos. Looks like those boats are trying to kind of battle it out there for the lead. Now, for those of you not necessarily familiar with rowing, because there are a lot of parents here, there may be just some visitors who are here for the day and checking out rowing as a first experience. One of the things that you're seeing here is we see those close-ups on the boat. These athletes are sculling. That means that they have two oars. That is one in each hand. Whereas there's another type of rowing when we start to get into the bigger boats that's called sweep rowing. And in that sweep rowing style, each athlete only has one oar and those athletes have to be split across. So you have an even number of oars on each side of the boat. Each athlete has one big oar versus two shorter oars in their hands. Right now we are seeing what is probably going to be our last sculling race for a few races. After this, we switch over to sweep. Now we're taking a look at our standings as we start to cross that yeah. center island and hit our second really bridge. Really heating up like there. Los Gatos may be in that second place position. Maritime Rowing Club sitting in second. Tough to see who is in third in that position, but we're starting to come across to that second bridge now. Racing starting to get settled down. Yeah, really heating up there in lanes one and two between Maritime and Los Gatos. All of these boats are going to advance to the grand final. So again, this is kind of a race for lanes, but it does look like Los Gatos has pulled into that lead spot. They're now sitting about two seats over Maritime. Th so those two boats really pushing each other so hard that they have created even more space between themselves and the rest of the field. Solidly in third, it does look like Texas Rowing Center still holding on to that spot. We are going to move out um, to, let's see, we've got a, yeah, a little bit more, uh, some shakeup here in with the, the boats behind them. So let's try and get stock of where everyone is at here. Looks like in 
battling for that fourth place position, we might have River City, Redwood, and Long Beach Juniors uh, with Los Gatos a mile high sitting towards the back there. But great perspective right now on Los Gatos A and Maritime Rowing Club as they cross that 500-meter mark inside their final 500. If you are keeping stock of this race, make sure you make your way down to the sand now or eyes to the screen because you have two hot boats coming into this finish. Last check, we have Texas Rowing Center sitting in that third place position. As Adrian mentioned, they are currently racing for position in their final. So all boats making it to the final, but they will get shaken up into their lanes based off of their finishes from this race. And so there's a bit of bit of pride, but also for a bit of lane assignment uh, as they go into this race. So best that we can see right now, Texas Rowing Center sitting in that third place position. River City on the outside there looking pretty good, just ahead of what I believe is Long Beach Junior, Redwood Scholars, Long Beach Juniors, and Los Gatos there. Eyes to the water as these crews are coming into their final 250 here. Keep those eyes to lanes one and two where there is a hotly contested race happening at this moment in time. Maritime Rowing Club and Los Gatos coming down stroke for stroke right next to each other. This is going to be tight as they hit the finish line. Both crews bringing up that rate. Maritime looking pretty relaxed there. If this is a sprint, I can't wait to see what that looks like in the grand final. Los Gatos and Maritime side by side. Does look like Los Gatos is going to take that top spot just barely over Maritime. But again, you know, maybe holding the cards a little bit close to the chest to see what they can unleash in the grand final. Yeah, no, cra no crazy sprint happened there. I was clocking those boats at about 37, 38. So it's not as if they were taking that rate sky high for that sprint. It looked like both crews perhaps were comfortable staging maybe just more of a power press into the finish rather than needing to take that rate sky high cut layback and go for a true sprint finish. That's right. Texas Rowing Center held on to that third spot followed by Redwood Scholars and then River City. So a little bit of a change up there. And that looks like Mile High, our last crew coming down the course. Sitting there in lane seven. should be a great race later on when we get all of these crews kind of in speed order and lane order. Mile high coming across here. Great racing for them. Just a little bit off the back, but rowing cleanly. Well done to all crews. That was a lot of action out there. Beautiful water. Doesn't seem to be any sort of an issue with wind or chop. So really, really clean racing conditions. And we are going to come up with one more race here before we get into the collegiate events. This is going to be a bit of a time trial. This is for Unity Boat Club. We had a little bit of a technical problem in their boat um, earlier. So right now they're going to be coming down the race course on their own. It will be a bit of a, um, a time trial for them. Unity Boat Club, um, again, a crew from Washington, D.C. We welcome them here. This is their first official race in an uncoxed boat. And they're rowing in a beautiful Hudson quad. Um, so bring yourself down to the beach. Let's cheer these guys on as they row their way towards that finish line, looking really strong as they leave. We're looking at that overhead shot here of the start, looking great as they progress down the race course. So we will look for them um, coming into the spectator area in just a few minutes. Again, this is Unity Boat Club from Washington, DC. Looking great as they come into this, uh, just coming through their starting sequence here.
Camp Land on the Bay has a full marina and complete range of boat and water sport rentals for use on Mission Bay. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Camp Land on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 2024 San Diego Crew Classic. Concept 2 brings more than 45 years of innovation to the sport of rowing. Their newest comp blade is a smaller sized blade that feels lightweight, efficient, and stable. Unlocks speed with a comp blade available in both sweep and skull. Heads up and sit ready. The Active and Fit Now program is a flexible and affordable fitness solution specially designed to set you up to work out your way. Swing by the Active and Fit Now booth today to learn more and register to win a Garmin Phoenix 6X Pro Solar Edition smartwatch. Wintech and King Racing are pleased to be the official boat supplier of the 2024 San Diego Crew Classic. As the world's largest, most sustainable, and most innovative boat builder, they champion accessibility above all, offering a wide range of boats for every type of athlete and budget. Their extensive global network of distributors means that their mission can be carried out anywhere. Backed by 200 plus technicians at their state-of-the-art manufacturing facility and grounded in the time-honored design of the legendary Klaus Filter and Graeme King, you can count on the quality and performance of any one of their boats out of the 2,500 that are made annually. The Marines are a family that fights together, finding individual purpose in a collective cause, the protection of our nation and the advancement of its ideals. Side by side, they welcome obstacles and thrive on challenges. Each Marine stands as a vital part of a united force greater than any individual, more fulfilled than ever before. Visit the USMC tent on Vendor Row to learn more. Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We're committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. Visit the So Sporty tent on Vendor Row to learn more. San Diego Tourism Marketing District is a tourism improvement district serving all areas within the city of San Diego. SDTMD uses fees collected from local hotels to support the marketing and promotional efforts of a variety of programs, services, and special events throughout America's finest city. SDTMD's support for tourism marketing allows San Diego to maintain its status as an aspirational first-tier visitor destination, and it's vital to the strength and success of the city's tourism economy economy. The San Diego Crew Classic is proud to once again have the support of SDTMD in 2024. Rival Kit is pleased to be the producer of the 2024 official Crew Classic Uni. Rival Kit understands the necessity of high quality, consistent gear, which allows rowers to push their limits in training and racing. Get your official 2024 San Diego Crew Classic Uni at the Rival Kit tent in the center of Ender Row.
And race 36, the Women's Varsity 8 Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational. Our first heat is off in lane one, Washington. Lane two, Washington State. In lane three, Southern Methodist. So we have our three crews off on the course here. Our first sweep race of the day. The big boat's coming out. The big here boats at about the big guns. I yeah. Think. This is going to be a fun race to watch. That's right. But between these two heats, we're looking at three crews that are in the top 20 in the nation. We're looking at Washington currently ranked uh, ranked third. Texas coming up in the next heat currently ranked fourth. Cal in seventh. And right now, it does look like Washington in lane one is your current leader. They're sitting just a couple of seats over Washington State, the Cougars. Cougars being coached by Jane LaRiviere. She is in her uh, she is in her 22nd season at the helm there at Washington State. So a lot of experience, a lot of maturity, and we'll look to see great things coming out of that Washington State boat this season. In third, it's going to be Southern Methodist University. Southern Methodist going through some coaching changes this year. So a little bit of a different look for them, but great performances last year at the NCAA. Ninth place finish for their team overall. Best ever finish for an AAC program. So we welcome them here at the Coup Classic as they come out to test their speed against some of the best in the nation. You can see Washington there just slowly pressing their way away from Washington State and Southern Methodist University there. These crews, lanes one, two, and three, currently sitting in those very standings, one, two, and three. Washington just looking, Washington looking cool and calm as they press that boat away. There's that side look at Washington women getting those blades in so nice and quick. No urgency in that boat. Just calm, collected powers. They make their way down the course. Yeah, and heats are pretty important for these crews. A lot of these crews having not raced yet really um, this season, maybe some scrimmages, maybe some class day races. That's definitely true here for this Washington crew. So this is their first time down the race course against crews from across the country. Um, again, all crews are going to move on to the grand finals for the Jessup Whittier Cup. But what we want to do is test our speed. Again, this is all about execution. And Yaz Farouk, she's in her eighth year there coaching at the University of Washington, previously at Stanford. Yaz knows what she's doing. She knows how to put it all together when it matters. And right now, that Washington boat, those Husky ladies looking super strong, already with open water over Washington State. Washington State, the Cougars, their cross-state rivals to the Huskies, also with some open water between themselves and Southern Methodist University. And all three crews now just having passed that 1,000-meter mark, hitting that bit of open water there, coming into Bridge 2, the second bridge that these crews passed during their race. Everybody looking like they're just rowing their race here, still sitting in that one, two, three position, respective to their lanes, one, two, and three. Yeah, got all crews clocked at about 35, 36 strokes a minute. So again, not a whole sense of urgency here, but just really internal to their boat, listening to the coxswain, making sure that they execute their race plan to make sure that they can kind of calibrate where they're at in the season, moving on to that grand final tomorrow, and seeing if they can maybe even better what they have done here and get even faster tomorrow. And that's an important note about the San Diego Crew Classic. It is often called the season opener for many crews. This is the first time that a lot of these crews get to really get out and test where their boat is running for the year. And they use it as, uh, as that season opener mentality of, hey, all right, here we are. Here's our season. Let's see how we are putting out for the year. Let's test ourselves against some other crews for the first time, but also let's enjoy some sunshine and let's use this as a, a bit of a, a fun race. That's right. And I see a lot of purple coming down to the beach right now as the Huskies continue to hold on for that top spot. 
you know, there's four returning athletes from their varsity eight for last year. And man, that in a year, in an Olympic year, where you see a lot of shifting in the rosters, you see a lot of athletes that are moving on to train for the Olympic team. So they're not, they're not on their college rosters this year. It's really just anyone's game. NCAA rowing for women is wide open, um, but with four returning varsity eight athletes in that Washington boat, um, you know, and 11 seniors on the roster, it's looking pretty good for the Huskies this year. And that's a good note that you make about this being an Olympic year. Olympic years do change what happens in lineups when you are in collegiate racing because you have athletes that may be making a bid to get to the Olympics. And so their training changes focus from being focused on that collegiate racing level to something slightly higher. I would say the uh, the top of the top that any rower is striving for is to make their way to the Olympics. And, uh, and this year to be able to row in Paris would be a pretty esteemed honor. Absolutely. But, you know, with all of these programs, it's almost a prerequisite to have international experience. And, and Washington, Washington State and SMU is really no exception. We see a lot of international experience, a lot of U23, U19 um, experience coming into these programs. But it is all about the Huskies right now. Quite a bit of open water between themselves and the Cougars. So Washington State currently in that second place position. Nice catches there as they wind up for their final strokes coming out of that Washington State boat. But here they go, it's the Huskies first across the line. They will be followed by Washington State. Clocked Washington there at about a 36, so nothing crazy out of them. That's right, no Just sense. Just a nice solid finish. Not really a need to sprint there as they hold their line against Washington State. Good speed coming out of that Washington State boat. And then Southern Methodist University, one returning varsity athlete from last year, looking good here as they cross the line in that third place position. And that is the first heat of the women's varsity eight, Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational. Following this, we will see heat two coming up here in a moment. Heads up and sit ready. The Active and Fit Now program is a flexible and affordable fitness solution specially designed to set you up to work out your way. Swing by the Active and Fit Now booth today to learn more and register to win a Garmin Phoenix 6X Pro Solar Edition smartwatch. Mission Bay Yacht Club's ideal location makes it a favorite venue for national and world championship sailing regattas. The San Diego Crew Classic thanks the Mission Bay Yacht Club for their many years of support and volunteerism that helps the regatta thrive in our shared home on Mission Bay. Have you seen Concept 2's new comp blade racing down the course today? The comp is a smaller size blade that feels lightweight, efficient, and stable. Unlock speed with the comp blade, available in both sweep and skull. All right, race number 37 is just taking off. This is the Women's Varsity 8 Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational Heat 2. All to the grand final, so we are currently working for seedings in lane 1. Texas in lane 2, California. Lane 3, Notre Dame. And in lane 4, University of San Diego. Now, as with prior races, up, if you look to the screen, you are seeing the start, but we are not in real time on that start. These crews are actually midway down the course. So at a certain point here, we will switch over and see those live standings of what is happening in the race as we speak.
And you are definitely seeing some of the strongest crews in the country right now. This is some exciting big boat racing. And big boat racing is definitely a race to watch. You see a lot of bodies on the water, some big boats. It just makes for an exciting spectating here. Now, it looks like we're catching up with the positions of these boats. It's looking like Texas and California sitting one and two. A little tough to tell on positioning there, followed by Notre Dame. In three, University of San Diego out in lane four in that fourth respective position. And at the helm all those years, head coach Dave O'Neill. So Dave, really, again, you know, a great coach having put down some awesome seasons with Texas and previously at Cal. And there are those two crews side by side battling it out. It's the first time that they've seen each other all season. Again, the first time that these programs have actually gone down the race course uh, against some other crews that are outside of the circle. And if you make your way to the beach, you can see those crews starting to get into their final 500 meters here. Texas holding just a handful of seats here over California. Cal looking strong, though, trying to stay connected. Texas slowly pushing away as they reach that finish. Now, their times do matter because those overlap over the previous heat. So your finishing time will have an impact on the lane assignment that you get going into this final race. Texas pushing for the finish here. Blades digging in, starting to see some of that splash. They are not going to let Cal make a move on them as they get to the finish here. by about three seats over the Golden Bears of California. So close between these two boats, back to them, they have pushed each other so hard. There is quite a bit of open water between themselves and Notre Dame. Notre Dame coming out here uh, with Coach Martin Stone in his 26 years at the helm of that program. The University of San Diego now making their way to the finish. getting their final strokes across the line. Our next race taking off here, the women's D2, D3 Club Collegiate Varsity 8, the Grace Rat Memorial Cup in lane one, Orange Coast. Lane two, UC Irvine. Lane three, UC Davis. The speed class as we've got back-to-back -back exciting races and nothing's going to change there in terms of the excitement level. And moving over to the D2, D3, and club collegiate events. We've got a lot of competition going on between uh, the Southern California crews. They've already raced each other several times. So Orange Coast College always one of the top collegiate programs at this level. Uh, always interesting to note, it is a junior college, um, the only junior college that hosts a rowing team. Having rowed against Orange Coast quite a bit in college myself, uh, you do find that Orange Coast has consistently put out great crews. And uh, a lot of athletes use Orange Coast as a great school to come up in to start to get their first collegiate strokes on and then often will uh, find their way to other schools and they use Orange Coast as their proving ground for racing. That's right. We used to call it a strip club. That's exactly right. And we are live with this race that is as it is coming down the course. So Orange Coast looking strong here, starting to take that early lead. 
Starting to see decks overlapping there. Confidence in that crew as they row. UC Irvine sitting in lane two in that second position. UC Davis off the back. And Novice 8 performances are always such a great way to dictate or perhaps give you a little bit of an insight as to what's coming for the future of a program. If you've got a strong Novice 8, it seems like it's always a, a, a telltale that you may have some athletes coming back that are hungry, that have that fire, that are going to help to drive the success of a future program. UCI looking to maintain contact here as they have passed the 1,000 meter mark. Davis just passing the 1,000. But UCI hoping that they can hold that position so that they can make a bit of a push if they've got anything left in the tanks. Depends on what kind of sprint they've got staged for themselves and if they have the ability to draw up any control of this race right now. But as they've sat behind the majority of this race, Orange Coast has looked like they are maintaining control they've got do they got dominance early on they've not been willing to let go and they have steadily just pushed away inches every stroke to slowly open up that lead it's always a nice place to be as you get into a race at that point because you are not worried about having to make up space it also gives each of the athletes the ability to look over to the other boats to see hey where are they what kind of moves are they making it almost gives you uh, an advantage to be able to see what the other crews are doing. You can feel and sense when moves are coming, and it gives your boat the opportunity to counter. And speaking of movement, that Anteater boat, UC Irvine, they are on the move. So it really hasn't been a whole lot of change there between Orange Coast and UC Irvine. UC Irvine may be taking a little bit of space away from Orange Coast lead, um, but a lot of side-by-side uh, -side speed there between those top two boats. Just a little bit off the back, it is the Aggies of UC Davis. They are a club program um, run primarily by their students, and they have a great history of success at both the varsity level. They were a varsity program, um, now back to club level, but they actually have a couple of national championships in their belt from the early 2000s, so a lot of history in that program. UCI looking like they just upped their rate a little bit in an attempt to try and claw back some of that water between the two boats. We'll see if it was enough late enough in this race to be able to make any kind of a move. That's right. I've got Orange Coast clocked at 33 and a half strokes a minute. Irvine up at a 36. So a little bit more elevated stroke rate, maybe a little more relaxation and run coming out of the Orange Coast boat. Shane, what do you see uh, with that pirate boat leading the way? It looks like they've got a real strong finish sending that boat off. There's no urgency to rush back up to that next catch. They're comfortably putting their blades in, letting their bodies do the work to send that boat off. And, you know, one of the one of the signatures of finding speed in a boat is just making sure that you lock that blade into the water and then begin your push. What one of the killers of speed is if you drop that blade into the water as you're trying to tear that oar through the water. 
it just creates slippage of the ores and it's almost like having a slip in a transmission it means that you don't get to transfer all of that power that you've got from your athletes to the boat you want that direct speed transfer and orange coast looking very strong on their ability to lock in send their bodies to the bow push that weight through the oars and make that move make that move the boat right come on down to the beach take a look orange coast commanding this race from start to finish holding off a good challenge here by uc irvine they have raced each other previously in the season. Orange Coast coming out on top as they are here today. Just behind them, the Aggies of UC Davis in the third place position. All boats will move on to the grand final. But here they come, Orange Coast with the win. Looking very comfortable as they do so. Irvine now across the line. Still on the course, Davis. Quite a bit of open water there as Davis makes their way to the finish. Just a beautiful day here on the water in San Diego. Could not ask for better conditions. The water is calm. The sun is out. The beach is calling. We are surrounded by palm trees and rowing. Does it get any better than this? It doesn't, and the boats just uh, keep getting speedier. So we got another heat of the women's D2, D3, and Club 8s coming up. We've got four boats on the water, and we'll be back with racing in just a minute. And we are off race number 39, the women's D2, D3, Club Collegiate Varsity 8. In lane 1, Purdue. Lane 2, UC Santa Barbara. Lane 3, UC Irvine. Lane 4, UC Santa Barbara. Sending down their second boat. This is a heat along with the previous race. All will be making their way to the grand final, so they are fighting for lane positions in the final. And awesome to call out uh, for UC Irvine, the Anteaters. This is the first time in, in memory that they have been able to race two full varsity eights. So really great growth for their program. Looking good here, rowing out of lane three for them. Um, but calling special attention to the crew in lane one, that is Purdue, Purdue uh, club program. Um, Indiana, traditionally a top club program, they come out um, to the San Diego Crew Classic almost every year. And man, what a prize for those athletes to be going from the deep winter blues of training um, in Indianapolis to coming out to the sunny skies and calm waters of San Diego. But they're being tested right now. Purdue in lane one being tested by both UC Santa Barbara and UC Irvine. In fourth, it's going to be that second UC Santa Barbara crew, still within contact, but in that fourth place position. So keeping our eye on Purdue and Irvine and that second uh, lane two UC Santa Barbara boat challenging each other, but still a lot of overlap, still early on. Always fun to see a lane two or lane three boat making their way into the lead. You, it means you know that that boat that was seated into lane one is going to have to work to earn that lane. And it means that you're probably going to be set up for some good racing to watch. So I would encourage you to head to the beach for this one as these crews come into the beach here for spectating. Um, you should be expecting a good race here. But you see Santa Barbara still holding on to that position right now, looking strong, getting good send on the boat. But it looks like Purdue may be making a move here to nudge up on them. Started to see some bodies start to clear through 
And as we watch, it does indeed look like Purdue is making a move here. Oh, Let's see if Santa Barbara's got the ability to defend or if Purdue is going to be able to move through them and make a little mark on the mentality of that UCSB crew here. Yes, good side-by-side -side racing here between the Gauchos and the Purdue women, the Boilermakers. You know, at Accra at the end of last year, they, Purdue finished just ahead of UC Irvine in the Varsity 8, so they're kind of flipping the script here as they pull ahead of both UC Santa Barbara right now and UC Irvine. UC Santa Barbara with a great season last year in 2023. Uh, they finished with a bronze medal in the Women's Varsity 8 at Accra. Um, and they have some new coaches there as a club program. There, there is certain to be quite a lot of change up in the coaching ranks um, throughout the years. But Brooke Downs, she's a former elite level rower, graduate of USC, and now training actually for coastal rowing. So she's bringing some new energy into that gaucho program. You see Santa Barbara consistently with one of the largest crews um, and we'll see several UC Santa Barbara boats coming down the course today, but doing a great job here side by side with Purdue as we come into the final 750 meters here. This is heat two of the women's D2, D3 and club varsity eight. This is the Grace Rett Memorial Club uh, Memorial Cup. And as we've crossed that thousand meter mark, Purdue did indeed make that move sitting now comfortably. It looks about four or five seats up now UCSB we'll see if they've got what it takes to claw back some of those seats it can be tough halfway through the race to lose seats like that if you don't have a plan for what to do next if you feel like you are at the end of your rope after a move like that it can be tough hey what is our move going to be do we have the ability to collect ourselves because the thing that will often push you ahead there is going to be clean rowing not angry rowing you don't really want to respond with too much fury the goal is to clean it up get the blades in quickly and allow the boat to move itself that's right and you know right now it's really all about execution i've said that um, over the course of the morning but it's true when you have these boats that are going to just automatically move on to the grand final it's just about hey you know let's let's put out a race plan let's see if we can just stay calm stay within our boat listen to the coxswain and just do our own thing uh, of course, Santa Barbara having to keep an eye on that Purdue boat because they have really picked up speed in the last half of this race. They pulled forward quite a few seats. Um, so Purdue looking great there along the shoreline, just kind of walking away from that gaucho boat. But what's going to happen tomorrow on the water? We're not so sure because we've got a lot of speed in all of these boats and all of these programs. But Purdue, really a special year for them. They just celebrated a 75th year um, for that program and a great club program in a huge school with a lot of uh, uh, some student athletes with some intense majors. I was kind of taking a look at their roster. We've got a lot of mechanical engineering majors, a lot of aerospace engineers. I mean, we've got some brain trust there in that, in that Purdue boat. And right now they're also showing their athleticism as they pull clear of UC Santa Barbara coming into the final strokes here, final 500 meters for Purdue. Purdue looking absolutely dominant now at this point. They have opened up more than enough space for themselves. At this point, it is taking that time to compare against Heat 1 because they know that they've locked in that first place position. UCSB still sitting in that second place. UCI's second boat now in this second heat, sitting back quite a bit. And UCSB's second boat also sitting out in lane four i believe sitting in that fourth place position right now purdue seeing that black flag they know what that means 250 meters to go as their buoys change colors and they're going to make their way into the finish of this race yeah exciting to think about what it's going to look like tomorrow as we get those boats even faster we're, we're going to get some good times coming out of these heats and certainly they'll come off the water kind of look at the times compare themselves to the previous heat and then recalibrate for the grand final tomorrow but coming down to the beach get your cheers on here for purdue as they wind up their final strokes staying just ahead of uc santa barbara the gauchos followed by uc irvine and then uc santa barbara's b boat and purdue there as they came with about 100 meters to go there's a seal that made a little appearance at the end of the race as purdue is holding about a 34 as they come to the finish line no urgency there 
locking in their position. That's Seal wanting a good spectating position from where he was sitting, clearly enjoying the racing just as much as the rest of us are. UCSB takes that second spot. Here comes UCI's second boat in third place here with UCSB's fourth boat sitting in that fourth place position in lane four. From ergometers to exercise classes, Active and Fit Now provides a flexible and affordable fitness program that sets up members like you for perfect workouts. Sprint to the Active and Fit Now booth to learn more and register to win a Garmin Phoenix 6X Pro Solar Edition smartwatch. Camp Land on the Bay has a full marina and complete range of boat and water sport rentals for use on Mission Bay. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Camp Land on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 2024 San Diego Crew Classic. All right, and we're looking at a start here. We're looking at a start here in event number 40. This is the Women's Collegiate Varsity 8 Cal Cup. There is just one heat, so all these boats will advance to the grand final. Just three boats on the course in lane one, Stanford. Lane two, UC San Diego. Lane three, Old Dominion University. So very early on in this race, we'll let it sit for just a second while things shake out in the early stages of this race. But again, all boats will move on to the grand final. We're just kind of racing for lanes right now. Out of the gates, it looks like we've got Stanford and UCSD women really settling in here nicely side by side. Stroke for stroke, based on my perspective right now, it looks like UCSC's women have taken perhaps a couple seats up on Stanford women. That's Old right. Dominion sitting behind right now, open water already. All right, and in this Cal Cup, this is really a great start here for UC San Diego. The Tritons, of course, wanting to perform well in front of the hometown crowd. Uh, but this is a great year already for the UCSD women. Uh, a couple weeks ago, this boat, the Varsity 8, won the Coastal Athletic Association's Boat of the Week. First time for the program in history after just a tremendous weekend of racing where they topped both Sacramento State and Kansas State. Uh, so UCSD doing a nice job here. This is Stanford. This is their lightweight program, but it, this early in the season, the Stanford Lights like to come out and test their metal against the open weight crews. So um, although they are lighter, um, they are just as mighty. So Stanford in lane one, 
holding tight to UC San Diego behind them by open water. It's going to be a university, or excuse me, um, Old Dominion University, the Monarchs. They're from Norfolk, Virginia. And um, right now they're in the American Athletic Conference. They're gonna be moving to the Big 12 next year. Um, so this is kind of a, a last hurrah for them in, in that conference. But the V8, they raced last weekend um, at the Sunshine Invitational, very competitive uh, regatta in Florida. They came in sixth last weekend. So coming out here, that's a lot of travel for that program um, to come all the way from, go from Florida back home and then back to San Diego. But that's what you've got to do in order to get faster. you got to test yourself against the best. And we've got these crews now coming into their final 500. UCSD, Stanford women right next to each other with UCSD holding the slight edge over Stanford, looking strong as they come into the finish. Looking at decent grab in the, in the water right now by UCSD, looking strong in their placement. Unless something changes with this sprint, UCSD currently sitting up, but Stanford women not willing to let go without a fight. That rate coming up right now, significant rate increase by Stanford here. This is going to be a real tight finish. Yep. But a lot Eyes to the finish line. Both of those boats. The Tritons holding on to that top spot. The Cardinal coming in by about three seats just behind UC San Diego. And then here come Old Dominion. Again, all boats rowing cleanly. They will progress to the grand final tomorrow. So kind of recalibrate, take a look at the times and figure out what can we do a little bit differently tomorrow. And certainly those UCSD and Stanford crews go back to the drawing board and figure out what they can do to make that an even more competitive race. I'm really looking forward to that tomorrow. And a nice showing by the UCSD women here, the hometown crew in that race. Well done as they nudged up to a lead and held what was a minor lead throughout that entire race, which is not an easy place to sit. It's stressful for the entire race. Just because you have a couple seats doesn't mean that you are in the clear. And so it means you're going to have to work that entire race because that other crew means that they are willing to challenge and they are not willing to let you go with just a little bit of a lead. All right, we have a race on course. The men's collegiate varsity eight active and fit now Cal Cup. This is going to be a four heat race, and this is our first of those four heats. In lane one, California. Lane two, Purdue. Lane three, UC Davis. Lane four, Sacramento State. Out to an early lead, California setting the tone in lane one. Next up, lane two, three, Purdue and UC Davis, respectively, holding those same positions. So currently, lanes one, two, three, holding positions. One, two, three. Those boats are to the first island. Cal establishing dominance right now in this race. 
opening up open water. Looks to be about a length of open right now as they hope to claim more. Finishings will matter here. One, two are going to the final. So this is a real race for finishing positions here. Okay, important to note for the Cal men, they're splitting their weekend. They've got their top crews um, racing elsewhere and have sent their 4B and their Frosh 8 down to San Diego to test um, their medal against, um, against some of these very, very fast programs. Um, we've got Purdue, again, celebrating their 75th year. They are missing a couple of really strong athletes out of their boat. They've got two athletes that are currently at the Olympic trials uh, this weekend, um, but no uh, detriment to overall speed for their crew. So uh, Purdue hoping to challenge um, that lead right now that California is currently holding on to. It looks as if our lanes one, two, three are still holding in those positions. Sacramento State well off the back right now. Plenty of open water. All right, Purdue and Davis sitting next to each other right now. Purdue up by what looks to be just a few seats. Cal still off to the front. They have cleared that second bridge. They're making their way to the beach now as our first heat of the Men's Collegiate Varsity 8 Plus Active and Fit Now Cal Cup comes down the course, the first of four heats. All right. Purdue really starting to make a push there as they're opening up a little bit more space on Davis. Important to note again, the top two make their way to the final. That's right. And, and the Boilermakers looking good here in lane two. They are, uh, you know, open water back to California, but they've got to make sure that they answer that call from the Aggies as they move into the final stretch here. Purdue with a really great fall. Again, like I said, with the women just celebrating their 75th year, it's really a historic uh, landmark for the Purdue program. But in 2024, uh, really hoping to enjoy a great year. They took second at the head of the Charles and the Club Four earlier this year and that was you know really kind of a bellwether moment for the program and it looks like you know that top end speed is what we're looking at here coming out of that purdue boat so purdue holding on to that second and hopefully qualifying position um, as they continue to hold off the aggies but the aggies not letting purdue walk any further away Sacramento State in lane four, currently occupying that fourth place position, just a ways back. Here comes Cal, rowing cleanly through that finish. Purdue looking like they've still got that second position. Wow, this is a but great But Davis race not willing to let go. They look like they've made up some space here. They are hungry for that second position, understandably. Here comes a push. Looks like Purdue might hold on to that second place finish. Purdue Davis looking like they've got that three. Seats. Wow, Davis just a little bit, a uh, little, little too late there uh, to try and catch up. But what a sprint from Davis to try and come up into one of those top two spots. But Purdue successfully holding them off. Uh, Sac State now winding up their final strokes. And we'll move over to the next heat. And we are lining up heat two of the men's collegiate varsity eight active and fit now Cal Cup. Heat two of four, lane one, UC San Diego. Lane two, Marietta College. Lane three, 
UC Santa Barbara. Lane four, San Diego State University. Our four crews have alignment and we are live with these boats taking off. These first strokes settling into the race. This is an important part of the race for a few different reasons. The first being your crew needs to collect itself. They need to be able to get some butterflies out of their system. Things are hot, heavy, water is splashing everywhere. The race has officially started and you are wanting to establish your position. It's important, however, that you do all of that calmly and collectively so that the boat doesn't fall apart, that you row together. One of the signatures of speed in these large boats is that you're all able to move together. And that truly is one of the biggest challenges of big boats is that you have eight people all attempting to do the exact same thing at the exact same time. So these crews are setting the tone for what's going to happen in this race. You need to be able to establish your, your cruise speed early on so that you don't get too far behind but you also don't want to put out so much that you don't have the ability to last throughout the race. That's right. And this UC San Diego boat that we currently see occupying that first place position, it's a pretty young team. They've only got one senior on the team. They've got 12 juniors, 15 sophomores, and seven freshmen, including the stroke of this boat, moved up from the freshman team last year and is now stroking that varsity eight. So Sebastian Navarro, with a good amount of experience coming out of his freshman team from last year, coming up to stroke the B8. Great move here by UC San Diego. So last year was an amazing year for UC San Diego. They were undefeated. They qualified for the IRA championship and of course took home the Cal Cup. Good team. That's quite the status to have to live up to this year. And knowing that you've got that Cal boat coming from that first heat, not necessarily knowing what their finish is just yet. You're that that coxswain's probably sitting there thinking, all right, where do we have to place ourselves so that we're, th we're within striking distance of the teams that we know we're gonna have to challenge when we get to the final? How do we put ourselves in a good position so that amongst these four heats, we get the lane that we're looking for so that we can be next to the crews that we want to race? Because at the end of the day, when it gets to the finals and you've got all these fast crews stacked up there, you want to make sure you're next to the crews that are going to help you go faster and that are going to give you the challenge that your crew needs to be able to dig and find that extra little percentage that you might need to finish fast. Definitely. And we're seeing some good speed also coming out of lane two. That's Marietta, Co Mary Marietta College from Ohio. That is a D3 program. A um, lot of history there coming out of that program. And again, a great prize to come out to San Diego um, coming in the, the middle of their season, try and test their speed against some of the best in the West. So we're seeing a good cross section of programs here with UC San Diego, a varsity program. They're in their final year of transition from D2 up to a D1, fully, uh, fully D1 program. So this is a very important step for them this year. Marietta College, again, a D3 program. Next to them in that third place position is gonna be UC Santa Barbara. UC Santa Barbara, um, they are, of course, one of the largest club programs that we're gonna see on the West Coast. Their coach, JT Sekulis, in his seventh year of coaching the Gaucho Navy, um, they've already had some good early season, season, early season racing, racing results. Um, so we're going to take a look at what their top end speed is going to be as they pull ahead of San Diego State. San Diego State, also a club program run primarily by their athletes. UCSD clearly holding on to that lead right now, wanting to open up as much water as they can, giving some, giving themselves the best position possible going into the final. Behind them, Marietta looking nice and consistent. Similar feelings here, Marietta over UCSB. They're wanting to hold that position. Again, that getting that one-two spot really critical in these heats. You miss that spot, you miss out on that grand final. So getting your way to that one-two position is going to be really critical. You got to think, you see Santa Barbara right now probably feeling a little bit of that heat, a little bit of that concern that they might not be in position to strike. So we'll see if UCSB's got something in the tank or a move that they may have been hiding long, uh, hiding long now to be able to unleash here in the final 500 to get themselves into qualifying position. So again, it's one of those things where you're going to want to take a look at the finish times, kind of do some side-by-side -side comparison, get yourself set up 
um, for a fast grand final tomorrow. But right now it is UC San Diego. The Tritons really in command of this race um, all the way from the start. UCSD hitting the tents now. Any of those UCSD fans, friends, athletes probably making their way down to the sand now to cheer on UCSD as they come through in this heat, holding that lead. This is typically the time when those hometown teams start to get that cheering from their crowd. They start to feel that warmth, that cheering, that energy being brought from the sand. It is a great opportunity to finish strong and feel good going into the rest of the weekend racing. At about 36 strokes a minute, looking long and definitely in control, very relaxed as they just um, are able to put their plan into place, maybe reserve a little bit of energy for that grand final tomorrow because it's certain to be a fast one. You've got Marietta behind them by a couple lengths from over the water. Unofficially, they will move on to the grand final as well, followed by UC Santa Barbara and San Diego State. UCSD with plenty of open water here as they come across the finish line. Marietta sitting there with open water over UC Santa Barbara, looking like they're going to hold that second position. UCSD across the line for that horn. Here comes Marietta. Not going to settle for anything less than their full speed right now, giving themselves the best shot at their seating in the final. Here comes UCSB. About to get their horn. UCSB across the line. And SDSU men still coming down the course. They'll be moved to that second final along with UCSB, whereas UCSD and Marietta College are going to make their way to the Grand. And just a quick announcement, quick announcement for uh, spectators. Will Bill Frobert please make his way to the volunteer tent? Um, sounds like, Bill, that you might have lost something. If you could make your way to the volunteer tent, um, Bill Probert. Thank you. Now up our third of four heats for the men's collegiate varsity eight active and fit now cal cup in lane one gonzaga lane two ucla lane three university of southern california lane four long beach state and our race is off and clean there go the initial strokes of this race as our crews settle their way in and find out how is their heat gonna go got some great programs right now in this heat with Gonzaga and UCLA side by side. USC also a very quick crew, uh, an ACRA crew uh, rowing out of lane three. And then Long Beach State right there. Early season results have some really good ones coming out here for UCLA. UCLA um, is very, very quick crew. Obviously, um, maybe not. It's obvious. It's obvious to me. They are national champions coming out of the B8 from last year at Acras. So we know that there's a lot of top end speed here. Um, and then also Gonzaga, a D1 program. They uh, last year were second behind UC San Diego in the Cal Cup. So we're going to be looking for some good speed coming out of that program. Gonzaga uh, coached by Dan Gen. He's in his 30th year of coaching the Gonzaga program. So a lot of history, a lot of wisdom, and certainly a lot of experience racing here at the San Diego Crew Classic for that program. Uh, Adrian, as, as a commentator, somebody who knows the ins and the outs of a lot of these coaches and programs for a coach, do you think that a, a coach like that, somebody who's got plenty of years of experience seeing the Crew Classic, understanding the conditions, understanding the course, how things get sorted out here, do you think that gives a leg up to a coach that has coached a program as long as he has there? Absolutely. And I think one of the things that we mentioned earlier is that the season is long, but it's also short. And this is really just the beginning of it. This side-by-side -side racing that these crews are getting is hugely important in terms of, of the amount of kind of intensity that they get. And it really sets them up for the rest of the season. So the importance of the Crew Classic is less, I would say, about results and more 
about, you know, how can we kind of progress through the season? We use this as a barometer. So it's almost like an initial stepping stone to build confidence. It's as if this is the race that all crews should be at in order to give themselves the opportunity to open the season, open the door on what the season's going to look like, set the tone. The results may not be exactly what they're as concerned about, but more so that they have the ability to thrive throughout the rest of the season, test their mettle here, as you said earlier. That's right. And the two crews, Gonzaga and UC San Diego in the previous heat, those two crews have already raced this season. So they're going to come down here to San Diego and see if they can test their medal again against each other and kind of see if, you know, kind of if, if they can go back and forth between who's on top. Um, but right now, Gonzaga looking at a huge, huge challenge coming out of lane two from UCLA. UCLA um, also uh, with a 90 year celebration of their history of that rowing program. So just, a, you know, kind of a huge momentous event for UCLA. They came off a national championship win in the Varsity 8. And here they are showing that speed as they pull up ahead of Gonzaga. Right now, UCLA with about a six-seat lead over Gonzaga. Yeah, you got to think Gonzaga right now maybe getting a little nervous. A little, little shaking going on right now with UCLA making a push as strong as they are. They've moved up, but they've also sat. So it's important to note they, they took an early lead. They've sat in this position, but they have not been able to open up any more water. And so Gonzaga is probably sitting there thinking, all right, we've managed to stay off any further movement. The question is, do we have what's in our tanks? Do we have the ability to make a move? Do we have the grit and the desire to go to move through them in this final 500 as we see the finish line, the coxswain is letting them know, hey, we see it. It is there. We're going to have to go perhaps earlier than expected. We're going to have to put in a move if we want to move through UCLA. That's right. And Gonzaga, again, you know, do they have to really push it? It's, it's hard because right now they're looking at a pretty solid qualifying pos position for that grand final. So, you know, who knows what the strategy is? It could be to just do what they have to do to get into the grands, maybe not put it all out there on the table. Um, but again, it is about, you know, can we execute our race plan? Do we want to see if we can kind of, um, you know, do some new things, maybe just solidify what they have been doing in practice. Um, UCLA doing a great job as they continue to just kind of inch ahead of Gonzaga. So maybe just a little bit more horsepower coming out of that UCLA boat. Behind them, behind Gonzaga, it is going to be USC in the third place position. They are another ACRA crew with really strong performances over the last couple of years um, at the ACRA championships coached by coach John Cates, got a lot of experience in the coaching realm. Just ahead of, uh, just behind USC, it's going to be Long Beach State, Long Beach State, uh, Southern California program with a lot of history as well, doing well here at the San Diego Crew Classic um, and right now currently in that fourth place position. And as we watch these boats come in, we are seeing some beautiful conditions on the water right now great flat water which just gives for this amazing perspective when we get those side shots of what's happening with the racing you can see there as we had our eyes on ucla those blades just nicely entering the water gives a great perspective we know that these athletes are getting true tests of their boat speed right now as they settle in there goes another seal taking a peek of this race he must be hanging out at that finish line enjoying the racing ucla though still holding their lead over Gonzaga. Looking like our 1-2 is set right now as we cross that finish line in just a moment. The Bruins and the Bulldogs battling it out, coming into the final strokes here, but it will be the Bruins first across the line. And now here comes Gonzaga. Top two crews unofficially. They will be moving on to the grand final. And here comes USC in the third place spot. They will be followed by Long Beach State. And so I guess the question for those one, two teams is who showed more out of their hand than the other? Did somebody hold something back? And what are we going to see when it comes to the grand final?
and our fourth of four heats for the men's collegiate varsity eight active and fit now cal cup sitting at the starting line lane one university of san diego lane two mit lane three uc irvine lane four loyola marymount university these crews are sitting at the start a good way to tell when that race is about to take off is when you see all blades enter the water. And there is our start. Oftentimes, um, you know, these these races, because we have one race after the uh, one race after the other, we're going to a quick start, which means that it's not a whole lot of time for that coxswain to adjust the course. They've got to make sure that they're on it. As soon as they back into the starting boats, they have to make sure that they are ready to go um, and ready to go when the starter says go. There's no waiting. Um, there's no repositioning. They've got to get going. So having a good, clean start really sets the tone for the rest of the piece. And right now, that crew with the hottest start is going to come out of lane two. That's MIT, the engineers all the way from Boston, Massachusetts. They are sitting about seven seats over lane one, University of San Diego. The Toreros looking strong in the starting sequence. Just behind them, it's going to be UCI, UC Irvine, and then Loyola Marymount University. Loyola and UCI almost dead even with each other. I feel like in most of these races, I'm able to maintain impartiality. However, being an alumni of University of San Diego, I got to keep my eyes on that lane one. Right now, University of San Diego sitting in lane one second place down to mit looks like decks overlapping at the moment in lane three uc irvine sitting in that third place position or perhaps loyola marymount holding that third position looks like uc irvine and loyola, loyola marymount battling back and forth bow balls exchanging positions yeah, and actually still a good amount of contact with all four of these crews. So there is not a whole lot of open water between boats. There's still some overlap between all four boats. So really anything can happen. We're still pretty early on in this race, but uh, making sure MIT, they're going to come all the way out here uh, to San Diego. They're going to put down a hot, uh, a hot race right here, and they are trying to pull free and clear of University of San Diego. And as we know, any of the positions that you're seeing at this point in time are not really dependable as to what you can be seeing through the middle of the race. This is our opportunity for the crews to sort themselves out and to kind of understand what their positions are going to be, who they're going to be racing against, and how they're going to be racing them. So there is plenty of racing still to happen. Plenty can change hands. And in the sport of rowing, anything can happen, and it usually does. There's a nice look now as our crews heading through the middle of this race. Still not over that 1,000 meter mark, but the middle chunk of the race. MIT has put some open water between themselves and the University of San Diego. University of San Diego is still sitting up over UC Irvine and Loyola Marymount, who still look neck and neck, perhaps with Loyola Marymount, a step above UCI at this point in time. We're getting our first crew, MIT, crossing over that 1,000-meter mark as they're about to break free of the island, hit that gap for bridge number two, which is an interesting and often a common place for moves from crews. They'll often choose to make their move as they hit that open water. As they hit that bridge, it's usually a landmark for coxswains to take a move. And Shane, you were out here yesterday racing. It sounds like you had back-to-back -back races, so you really got a good sense of what this course is like. But when they get to that, um, to those bridges, is that a little bit more exposed? Is there a little bit more push, um, maybe a side a wind that's coming across? Or, uh, you know, what do you think in terms of the conditions? Does it change at that point in the course? It does. And, yeah, it's, a, it's an important point to note about uh, this course. And what most crews know when they get here is that each of the bridges offers a crosswind to you, even on the calmest of conditions. You do start to get a little bit of a blast of wind that comes through the bridge. It funnels through. And so you can use that as an opportunity to make a move because if a crew can get rattled by the wind, you know that that's an opportunity to make a move. So yeah, being out here yesterday, we did have windier conditions than what we've got right now. And so we were dealing with a decent amount of, uh, of water movement as we made our way through that bridge. Nothing we couldn't handle though. And uh, now as you see these crews coming through, 
it looks like that water is maintaining some nice, calm environments for them. So I think we're getting a good, true chance of racing. No big deal. No big deal. My head hurts just thinking about all three of those majors tied together. As we come into these athletes hitting their final 500, MIT still holding their lead. University of San Diego sitting in second. And it still looks like it is a tight race between UCI and Loyola Marymount for that 3-4 position. MIT looking strong. University of San Diego holding on to that position. All right, MIT, that D3 program hailing from Boston, Massachusetts, coming in for the win here, looking really strong, consolidated effort by the engineers with an open water win right now over University of San Diego. The Toreros also looking strong. Top two finishes will move on to that grand final. Just behind them, we're looking at some great racing here between UC Irvine and Loyola Marymount. The Lions wrapping up this heat of the active and fit now Cal Cup. Looks like UCI made a bit of a move in the last 500 there to move up on Loyola Marymount, giving themselves that third place position. All right, and we are already back on the course with race number 45, the Women's Collegiate Varsity Four. This is the Karen Plumley courtney Cup. We will look at two heats. Um, yeah, two heats of this race, and the top three will move on to the grand final. The remainder will move on to final B. Right now, we've got five boats on the course. In lane one, Texas. Lane two, Stanford. Lane three, Washington State. Lane four, University of San Diego. And lane five, UC San Diego. All right, very early on here in this fours race. Again, the top three boats to move on to the grand final. We're looking at a really hot start here coming out of lane five. That is UC San Diego. UC San Diego and Texas really close to, to each other um, in this starting sequence. I'm going to give the, um, the, the slight lead right now to Texas as we come across the first strokes of this race. So Texas right now holding on to a lead over UC San Diego. In third, it's going to be Washington State. Washington State rowing out of lane three. In fourth, we're going to move back to the inside. That's Stanford. This is the Stanford Lightweight Program. 
And in fifth, it's going to be University of San Diego. So top two boats right now look to be Texas and University of California at San Diego. But a lot of overlap here. A lot of change up. So UC San Diego had that hot start, but right now we're looking at Texas just kind of walking away with that lead position already with open water. As these boats are settling into the race, this is one of the more fun portions of the Crew Classic course when you are racing it. You've you've just about cleared that first bridge. That means you're gonna get your first moment of protected water. And that is that island that sits there, it does a really nice job of breaking that wind. And so you settle into now what is a calm bit. And it is the moment where you get to prove yourself. And so you see a lot of crews make a move through this island because it's where the crew finally sinks in together. They've got their starting five, their high 20, their settle 10 out of the way. That all happens during that first bridge when things are still jockeying. Now they hit this bit of protected water and it becomes this fun race portion. And while it only runs for a short bit because they hit that, th that thousand meters right before they hit the end of the island. So there's still plenty of race water to go after they clear this island. This is the moment when crews are really getting to sink their teeth into the meat and potatoes of this race. And this is the part where, all right, we know what we have to give. We have to give in measured amounts because this is our opportunity to race. When we cross the thousand, somebody's going to make a move and that's where it's going to get uncomfortable. Usually about 11 to 1300 is where you start to ask questions of yourself at the Crew Classic course. Somebody makes a move. Are we going to counter or are we going to be the ones that make a move? What happens during that second bridge and how does that set us up for the finish of this race? And that's exactly what we're seeing here is a lot of movement uh, that happened between 500 meters down and right now just a little past the halfway point texas all by themselves up front there currently ranked fourth in the country the four is going to be one of their very very fast boats it's going to be a focus boat because that earns points at the ncaa championship which we will likely see them at later on this season but i want to call special attention to lane two that's stanford the stanford lightweight program they are now occupying that second place position in 2023, earlier this fall at the head of the Charles, their lightweight four took first by a monumental amount, by almost 16 seconds over the rest of the field. And they're showing that true horsepower here as they occupy that second place spot behind Texas, holding off the Cougars of Washington State. Washington State sitting with a solid lead now over UC San Diego and then University of San Diego currently in fifth. Now, if you're looking to the screen and you happen to see that orange flag pass by when you get towards the end of the island, that is your halfway point. That is the thousand meter mark. There's a nice tight zoom in. Seeing those athletes settle in. There we go. There's a good overhead shot of the placings currently lane one. Texas, lane two, Stanford women, lane three, Washington State. Then in fourth, we've got University of California, San Diego. And in lane four and fifth currently is University of San Diego. And a way to differentiate those two San Diego crews, UC San Diego in the bright yellow unisuits dark boat with white blades and University of San Diego in the baby blue unisuits um, and uh, looking good there. Again, you know, we mentioned this earlier, but the University of San Diego pulled up um, to this level of racing uh, by virtue of their performance last year at the San Diego Crew Classic and really just hoping to test themselves and find out their top end speed here early on in the spring racing season. But definitely showing some good speed. It is Texas, the Longhorns, well out in front by about two and a half boat lengths of open water. Stanford behind them now with open water over Washington State. Washington State um, also doing a nice job here. 
Washington State as they progress through their season. They're going to be racing in what is the last part of the Pac-12, that conference wrapping up. There's a lot of conference realignment that's happening. Um, so one of the reasons to come all the way across the country to race at the Crew Classic is to get a sense of what's happening on the national level in terms of speed and those crews that not only you're racing this year, but you're going to be racing in the future in perhaps in your conference. And as these crews now come into the beach setting, which is usually the tee up for our finish, we are looking at a fairly nice even spread across Texas, Stanford, and Washington State in one, two, three. Those top three going to the A final and the remainder going to the B final. So we're looking for those one, two, three positions for who is going to make their way to that A final. That will be an important distinction for how the rest of their weekend of racing goes. One of the things we mentioned earlier, too, with this Texas crew, they've got a lot of returners from last year's 2023 NCAA um, athlete selection, their roster. Um, we've got a lot of returners, so certainly a lot of maturity in that boat that's coming down the race course here. So we're going to be looking at some top speed tomorrow. It'd be really interesting to take a look at some times. We've got some other heats coming up, but um, again, this is very early on in the spring, but these crews are going to be racing each other again. Uh, but this is what matters. Where are we now? Kind of using this race as a barometer. Texas doing a nice job holding on to that top spot from the very beginning. Stanford now coming in. The end of their season, they're looking at a qualification for the IRA championships for the lightweight women. And now Washington State, also a perennial Competitor at the NCAA championships, hoping to get there again this season. In fourth, it will be UC San Diego, the Tritons, looking strong here in that fourth place spot, holding off crosstown rival University of San Diego. Here comes UCSD across the line, followed by USD taking their final strokes. And that will be the first heat of our women's collegiate varsity four, the Karen Plumley Courtney Cup. If you're all about messing around in boats, having a good time, having a good piece of equipment for your lake house, for your sailboat, or these boats are great. I know that I've seen that you can basically pack them and carry them onto an airplane. Wherever you like to go, wherever you want to row, this is a way to keep rowing. You can't put your single in the overhead compartment. Rowing an oarboard is stable, safe, and fun. It converts a paddleboard into a performance rowing boat. Now you can go rowing and play in the waves. Oarboard is revolutionizing the sport of rowing. All right, we're getting ready for heat number two of event 46. This will be the Women's Collegiate Varsity for Karen Plumley courtney Cup. Again, heat two, top three boats advance to the grand final, the remainder to the B-level final. And with five boats on the course, what we're going to show you right now is the start, and then we will cut over to real time with about 7.50 to go. 
But first up, let's give you the lane assignments. In lane one, Washington. Lane two, California. Lane three, University of Notre Dame. Lane four, Southern Methodist. And lane five, UC San Diego. One of the things to watch for in these early bits of the race is just to take a look at how those oars are getting into the water, how the bodies are moving in the boats. That's generally going to be your indicator as to what kind of speed you might be able to expect out of that boat. So just take a look when the when you pan back or when you get those close-ups on the boats on the screen or if you're watching online. This is your opportunity to just kind of just judge, hey, what kind of racing can I expect out of each of these boats? And here we go, picking up this race in real time. We are looking at a slight lead here for California over Washington, 750 meters to go. Bring yourself down to the beach. This is gonna be a great race. And again, some of these crews, these are the best of the best in the NCAA. Right now we're looking at California with a three seat, maybe about four seat advantage over University of Washington. Next to Washington, pretty close, it's going to be University of Notre Dame. Notre Dame in third, but looking at a challenge from Southern Methodist University. You can see Southern Methodist in that bright red boat and the white flashy blades. So easy to see along the course. In fifth, it's going to be UC San Diego. So UC San Diego that has two entries in this fours event. And we're looking at the one through three placings making it to the final A with our four and five going into that B final. So it's going to be important for if there are any crews that are on the cusp of sitting for that third position, that they are making a move and doing it in time to secure themselves that spot so that they can get to that grand final and ensure that they get into that top placing spot. If you get down to that B final, you can only finish as high as that B final you cannot make any moves up into those top positions. So if you want any shot, you got to get yourself there in these heats. That's right. In California, the Golden Bears looking golden right here as they come down in that top position in this heat. They are pulling themselves free and clear of the rest of the field. Now with a bit of open water coming into the final 500 meters. Washington in that second place position, sitting bow to stern over University of Notre Dame. Notre Dame here with three entries. They've got a varsity eight, a four, and a two V8. We're going to look for some good results out of this four coming out of Notre Dame. Last year, they were fourth overall in the varsity four at San Diego. And again, that program doing some really great things there. One of their athletes just earning a spot on the Olympic team, one of their alums. So looking at some really strong rowers coming out of that program. We've got five athletes returning in 2024 from the 2023 roster and 14 seniors. So University of Notre Dame with a lot of depth. And they're showing that here as they come to the West Coast to race the best of the West. California now looking at holding that top position. They have a good eye on what Washington is doing over there in lane one. That gives them potentially a leg up on their finish as they come in here, knowing exactly where their competition is. Notre Dame holding that third spot, probably feeling pretty confident about now that they're going to make their way into that grand, which is going to give them an opportunity. So they're thinking about perhaps that next race at this point. Hey, what do we do now to make sure that we just give a measured amount to not waste anything so that we've got it to give when it matters. That's absolutely true and super important as you come through a really intense weekend here at San Diego. You've got not only the intensity of the race, but you've got the elements. We've got a lot of sun. Uh, we've got, you know, some wind and, you know, it's really something that can take a lot out of you. But these multi-day regattas are really important to experience at this level because you've got travel, you've got the elements, you've got uh, you've got the pressure. And so it's really important for these crews to come through this regatta, feeling good about where they're at in the season. But Cal, got to feel good with this finish here in this heat, well ahead of the University of Washington by about a length or so of open water. Here come the Huskies, that second place spot, and then unofficially qualifying will also be the University of Notre Dame in that third place position. In fourth, it will be Southern Methodist, and then finally UC San Diego.
And there is our next race now up on the screen. The women's collegiate, collegiate second varsity eight, the Jackie and Stitt hung, Hungness Trophy. In lane one, Washington. Lane two, Washington State. Lane three, Southern Methodist University. Lane four, University of California, San Diego. All boats off, and it looks like a very even start here. This may be the most even start I have seen of the day. Well, and the conditions really just can't get any better. We've got just nice glassy water, not a lick of chop or uh, any sort of pushback coming from the wind. Very different than yesterday afternoon. So um, really great to see the conditions play out here in San Diego. Some of the nicest water I've seen in quite some time. So really a delight to row in. Um, and right now you're looking at a lot of overlap here between these top four crews, Washington, Washington State, Southern Methodist, and UC San Diego. That's pretty much the order that you'll find them in, Washington holding on to that lead early on. One of the signatures of Washington so far today has been to take an early lead and to hold on to it and just slowly press away, chip away at that lead over the rest of the race. And you're seeing that happen here now as Washington setting the tone on their race. They are making their mark, moving away bit by bit. A good way that you can see that is taking a look at the coxswain in the Washington boat and the bow seat of the Washington state boat. That gives you good perspective if you start to see water open up there as we do now. That is an indicator that that boat is starting to walk away. So you take points of reference off of each boat, and that gives you the opportunity to see what's happening in real time, who's making moves, who's sitting still, and what's going to happen with the race. Yeah, that's an imp important part to bring up is the role of the coxswain in these races. So those of you guys that are watching at home, you know, it's more about it's, it's less about steering. I mean, steering is important, obviously. You want the boat to go straight, but it's all about executing a strategy. So the coxswain is really the coach in the boat. They really are the eyes and the ears, and they need to keep their crews calm and on pace. So following that race plan, uber important here. Washington looks to be right on pace as they are very, very calmly continuing to walk away from the rest of the field. Now with about a half a length of open water, Washington State still in second. They're holding off Southern Methodist University. The Mustangs also looking pretty strong here um, and trying to take away a little bit of the lead that Washington State has on them. They are staying, Southern Methodist staying well ahead of UC San Diego, but again, still overlap between Washington State, Southern Methodist, and UC San Diego. Washington all, uh, all by themselves out front. And so now the race really is for that third qualifying position. And I got to say, taking a look at this race, seeing a nice tight grouping of, uh, of Washington State, SMU and UCSD, this makes for good racing. This is the kind of spectating that you want to see is when you've got boats clustered together like this, that means that they are going to be racing for it. Now, all of these boats are going to be making it to the grand final in this heat. So these boats are currently jockeying for position of where they are going to be seated in their lanes going into that race. But this is a really nice race happening right now. Washington setting the tone out ahead, but two, three, four sitting their respective lanes and positions. Yeah, this is a great race here. I am looking at the movement that's happening between lanes three and four between Southern Methodist and UC San Diego. UC San Diego still overlaps here with Southern Methodist. Could they come up to prop to maybe take one of those qualifying spots in the grand final? They are doing their their darndest to try and pull even right now with Southern Methodist. And if they could make that move right here, that would be a really great place to do it. You know, if anything, you look across the water as well. And if you think that there could be any crosswind, you'd think that, hey, maybe there's actually a chance that those other boats are protecting you. So if you are in connection here with those boats, that's an opportunity. And as I'm seeing this, and as we say that, I think your call was right there. UCSD might be making a move here to try and move through Southern, Southern Methodist and make that move here around 1300 to establish something before they get or wait too long and get to that finish. 
Well, and here's the thing, you know, Washington State has been in that second spot, but they're watching that lead shrink as both Southern Methodist and UC San Diego push each other so hard that that they've actually taken away a little bit of that lead that the Cougars have held for most of this race. So taking a look at lane four, UC San Diego, they're on the move, but the Mustangs taking the rate up just a little bit, answering answering that call that UC San Diego put out. Hey, we're going to come up and try and challenge you. It's going to be a race all the way to the finish line for that third qualifying position. Yeah, it's really great thinking about that. That secondary benefit of lanes three and four pushing each other actually puts the heat on lane two, who may have thought that they had it locked up and could settle a little bit. When in reality, you've got three and four nudging that pace, nudging that race up, and suddenly Washington State is sitting there thinking, oh, no, I thought we had this second place position in the bag. And here we have UCSD giving us a challenge. And as we see these side angles here, UCSD has moved into a decent striking position, still sitting in third. There's still some space there, uh, still sitting in fourth, but lane three, lane four, there may still be some room that they can make up when they hit their sprint. That's right. If we've got any local fans here, UC San Diego, get yourself down to the beach. Let's cheer these ladies on as they come into the final strokes. They're still within contact to that SMU boat. All the way down the line, though, it is Washington. The Huskies well out front holding on to that top position. Very relaxed, very confident in their race plan. Just being able to look down the race course and take a look at the distance between themselves and the rest of the field. What an honor, you know, to be able to see this level of performance coming out of these crews. Behind them, the race is on between Washington State, Southern Methodist, and UC San Diego, all the way to the line for that third qualifying position. And Washington looking absolutely smooth and in control as they race. Lane two, Washington State still looking strong. Southern Methodist University still in third. They've opened up space now on the University of California, San Diego. And there's Washington across the line. That open water now trickling by as Washington State makes their way into that second position. Lane three, Southern Methodist University now moving across the line. And UC San Diego taking that fourth spot. All boats moving to the grand final. We're now taking a look at the women's collegiate second varsity eight. The Jack Hansen hung this trophy here. Our next four crews lining up on the line. Lane one, Texas. Lane two, California. Lane three, Notre Dame. Lane four, San Diego. You know, and I do have to I do have to make a slight correction um, for myself in terms of the progression. Um, all crews move on to the grand final here in the collegiate 2v8. We were calling it as the top three, but correction, um, it's on my heat sheet. It is all boats moving on to the grand final. So while they, we saw some great racing, um, UC San Diego is going to move on to the grand final. All right, and we have had a clean start here in heat two of the Women's Collegiate 2v8. This is the Jackie Ann Stitt Hungness Trophy, and we've got four crews on the course. And again, this is going to be a hotly contested race. Again, all boats will move on to the grand final. So again, um, you know, we just are about 
basically picking a lane for that grand final. Of course, you want to put down a good time so that you can compare uh, with the other heats, but it is all about getting that great lane. And right now, the race to look at is between lanes one and two. That's Texas and California, almost dead even with each other at 500 gone. Adrian, when you're sitting in a race like this, you're you're sitting in this boat knowing that you're in a heat that you're guaranteed to make your way to the final. What are you thinking about as far as how much you want to put out to to find that lane position? How much is that going to matter to you versus how much energy you're going to expend trying to get there? How do you balance that? You know, it's that's a really really good question because no one wants to everyone wants to win. You know, so coming across the line, that's a huge boost of confidence coming across the line first. Um, but again, if the goal is just to do what you need to do to get into the grand final. So if there was placement on the line here, uh, maybe the race strategy would be a little bit different. But right now, these crews know that they're all going to progress. But you're going to do what you can with side by side racing. I don't think at this point, at this level of racing, that anyone's going to give anything up. So I don't I don't think that there is that much of holding back. Um, between crews. So we have California and Texas side by side. Right now, Texas taking uh, about a five seat advantage over California. California with a good amount of open water between themselves and University of Notre Dame. Notre Dame with a lead over University of San Diego. But in terms of your question, you know, I think that every piece that you can put down out here is going to be better than the last one. So I think that's the goal is that you put down an excellent piece and then tomorrow it's even better. And these crews as well are at this level, you're able to handle more than one race in a day. Uh, your fitness is at the point where a single 2K should not be the only thing that you can execute in a day. You should be able to pull off multiples of these. And in practice, a lot of them are being asked to do that on a consistent basis. This kind of volume is to be expected for athletes at this level. So Hopefully you're thinking, all right, well, this is our ability to a put on our first pressure piece to feel our legs today, to feel the work. But as far as their, their ability to recover, even the fact that they get to get off the water in between races is almost a gift compared to what they have to do during their training. Absolutely. There's not a whole lot of downtime in this season. So once we hit San Diego Crew Classic from here on in, every single weekend is just packed with action and intensity in terms of the the, the races. Cal is looking forward to the UW Duel. Um, then they have, they have the big row. Um, they've got Pac-12 championships coming up. I mean, it's just going to come down to the wire and just pushing themselves. There's very little rest um, with this season. So San Diego is just a great place to test the speed, but really just use it as a barometer of like, where are we at right now in the season? Right uh, now, Texas is looking pretty speedy, though. California chasing them down. Texas always a dominating presence and have been for some years now. To see Texas, you just know that they're going to come with the dominating force when they show up, and they show up en masse when they show up. They bring lots of boats, and those boats come to play. Texas holding that lead right now over Cal. Notre Dame and USD sitting back from there. Passing that red flag now as they're coming into the tents. Once they start passing those tents, you're going to start to see bodies making their way down to the beach to get the best view of the racing. And this has been a really methodical race for Texas for the Longhorns. So they took um, a pretty good but not overly speedy start but very, very solid. So that was really nice to see. They just kind of chipped away and every stroke they take, they've taken a couple of more inches away from the rest of the field. So this has been a really fun race to watch because again, you know, the sense of relaxation and send that's coming out of the boat, you can really see that. And if you come down to the beach to watch these guys row past, you're gonna get a sense of that. That relaxation is really key in the sport of rowing. You wanna keep the length, you wanna keep the power, and there you go, final 250 meters here for the Longhorns as they continue to extend out their lead. California in second, University of Notre Dame holding on to the third place position, and then finally University of San Diego, the Toreros holding on to fourth. Really strong bodies looking in the Texas boat there. You can see those postures holding that boat able to pry without any real slippage happening through the trunk of the athletes. That is 
always a sign of strong crew. That means that they are able to transfer that power from their legs directly to those oars, which are going to move that boat. Coming in strong but collected. Texas unofficially taking that first place position. California taking two. And we still have University of San Diego and Notre Dame battling for that 3-4 position, looking like Notre Dame is going to take three with University of San Diego in four. All boats again moving to the grand final, so these two heats were to determine placings in lanes for the grand. This is great racing here with these final two boats coming across the line between Notre Dame and University of San Diego. Really tight racing, so tomorrow is looking good. It's going to be speedy. All right, we have the men's collegiate second varsity eight now lining up here. This is our first of two heats. In lane one, California. Lane two, University of California, San Diego. Lane three, Purdue. Lane four, UC Irvine. Boats getting a clean start. There's a great shot of Purdue now. The historic program with our 75-year anniversary, which in the world of rowing, that is a strong and long program that has stood the test of time. UCSD looking clean off the start, challenging California in lane one. You know, one thing we mentioned earlier, too, California men's crew splitting their weekend, uh, racing in different parts of the state this weekend. So sending their their top crews um, to a different race this weekend and then sending their 4B and their freshmen down here um, to San Diego. That definitely doesn't slow them down. They are still going to be have some really good top end speed. So we're looking right now at California with that lead about five seats right now over UC San Diego. UC San Diego still overlap by about seven seats with Purdue and Purdue bout a stern over UC Irvine. Still pretty early on in the race, but right now we're finding these crews in lane order. And if you were paying attention to lane one and two there, as Adrian was, was uh, talking us through the race, it was pretty impressive how quickly California jumped up to the lead that they've got now that seemingly happened in just a few strokes. They were able to take themselves up into a lead and my, what a time to make a move because it sets the tone early, putting UCSD on call saying, hey, we are here and we are ready to race. Are you going to respond or are you going to let us just walk into that lead? Because now we're hitting the meat and potatoes of this race, as I like to call it. And now as we sit here, UCSD has got some making up to do if they want to challenge Cal. That's right. And this is important this year. This is the first for head coach Peter Simeone. He's moving up from the assistant coach position, jumping into that head coach position. And that is a lot of pressure, but he's doing a great job with that program from what I can tell here for 2024. Again, 2023 was a banner year. Of course, he was a part of that program. But to continue the momentum forward as UCSD becomes a fully D1 school, um, super important to make a statement here at the San Diego Crew Classic. Crews chipping along now at about a 36 as I'm clocking it for UCSD. It seems to be about the stroke rate du jour for many of these boats. 36 to seems to be about the race rate that most crews are comfortable at. Unless perhaps you get into lightweight crews, sometimes they like to rate a little bit higher. Yeah, interestingly, watching races over the years, what I've noticed is that the rates have definitely come up. Um, back when I was racing. I mean, that was maybe no comparison, but I think our, our top rate usually was about a 33. 
Um, right now, those top rates, especially coming out of the men's crews, 38, 39, that's a base rate that is being held. Of course, it's still early on in the season. The stroke rates are going to come up as we get further into the spring. Um, but it's no surprise to see these crews holding on to those top stroke ratings or high stroke ratings. As as we look at the race right now, we're getting a good overhead. Taking a look here to UCI, you can see that five seat in the boat and how much taller he is than the rest of the athletes in the boat. I He must be seven feet. He is very tall, the ideal body to put in a boat. Uh, you can tell it, it's probably even hard for him to get a full stroke in being able, being as tall as he is, he might not even be able to reach the full slide. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these boats are pretty adjustable, but for sure, um, with, uh, you know, club rowing is, it, it's kind of all over, all over the place. You get, in some ways you get what you get. You don't necessarily have recruits. Everyone's a walk on and everyone gets an opportunity to race. So, you know, you've got to work around the different levels of athleticism, the different body types. Um, and you know, that, that UCI boat is a really good example of that but out in front it continues to be california california with open water now over uc san diego uc san diego looking pretty comfortable as they have a good amount of open water between themselves and purdue purdue here with their 2v8 um, and looking at a solid lead for purdue over uc irvine UCSD, however, unwilling to really let Cal go. You can tell that they want this race. They want to be here to push. They are not just going to let Cal walk away with it. So while Cal has opened up some space there, UCSD is still holding on. It looks like they're rating at about 37 and a half right now. We're starting to hit the black flags. That means that we are nearing the finish Cal holding that lead position, UCSD sitting in two, Purdue in three, and UCI in four as we stand going into the sprints. That's right. And we talk about stroke ratings here. How important is your stroke rating? You know, if you're not being pushed, do you hold your stroke rating or do you try to execute um, that sprint? That's a good question. And, you know, every crew handles that a little bit differently. And a good way that I've heard that talked about is you think about letting the pressure build the rate rather than using the rate to build the rate when you come into a finish like this. And as I say that, Cal coming into their finish here, still looking nice and long, layback still there and present, meaning they have not shortened things up significantly. They cross that finish line first, University of California, San Diego. There's their finish. Purdue still sitting in that three position and UCI at the back of the pack. And important to note in terms of the progression here, there is a progression. The top three boats advance to final A, and then the remaining boat moves on to final B.
All right, and we are underway here with race number 50. This is the second heat for the men's collegiate 2v8. We'll have five boats on the course in lane one, Gonzaga. Lane two, UCLA. Lane three, University of San Diego. Lane four, UC Santa Barbara. Lane five, UC San Diego. Nice starts up and out of the way. These boats are settling in now. UCLA and University of San Diego off to strong starts. UC San Diego also on the outside lane. Six there. Three boats sitting in that lead position right now. We have UC Santa Barbara and Gonzaga both sitting back to those other three boats. University of California, San Diego, looking like they veered or are veering out of course right now. That's always tough on athletes when those boats start heading in the wrong direction. It makes it tough for the athletes to be able to maintain that consistent power on the boats. And that, that is something that the, the referees will note if a boat comes off course. And of course, you know, from here, we don't really know why that is. Maybe they um, hit some seaweed, maybe, um, maybe just... Uh, technical error, but uh, looks like they're back on track or they're trying to get back on track there. Um, so it does look like the refs have control over that. So we'll come back to them in a minute. But right now, it is looking pretty solid here for UCLA up front. They have about a five-seat lead right now over Gonzaga. Gonzaga rowing in lane one, but still pretty tight, still pretty early on in the race. Still in contact as well. University of San Diego rowing out of lane three. So those top three boats still um, in contention for either first, second, or third place position. Still early on, a lot of movement will happen. Uh, definitely at the halfway point is where we see a good amount of separation happen between crews. And as Adrian says that, it's good to note as well, the top three crews are making it to the A final and the remainder will make their way to the B final. So positions one through three are pretty coveted in this heat here. And those teams are going to fight for those spots. Gonzaga making a strong move here and staying very consistent on the press. You're seeing them just slowly open up more and more space between them and UCLA. UCLA trying to hold off University of San Diego, but University of San Diego looking like they're putting in a bit of a move here to try and nudge up on UCLA. See if they can create a challenge that's going to get them into a second place position in this heat. But let's not forget about what we're seeing on the outside there. It looks like University of California, San Diego, still trying to get themselves into the fight here. Perhaps a little, uh, a little fire lit under them. Moving off course earlier, they might not be willing to let go here, and they want to race. That's right. That move by Gonzaga to get back into that top position was really phenomenal. A lot of the time when we're calling races, not a whole lot happens very quickly. But honestly, that was a pretty quick move. So whatever they did, they took a power 10. They got a little bit of fire in their seats because they just really jumped out to a lead now over UCLA. UCLA had held on to the top spot. But then Gonzaga just took a big jump, and now they are in that lead position, looking at about a four-seat lead over UCLA. UCLA with about the same over University of San Diego, um, but still pretty close here. And I'm clocking University of San Diego at a 38 on their rate right now as they're pushing back on UCLA. They might be using that rate to try and make a nudge up for that second-place position. UCLA looking like they might be having trouble fending off that fight. We'll see what happens as they come into this final 750. We're getting a really great shot there of the top three crews. Gonzaga, they made their move early. I haven't seen a whole lot more water open up, though, so that may have been a bit of a premature move. We'll see if that pays off and if that early move was smart or if that's going to come to haunt them a little bit later. University of San Diego trying to pull up on UCLA, trying to make this a fight and we'll see what happens when we come in to the final 500. That's right, all the way down the race course here. This is going to be a good battle here, especially between UCLA and University of San Diego. Um, all these crews kind of in, in slightly different um, uh, competitive levels. So Gonzaga, a Division I school that's in the WCC. They're a private Jesuit school. 
I love their motto, service for and with others. And certainly that extends to the student athletes in the program as they pull for each other, as they come down the course. And right now pulling free and clear of UCLA. UCLA, a club program with a lot of resources and a lot of history behind that program. They are looking at a really good challenge here from University of San Diego, also a, a private school, private university um, that also battles it out with Gonzaga later on in the season at the WCC at those conference championships. That's a little bit tough to tell right now what's happening between San Diego and UCLA. Looking like San Diego tried to make a move there. UCLA looking like they may have fought it off and starting to push back to open up a few more seats. It does look like they've taken a couple seats there. As we come into this final bit, rates are certainly going to start to climb right now. All these crews, though, can feel good that they are going to be in one, two, three positions, being able to make their way to the Grand. University of San Diego still at a 38. UCLA now running a little bit higher than that. They've definitely started to stage their sprint to push them off. Looks like that second place position is going to be an important one for them. But here we go. It's Gonzaga, the Bulldogs right now. Open water for the final 250 meters for them. We're looking at about a two seat of open water advantage. UCLA now pulling free and clear of University of San Diego to lock in that second place position. Top three boats will move on to the grand finals. The remainder will move on to the B-level final. But it is Gonzaga in first, UCLA in second. University of San Diego in that third spot, unofficially moving on to the grand final. UCSD now in an outside lane, crossing that line. And it looks like UCSB now making their way to their final strokes. Want a flexible fitness solution that's affordable? Discover the Active and Fit Now program today. For $32 a month, you can get access to a robust fitness program without long-term contracts. Visit the Active and Fit Now booth to learn more and enter their drawing for a free Garmin GPS smartwatch. Concept 2's ERG data app lets you set up workouts, including the Concept 2 workout of the day, right from the app. You can customize your display, connect your Apple Watch, and more. Download ERG data today. Wintech and King Racing are pleased to be the official boat supplier of the 2024 San Diego Crew Classic. As the world's largest, most sustainable, and most innovative boat builder, they champion accessibility above all, offering a wide range of boats for every type of athlete and budget. Their extensive global network of distributors means that their mission can be carried out anywhere. Backed by 200 plus technicians at their state-of-the-art manufacturing facility and grounded in the time-honored design of the legendary Klaus Filter and Graeme King, you can count on the quality and performance of any one of their boats out of the 2,500 that are made annually. The original Broken Yoke Cafe started in 1979 in Pacific Beach and has since become a Southern California favorite for breakfast, brunch, and lunch. Broken Yoke Cafe is more than just a place to eat. It's a gathering spot for friends, families, and communities. Our cafes are designed to be comfortable and inviting, providing a relaxed atmosphere where conversation flows and memories are made. We are proud to be part of your mornings, whether it's a casual weekday breakfast or a leisurely weekend brunch. Life begins after breakfast at Broken Yoke Cafe. Discover Mission Bay's 27 miles of sandy shoreline and 4,600 acres of aquatic recreational space, providing adventures for all ages. Enjoy family-friendly activities and everything from boating and kayaking to paddleboarding and biking at the world's largest aquatic park. Stay, play, and dine on Mission Bay. Check out hotels, events, and more at discovermissionbay.org.
Lining up now in our stake boats, we have the men's collegiate novice eight, the Derek Golker Memorial Cup. In lane one, Orange Coast College. Lane two, Gonzaga. Three, UC Davis. Four, UCLA. Five, USC. Six, UCSB. Seven, San Diego State University. Eight, UC Irvine. You can see our boats lining up. As always, the thing to look for is where those blades are in the water. If they're flat on the water as they are now, you know that that start is not imminent. As soon as the blades go into the water, you know that there's a chance that that race is about to start. All right, and we will come back with the racing. We've got a little bit of a delay in the start as the referees attend to some uh, equipment issues. One of the things that you're looking at on the screen there is that, you know, our, our people out on the water, our operations are more than just about making sure that the course and the lanes and the stake boats are in working order. They're also there to help out in the event that a crew needs any sort of repair, if there's any sort of breakage or anything, they are there on hand to help out because we do want to have fair racing. We want everyone to have the opportunity to race. That's very important here. Um, so hats off to these guys. They're spending their entire day in the sun and they do a lot of hard work to help this regatta happen. All right, 
Lining up now, the men's collegiate novice eight, the Derek Elker Memorial Cup. Again, lane one, Orange Coast College. Lane two, Gonzaga. Lane three, UC Davis. Lane four, UCLA. Lane five, University of Southern California. Lane six, UCSB Santa Barbara. Lane seven, San Diego State University. Lane eight, UC Irvine, and our race is off. Clean starts. Blade still moving through the water. Once we clear that first hundred, we've walked out of the way of danger of breakage, and the race is on. That's right. We've got a lot of action happening out here on the race course with eight lanes across. That is a lot to keep track of. It's also a lot for the coxswain. So if you're out there in lane eight, you've got to kind of keep track of what's going on in lane one, lane two. So you've got to have some savvy, savvy coxswains as they steer those boats down the race course. Of course, this is a novice event. So a lot of these athletes in their first year of rowing, uh, definitely coming from other sports, but walking on to their collegiate team. But then some might also have experience, had, had experience in high school. Um, hard to tell, but if this is their first year of collegiate rowing, all these crews doing a great job getting out of the gates cleanly and getting through that first 500. I don't know about you, Adrian, but I've always loved novice racing. I think it makes for a really great experience. All of these athletes are welcoming themselves to the sport of rowing. And especially with the San Diego Crew Classic being a season opener for many, this is often the first opportunity many of them have had to really test themselves in a real racing environment. And especially when you look at a race like this, eight lanes across, we have eight big boats and this may be their first time racing. This is a heck of a race to jump into. You've got beautiful conditions, nice water. All of these athletes are new to this sport. And we're watching this wonderful race go down. I just think Novice 8's racing, always a really fun one to spectate. Oh, absolutely. The blind fury of Novice rowing is always entertaining. If we had a microphone out there, you could hear that intensity coming out of the coxswains um, and just, you know, a lot of action out there. So rowing is deceptively relaxed sport. So when you're watching, if you're new parents, uh, spectators that are watching online, this looks so easy. We always hear that. It looks so easy, such an easy sport, but it's not. Of course, the intensity is there. You're going to hear that aggression from the coxswains and a lot of action. It, it, novice racing is, is awesome. And the San Diego Crew Classic, what a great place to start your collegiate career with eight lanes across. And right now, that crew doing the best out of the gates, it's going to be lane two, Gonzaga. Gonzaga right now with that lead position over Orange Coast College. Orange Coast in that second place spot, sitting just ahead of UCLA. UCLA in lane four. So those top three boats, they look to have a bit of open water over the rest of the field. And then it's pretty tightly bunched up. I've got UC Davis in fourth, followed by UC Santa Barbara rowing out of lane six. So we'll come back with a little bit more boat placement when we get a better look at the entire field. But right now, your top three boats, Gonzaga, Orange Coast, and UCLA. Gonzaga making a really strong move through the middle there, pushing themselves up over Orange Coast. We can now see that UCLA is sitting in third and followed by, looks like University of Southern California has made a move up perhaps. In lane five, UC Davis over in lane three next in that fifth place position. After that, we're seeing some assemblage there of UCSB, SDSU, and UCI all fighting for that six, seven, eight position. It looks like that might be Santa Barbara sitting in the sixth position, followed by SDSU trailing the group is UCI. Yeah, and definitely what we see um, is a lot of change up in novice rowing. You know, it's not over till it's over. You can see a lot happen. Um, there can be, there can be mistakes. There can be big moves. Um, there can be a lot that happens in this novice in this novice eights race, and with eight boats across, man, what a field! But Gonzaga doing a nice job. They are just going to pull themselves away from the rest of the party, 
they're rowing pretty cleanly up there. Probably a lot of experience actually in that novice boat. Hard to tell again whether or not um, you know this this team has some walk-ons or they've got some experienced kids that um, come out of high school and join that program. My guess is they've got some really good recruits in that Gonzaga boat. But also doing well behind them is Orange Coast College. Also likely looking at some athletes that have experience coming out of high school and then UCLA as well. Again, a storied program in their 90th year of competition. So those are your top three boats. We're going to move back into the inside here. Davis currently holding on to that fourth place spot. USC in the mix as well. With UC Santa Barbara. San Diego State and UCI rounding out the competition. And it's important to know when you're looking at novice racing, it depends on the size of the school as to whether or not they may even have a recruiting program. And so, as you mentioned, you might have a boat full of walk-ons versus a boat full of recruits in a novice aid. It all depends on the size of the program and what kind of capacity they have to bring in new athletes and where they're able to find those athletes from. And that's what can create such a spread across novice racing is the difference in those athletes. Recruits, athletes that were rowers prior, juniors rowers, or walk-ons that just got found because maybe they happen to be tall walking across campus. I know many of us have found rowing in that way, myself included. But we get back to the racing here, and it looks like we've got Gonzaga holding that one position, followed by Orange Coast in two. And it looks like we have UCLA in three, followed by Davis in four. Then I'm seeing UCSB, followed by USC. There's Gonzaga across the line. OCC in two. UCLA making their finish. And now here comes Davis. Davis. And then pretty tight here between UC Santa Barbara and USC. I believe it will be Santa Barbara with that fifth place spot followed by USC. And then San Diego State and UCI in eight. Sure, there are plenty of other places where the ocean meets the shore. But in Southern California, it just feels different. We think it tastes different, too. With a wide range of great-tasting, high-quality beers handcrafted in San Diego, we here at Coronado Brewing Company have made it our life's work to bring the coastal lifestyle directly to you. So go ahead, try and find another place quite like this. Good luck trying. Until then, we'll be here. Does your fitness routine have swing? Or are you still looking for that perfect workout? The Active and Fit Now program is a flexible and affordable fitness program designed to let you work out your way. Visit the Active and Fit Now booth to learn more and register to win a free Garmin GPS smartwatch. The Oarboard is revolutionizing the sport of recreational rowing. Transform your paddleboard into a performance rowing boat for the freedom to row anywhere, anytime. Stable and safe, it rows in wind and waves. Boat wakes, no problem. Training, fitness, fun, and adventure with the amazing Oarboard. Oarboard is super portable, breaks down fast into its wheelie bag so it travels as luggage and stores easily in your home. It comes with two-part carbon sculling oars for easy transport. For a challenging workout or a leisurely row, the Oarboard SUP Rower is the top choice for recreational rowing. Visit the Orboard tent on Vendor Row to learn more. Lining up is race 52, the men's collegiate novice B8. In lane one, Orange Coast College. Lane two, UC Davis. Lane three, UC Irvine. 
Lane four, UC Santa Barbara. Our race is off. The starts are through, and our boats are starting to settle in to their positions. Orange Coast College taking an early lead out of that start. We'll see what UC Davis sitting in second has got to respond. Maybe they're going to let them sit. Maybe they'll try and close that gap. And then respectively, in three and four position, UCI, followed by UC Santa Barbara. All of these boats will be making their way to the A final. So when you've got that, you know that these boats are going to be simply playing for position going into that final. If standings change in this race, it'll just change the way that they take off in the order of lane assignments when they get to their A final. Again, Orange Coast College, historically being a feeder program, they do bring a lot of juniors rowers in. So there's usually a good shot that you've got some experienced rowers jumping into that boat. Tends to lend to them having good and early success. Athletes know that they can make their way there, find good coaching, come together with other good rowers and find some fast boats. UC Davis, a little bit of open water now behind Orange Coast College. They have hit the island. As always, love seeing that beach and the palm trees in the background of your shot there. This quintessential San Diego as it gets. Orange Coast College OCC opening up more water now, trying to put as much distance between themselves and second place as possible. Again, with all boats moving to the A final, this is one of those situations where your energy expenditure versus your placement is going to be an important note here. Giving only enough to make sure that you get the position that you need, holding back enough so that you feel nice and fresh come the final. Our wakeless referees launches passing by there on that shot, making their way back down the course. Plenty of open water now between OCC and Davis. And this is a great opportunity to just say a big thank you to all of our volunteers here at the event. Hundreds of volunteers are giving their time to put on this event for all of you. So if you see anybody wearing a San Diego Crew Classic shirt or wearing a badge, give them a big old thank you. Thank them for their hard work, for dedicating their time and their efforts here to bring this event off flawlessly. We also get lots of athletes from Community Rowing San Diego, a partner program down in the South Bay of San Diego who come and give their time to help put this event on. So if you see any Community Rowing of San Diego athletes, please give them a big thank you as well. As athletes have crossed over the thousand meter mark now, OCC with a firm and commanding lead in this race, many boats of open water over UC Davis, UCI well behind UC Dave uh, well behind UC Davis And at this point I believe these positions are going to be well determined going into the A final OCC just trying to stay clean here. No need for them to continue to up their lead.
and they have settled their rate down to about a 32, 33, which is just a nice, comfortable rate here at the Crew Classic course. We've been seeing a lot of 36s today. So when you see a crew at 32, 33, you know that they've done what we call shutting it down. They've gotten to the point where they know they have enough lead that they can just settle, bring themselves across the line. And at that point, all they have to do is just keep an eye on the other boats in the race. They're crossing that gap of the second bridge now. So on this Crew Classic course, again, we've talked about this before, but there are two bridges and two land masses. As you start the race, you are at your first bridge. You have about 50 to 100 meters of protected water, and then you hit that first bridge at which you experience cross currents and cross winds. It is a signature of this course, and any coxswain going into this race knows what to expect. And then you hit your first landmass, and that landmass brings you some nice, protected, calm water where you're not getting hit by any currents or winds, usually. And when you hit that point, you're able to establish a bit of your race command or at least execute your race plan. You then hit a second bridge, which brings you more cross currents and cross wind. And then you hit your final landmass, where again becomes nice protected water. And it's your chance to turn on the turbos and hit the end of your race, unless you have enough of a lead like OCC has here. They still look like they're going to execute a sprint. Maybe they're just using this as an opportunity to tune up for the final. OCC about to cross the line in position one. And there they are. OCC, your winners of this prelim race. Davis still sitting in that second place position. Open water between them and Santa Barbara. There goes Davis across the line with their horn. Santa Barbara out in lane four. We'll be crossing in third, followed by UC Irvine in lane three. Now we have event 55, the Women's Collegiate Novice 8. Now this has been combined with event 54 to make for one race. Washington was in by themselves in, lane 50, in race 54, so they were added to race 55 in lane 7. So announcing our lineups in this race. Lane 1, Texas. Lane 2, Washington. Lane 3, California. Lane 4, 
USC women. Lane 5, University of California, San Diego. Lane 6, University of San Diego. Lane 7, Washington. All right, and this is an open eight category. A lot of these boats are third varsity level, or um, even with some programs, they're novice or freshman boat. Um, because there isn't a novice or freshman designation for women, um, they generally will push those crews into the 3B category um, or the open category. So that's why we find Washington here out in lane seven. That's likely their novice boat. Washington, a program that is historically built on walk-ons. So they get some phenomenal athletes coming out of high school. They teach them how to row. They go fast. And we're seeing that here as that outside lane seven is in the mix here for one of those top spots. But right now it is the crew from California that looks to have about a half a boat length advantage over both lanes one and two. So Texas in the second place position, sitting about two seats over the first entry from Washington in lane two. Adrian, I really like the way that you summed that up. They find tall athletes, they teach them to row, and they make them go fast. I think that should be the motto of every collegiate rowing program. Walk across campus, find tall people, make them fit, teach them to row, and uh, and they go fast. I think that's the goal of every coach, right? I, I think that's been the hallmark of a lot of programs, definitely, is that you know you find a good athlete and you can teach them how to row. So it's one of the wonderful things about the sport of rowing is that you can have zero experience and become a national champion all in the same year in a sport that you might not have ever touched an oar before your first year, and anything can happen. But California right now really taking advantage of this nice water. They are pushing their themselves ahead now to a bit of open water over the rest of the field. So great start here by California right out of the gates, but looking at a couple seats of open water over Texas. So Texas in that second place position, sitting a few seats now over Washington. We'll pan back out and take a look at the rest of the field but we're looking at some really good movements uh, by the Washington boat out in lane seven, as well as USC and UC San Diego. California looking strong now as they are coming to the tents. Texas in a rare second position right now, being really challenged by California here, is setting the tone, holding that lead. Washington sitting in that third place. This is an absolute powerhouse of a race. There is no shortage of speed between these boats. And this is definitely one to watch. If you want to see what good rowing looks like, make your way down to the shore because this is real rowing here. That's right. The Golden Bears of California making it look easy as they come into the final strokes. Again, this is a preliminary race for lanes. And all boats will move on to the grand final tomorrow. But right now, it is California up front, open water right now over Texas. Texas looking at about four seats over the University of Washington. Strong showing by California in this race, taking that one spot. Texas holding that second position from lane one. Washington taking third from lane two. And Washington also coming in fourth from the outside lane. USC looking like they're holding in that fifth position. University of San Diego in fifth. And University of California, San Diego in sixth. Correction there, University of San Diego in sixth, the University of California, San Diego seventh. That being a seven boat race. Yeah, and that's, that's really setting us up for some great racing tomorrow um, as these boats will be shuffled around in lane order um, in terms of speed. So we'll get some really good side by side racing um, and likely see a little bit closer uh, closer racing between boats tomorrow.
I'm on carpool duty for lacrosse, and I have to prep for Taco Tuesday. I'm too busy to try to gym. We get it. With Active and Fit Now, it's easy to find a gym that fits your schedule with no long-term contracts, plus tons of on-demand workout videos and a well-being coach to help keep you on track. Click the link and get Active and Fit Now. I'm stuck at work all day. I don't want to be stuck at the wrong gym. We get it. With Active and Fit Now, you can choose from thousands of gyms with no long-term contracts or cancellation fees. Plus, tons of on-demand workout videos and a well-being coach included in your membership. Click the link and get Active and Fit Now. All right, both sitting in the stakes right now for our men's Open 8, the Anderson Barthwick Memorial Trophy presented by San Diego Rowing Club. All of these boats will be moving to the A final. In lane one, California. Lane two, UC Santa Barbara. Lane three, California. Lane four, UC Santa Barbara. Lane five, UC Santa Barbara. Lane six, UC Santa Barbara. Lane seven, Los Angeles, Lane 8, UC Davis. Did I mention there are UC Santa Barbara boats in this race? Differentiate between boats. We'll try, we'll try and make it clear for you by lane, um, but I think this is one that you just have to watch on the big screen. Um, and then, obviously, if you're a Gaucho fan, get yourself down to the beach because there'll be plenty to cheer for here. There's going to be a lot happening in this men's open eight race. So keep your eyes tuned to the screens or tuned to the water because there's going to be a lot of movement, I'm sure, happening in this race. You know, so interesting uh, to note here with the four UC Santa Barbara boats, that's really a testament to the, the strength of their program to be able to host that many eights on the water, plus the other boats that they've already raced uh, this morning is just really a, a great hallmark of that program. They, they get a lot of excitement in the rowing program. Uh, the, the lake that they row on, Lake Takuma, it's about a half, uh, half an hour or so from the campus. So, you know, it's not an easy haul, uh, but they definitely get the personnel down there. And they've got a lot of kids in the program. Program is strong. It's doing great. And we're seeing that right here with four boats in this open eight category. Wow. I mean, that, that is really saying something for that program. And right now, positions wise, as we start to get into some settled in racing here, it looks like California in lane one has taken the lead with California in lane three in second, followed by UCLA out in lane seven, sitting in that third position. LA Rowing Club. Correction, LA Rowing Club, not UCLA. My apologies. Then it appears that we've got two Santa Barbara boats, Santa Barbara boat in lane two and Santa Barbara in lane four, holding that four five position out to UC Davis in lane eight. Unsure on the other boats after that, but I will assume that they are Santa Barbara boats.
All right, and interesting to note between the California crews that are up front, we've got Cal in lane one, we've got Cal in lane three, and they brought down their 4V and their freshmen. So right now what's on the line is a little bit of intra-squad pride. Hard to tell exactly, you know, between what happens at practice and then what happens at race day, who gets the upper hand. But California always being a very, very fast freshman crew, and of course, top to bottom seed as they are the defending national champions. Um, we're sur sure to see some good top end speed here today. But right now, it's California and California up front. They are followed by Los Angeles Rowing Club. Los Angeles Rowing Club, a smaller club, it's masters only. They row out in uh, Marina Del Rey, and great to see them here besting some of these collegiate crews. This is the only club, fully club crew, um, and not a college crew. And it's important to remember there are lots of boats in this race, and so there could be several races happening within the race because every boat, as you tend to when you're in a race like this, you're going to find the closest boat to you and race them. So while you also have your one, two, three positions, we keep referencing California, California, and Los Angeles Rowing Club, you also are going to have other boats that are racing each other in their own right. You may see UCSB boats racing each other or UCSB against UC Davis back in the race. It all depends on the perspective that we're able to gather from whatever the camera crews are seeing at that moment in time. But it looks like we are seeing California, California, and a UCSB boat there. Yep, that bright yellow Empocker of the California boat, a hallmark of that program. Those are fast boats. And of course, whatever boat Cal Rose is gonna be fast, um, but that uh, lane one, looking pretty speedy there and also pretty relaxed. You know, there's not much that they're gonna need to do. Again, this is a clue land, so all of these boats will move on to the grand final and get to race again tomorrow. Um, we'll find them, find them likely in probably a little bit different lane order um, as they generally are seated fastest starting in lane one and then going from there. So this lane one, they'll probably be back in that same position tomorrow. Um, as they continue to hold off the rest of the field. But getting into the spectator area, it is Cal followed by Cal, followed by the Los Angeles Rowing Club. We're gonna see those baby blue blades all the way across the course in lane seven. At last check, they were holding on to that third place position ahead of the four UC Santa Barbara boats um, and Davis also in the mix. California just looking long, connected, and strong together as they hold that lead position. Putting that distance between them and their other eight. You know they're enjoying that view, being able to look back at their other eight. It looks like Los Angeles Rowing Club and the first UCSB boat may be vying for that third position. All of these boats will be going to the A final. So what you're going to see with these finishings is that this is going to shuffle up the lane placements for tomorrow. UCSB looking like they're challenging Los Angeles Rowing Club for that third position. Although LARC may have the upper hand here. Let's see if they can hold that position three. And there's LARC across the line in that third position. First UCSB boat. And Davis across the line. All remaining boats are UCSB.
All right, and we are already underway with race number 57. This is heat one of the Mes Men's Masters Club Championship 8. This is going to be a very hotly contested race as the top four boats will go on to the grand finals and the remainder, remainder will move on to a B-level final. Right now, we've got seven boats on the course. In lane one, San Diego Alumni. Lane two, X Nemo. Lane three, Texas Rowing Center. Lane four, Community Rowing. Lane five, Marin. Lane six, Potomac. And lane seven, Lake Washington. All right, and uh, we're already well underway here in this club championship eight and well out in front. It is going to be the crew from Potomac. So Potomac Boat Club with a good amount of open water between themselves and Ex Nemo. Ex Nemo, a bunch of Harvard alums um, rowing in disguise in that boat. Ex Nemo being um, a Latin phrase that is on one of their flags at Red Top, one of the, one of the boat houses that Harvard has. Um, and I'll leave it up to you to find out what the meaning of that of that name is. But Ex Nemo currently in that second place position, Potomac in the lead. All right, well out in front again, it is Potomac. They're gonna be followed by the crew from Ex Nemo, coxed by the indomitable Whitney Powell. Whitney guiding that ship to uh, sure victory as they chase down uh, the Potomac Boat Club. But again, you know, the top four boats are just gonna move on to the grand final. So this is gonna be a good race for those top four. Behind them, behind Ex Nemo, it is the crew from Marin. Marin rowing out of lane five. They look to be in the third place position sitting just ahead of uh, the crew from CRI with San Diego alums in there as well in lane one. There we're seeing X Nemo coming down the course. Marin right behind trying to give a challenge to X Nemo. As they've crossed that second bridge, settling in Potomac well ahead. Following Marin, it looks like we have San Diego that has moved up or CR or Texas. Looks like Texas has taken a slight lead on San Diego. And well out of the picture because they're so far in front, it is Potomac. So let the, uh, the screen not misguide you, but there is another boat that is way out in front there. Again, this is, I believe this is a handicapped race. So even though the boats will finish in, in, in a particular finish order, we have to then take the handicap to find out what the actual finish order will be. So um, Shane, I know that you just finished rowing in a couple of uh, masters events yesterday. How much do you think about the handicap when you are in the middle of a race? Well, thank for, thankfully for me, neither of those race, races used handicaps yesterday. It was a real finish. But when you think about any kind of a handicap race, 
it you you're never quite sure so you can work as hard as you want but depending on what that spread is going to be on the handicap between the boats even a 30 second lead might not be enough for you to secure that victory so it's important for you to pay attention that and that you never let off the press because you're never quite sure if you have enough of a gap and you can finish that line and you can cross that finish line first and then have to sit there and tick down seconds hoping that that gap of a handicap is going to be enough that you can still secure that victory. Potomac Boat Club now, Potomac Rowing Club now crossing that line, taking that first position. All right, here they come. Ex Nemo in lane two with that second place position. A little open water for them as they come across. Marin occupying that third place spot and then pretty close here between San Diego, Texas. San Diego alumni challenging Texas Rowing Center here. On the outside, Lake Washington. Looks like San Diego and Lake Washington nose for nose on that finish. Finishing up this race of the men's club champ eight. This will be CRI. Not to be confused with community rowing in San Diego. This is CRI is a club program that is in Boston. So this is community rowing Inc from Boston, finishing up their final strokes here of the Men's Masters Club Champion 8, the Coronado Kays Realty Club Cup. Lining up now, our men's Masters Club Champ 8, Coronado K's Realty Cup. This is our Heat 2. This is an eight-boat race in lane one, Wimbleball. Lane two, Cambridge. Lane three, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane four, Crimson Death Bar. Lane five, East Bay. Lane six, Long Beach. Lane seven, BIAC, Lane 8, RCA Alumni. We're letting this race get underway. Eight boats across. Men's Masters Club Champ 8. Spaces 1 through 4 will make their way to the A final. The remaining will be to the B final. Strong start here by lane seven. That's Bayak. Bayak rowing out of the port of Redwood City. And really a true community program where they host mostly masters, but they also have adaptive programs um, and as well starting to dabble in the sport of coastal rowing. So really exciting for a lot of clubs as they take on that new challenge. Coastal rowing really starting to increase in popularity lately. Obviously, being brought from the top down as many national rowing associations are wanting to bring coastal rowing to the mainstream. San Diego being what it is means that this will definitely be a hub for coastal rowing going forward. So it's definitely a sport to keep your eye on as a rower to be able to have some perhaps transitionary talent that makes its way over to a parallel sport, if you will. Now I've got to give a call out here to lane three, San Diego Rowing Club. Let's see how they're doing as they get into this race. We're now caught up with where this race is making its way through the second bridge. Right, and San Diego Rowing Club, important to note, they are, of course, the hosts of the San Diego Crew Classic. They run this event from top to bottom. 
And we really want to thank them and all of their members for the efforts that they put in, not only today or this weekend, but year round to make this event what it is. The Crew Classic would not be here without the San Diego Rowing Club. And Mike Coxon yesterday, Caitlin Turner is coxing that boat today. So she's already got one victory under her belt. <laughs> Hopefully she's open for a second one here. She's pretty busy then. I mean, that's one of the great things here is that you can race in a, in a number of different events over the course of the weekend. If you're a master, you can race in an open event. You can race in a handicap master's event. You can race in a quad. It's all here at the Crew Classic. Now, again, one through four making their way to the A final, the remaining to the B final. So currently looking at Wimble Ball in one, Bayak in two, as we can see from our perspective here. Now that those boats are nearing the finish line, we'll be able to give you a clearer call as they cross the line. Yeah, a lot of action out there with all of these boats. We've got eight boats across with really a great cross-section of Masters rowing. Some ex-Olympians. We've got some ex-amazing collegiate athletes. That Crimson Death Barge boat, we know that's a Harvard lightweight alum boat. But here we go. As we come across, it is Wimbleball just by a couple of seats. Followed by Bayek and then RCA alumni. Rowing Canada. What Again, we have two international entries in just this event alone. Followed by Cambridge and then Long Beach. Here comes San Diego Rowing Club across the line. East Bay. And then and then East Bay. All right, and then East Bay as our final crew in eighth place. And again, important to note that the top four boats, um, after we take a look at all the handicaps, are going to be moving on to a grand final. And then the second final will be for the remaining four crews. All right, and we're moving right back into the racing. It's already currently underway in the Women's Masters Club Championship 8. This is the Talia Kelly Considine Cup. In lane one, Toronto Sculling of Canada. Lane two, Sammamish Rowing. Lane three, Old Growth. Lane four, Lake Union. Lane five, East Bay. And lane six, Endeavor Rowing. Currently, it looks like 1-2 sitting Toronto Sculling and Lake Union, perhaps exchanging back and forth. After that, we've got Old Growth Rowing and Sammamish Rowing. Again, now at this point, we're starting to settle into the race, starting to find a little bit more of our potential finishing placement. Important to note that there's a lot of racing still yet to go for them, these athletes. All right, we've got a lot of international flair here in this uh, in this event and a good cross-section. A lot of Northwest crews, though, with Sammamish, Old Growth, Lake Union, all uh, coming from the Northwest area. Old Growth coming out of the Portland area. 
Um, would love to get a little bit more information about that club and find out um, who those ladies are, but they're pretty speedy, so great to see them out here. But right now, that lead still belongs to Toronto Sculling with Lake Union also in the mix. In third, it belongs to Sammamish Rowing Club, followed by Endeavor Racing. Endeavor Racing, um, kind of I think what we would call a, a bit of a not necessarily a Rolodex crew, but a crew with um, athletes from all over different parts of the country. They come together for different camps to train together and then meet up at different events and race. Um, and they're pretty fast. So um, fun to see Endeavor out here um, putting down a fast time here at the Crew Classic. So that looks like Toronto Sculling currently holding that one position in lane one. Then we've got lane two, Sammamish Rowing. Lake Union currently in fourth. These crews having crossed that second bridge, hitting their landmass now. Now's the time to make your way down to the sand to see these boats as they're moving into their finish. It's looking like lane one, Toronto Sculling in the lead. Lane two, Sammamish Rowing, looking like they're in second. Followed by Lake Union. Looking like they're in third. Endeavor Racing in fourth. And then East Bay. And potentially Old Growth. But here comes Toronto Sculling across the line. There's Sammamish in two. Lake Union in three. Endeavor in four. East Bay in five. And Old Growth in six. All right, we are underway here with heat two of the Women's Masters Club Championship Eight. This is the Talia Kelly Considine Cup. 
top four boats will advance to the A-level final and the remainder will move on to a B-level final. Again, this is after the handicaps have all been um, calculated. So kind of hard to tell as they come across the line exactly what place they're going to be, but we can at least give you the lane assignments. In lane one, Bayak. Lane two, Sammamish. Lane three, Vancouver. Lane four, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane five, Los Angeles Rowing Club. Lane six, Lake Washington. And lane seven, East Bay Rowing Club. As we're seeing the start here, Bayak looking like they are in first, followed by Los Angeles Rowing Club. Vancouver and Lake Washington both in the mix. However, as with many of these races, what we're seeing right now is a delayed start. So at a certain point, we will pick back up with the actual racing once they are midway through the race. So you are getting a replay currently of what happened during the start. But they are further down the course than what you are seeing now. Now, as you get into these club boats, what you start to notice is that the lane assignments do have a differing play on how the race plays out. Uh, you notice that those lane assignments may not be as impactful as in the collegiate racing, where you may see lanes one, two, three, and four finishing in that same order. You may find that your lanes here have less bearing on the finishing in the race, so boats could be spread all over the place as you get into this club racing. That's right. And a really an interesting cross-section of clubs um, and obviously level of athletes. We've got um, ladies of all different um, ages that are out here coming into this sport with different levels of experience, some with experience coming out of college perhaps or high school, and then some picking up an oar in their 40s or 50s. Really a testament to how wonderful Masters Rowing is. And we're seeing um, a lot of different speed out there with lane one, Bayak holding on on to a good lead position right now, followed by Los Angeles Rowing Club with Lake Washington in third. In fourth, I am looking at Vancouver, followed by fifth place, Sammamish, San Diego Rowing Club in sixth, and then East Bay in seventh. Right now, we're seeing Los Angeles and Lake Washington side by side there with Vancouver in that shot as well. Racing now has made its way into that final 500 meters for those top teams. Bayak holding that lane one first position with a commanding lead at the moment. Those blades getting into the water quickly. They want to get to that finish line. Following that, we've got Los Angeles Rowing Club. And Lake Washington. With Vancouver of note in that grouping of three there. Then it looks like Sammamish... San Diego and East Bay in that order. So looking strong here as they come across the line, this Bayak crew. Bayak, again, a, a small community rowing club that operates on the port of Redwood City. They draw from uh, the entire Bay Area. 
and really are a true community club. Los Angeles Rowing Club right here as they come across. A master's only club rowing in uh, Marina Del Rey. And then Lake Washington. Lining up now for race 61, men's masters H and I, 8, 70 plus. In lane 1, San Diego alumni. Lane 2, X Nemo. Lane 3, San Diego Rowing Club. There goes our race. These three eights are off. Our very own commentator, Matt Staley, in the San Diego Rowing Club boat in lane three. And again, as um, as we have said, this is a master's category. Category H, the further up you get in the alphabet, the older you are. So these athletes, all 70, an average age of 70. So 70 and above. Rowing is really a life sport. And it's so awesome to see when we come to these events and there's Masters Nationals and different festivals and regattas across the country. The Masters athletes are some of the most dedicated and hardcore that you'll see. And certainly maintaining a level of competitiveness um, that allows them to be able to race at an event such as the San Diego Crew Classic with a lot of competition around them. We just saw that in the Women's Masters Club 8 with all of those different entries. And then here, no different with the San Diego alumni, Ex Nemo and San Diego Rowing Club battling it out for that men's master's age, 70 plus. Seeing these men's masters of this age group are, I think, one of the more inspiring stories of what we see here in rowing, as it is a testament to the ability for rowing to span all age groups. So what we're seeing here is the entire spread of age categories that you can find in rowing we started the day with our under 16 and we are now at 70 plus in boats that have rowed and raced today and that there is a testament to the ability for how long this sport can really stay in your life and i think one of the reasons that rowing becomes so emboldened within somebody's life is the understanding that this can span the test of time it can go with you and move through every phase of your life and the reality is, is that master's rowing, like even though you get older, it doesn't get easier. I mean, the, the handicap is a killer. Back in the day, they used to actually stagger start boats. So they'd make you sit on the line. If you had a 90 second handicap, you were sitting there for a minute and a half while the other boat started. And then you try to play a game of catch up. Well, now they do a little bit of a calculation and, and make it a little more side by side racing. Um, but it doesn't make it any easier. And, you know, the older you are, the more of a handicap you have, but you still got to go fast because these guys definitely are going to bring it on race day. San Diego alumni, uh, this is likely a collegiate alumni boat um, coming out to, to race together. Ex Nemo is uh, Harvard alums. The name 
again from the Latin phrase on the flag at red top, ex nemo non feces, or take crap from no one. You got to love that. I believe early in the race, I said uh, our very own commentator, Matt Staley, who you may have heard yesterday if you were here in the race, was in the San Diego Rowing Club boat. I'd like to correct myself, I believe he is probably in the San Diego alumni boat that is currently sitting in that lead position. Now, Andrew, you mentioned that they used to do stagger starts. I don't know what, what I would prefer, a stagger start or a time handicap. It's almost almost bad both ways. You finish and then you have to sit there and count down the seconds, hoping that you are you finished by enough of a margin that the you can wipe out the handicap. But a stagger start, then you've got somebody to chase. So I'm not sure which I'd like better. I know it's, it's deceptive. But, you know, if you like time trials, then maybe you would like the staggered start. Um, but the side-by-side -side racing is also brutal because you can cross the line first and come in last. <laughs> Looking at the San Diego alumni overhead now, that's a wonderful shot. This is one of the better shots I feel like I've seen of the day of just getting to watch rowing in its beauty here. And they are doing a great job. Very synced up for this group. They are holding that lead position in lane one. Up on X Nemo right now by what looks to be several lengths of open. Nice and clean rowing for San Diego alumni in one. X Nemo in two, San Diego Rowing Club in three. This is a final only race. Now this will be handicapped by time, so you will have to wait for the the results once the race is over for that time handicap to be calculated. But currently as it stands, raw finishing, Al San Diego alumni will be one, X Nemo two, San Diego Rowing Club three. Some of these masters crews when they come together at the crew classic it might be the first time that they've rode together it could be the 30th time that they've rode together but most likely they aren't getting together too uh, we got some jubilation there in the coxswain seat of that san diego alumni boat that's awesome uh, but you know that they get together and and row it could be that it's really more like a reunion and a party and that's really what the crew classic has always been about it is like the coming out party for the rowing world and always a good time a way to reconnect with friends and also get a great workout maybe have a beer at the beer tent and something worth noting for those of you that are following along with the Masters racing and wanting to find out standings and times after you're done, make sure that you are heading to the San Diego Crew Classic website, which I believe is San Diego Crew Classic.org, where you will be able to see the results. That is where you want to go in order to see the standings of all of these races. You'll want to check out the results page there in order to get accurate finishing times, because as I said at the beginning of the day, while I reserve most of the time my opinion to be correct, you know, there are times where I'm wrong. And so the finishes that we can call may not be accurate. We're just calling it as we see it in front of us. But the accurate results come from the time, and those will be on the website. All right, we're going to take a little bit of a break here. You get a, uh, a brief break from our voices. There'll be a moment of, of uh, some silence along the airways. And then we'll come back with some adaptive rowing. We'll be back at 120. Um, and have several races of um, adaptive events, and then we'll move back over to the junior events.
One, two, three. Here we come and through. Or board race coming up. Can I do a bit of it? Okay, we've got the or board race coming up in a couple of minutes. We have some great contestants who have volunteered to come here. It's a lot of fitness, fun, and adventure. We got Ed, Ed Ives from UW, an alumni. We've got Igor Baraska all the way from Split Croatia coming to defend his Orbor championship from last year. We've got Adam Fur Furioso Holland. Uh, he's from the Stanford of the East, uh, Harvard alumni. And we've got Jim Dahl also rounding out in the singles. And in the doubles, we've got the East Bay Rowing Club, uh, some local ladies from Oakland. We've got Eve and Verita. Uh, and also, we've got two assistant coaches from the USC Trojans, Chaz and Evan, who will be in the double. We'll be having some fun, fitness, fun, and adventure. It's going to be uh, a bit of a rock and row kind of row, uh, rowing race. So come down, check it out. It's going to be a ton of fun. We'll be doing this just in a couple minutes.
Welcome to the Orboard Showcase. We're, <laughs> we're showing off some of these great Orboards. We've got Racer Rows, Adventure Rows, and Adventure Combo Rows out there. These boats are fully inflatable, collapsible. You can take them anywhere in the world. I've taken them down to Rio de Janeiro, over to Hawaii, over to the Bahamas, and obviously on my home island, Vancouver Island. These are boats made for fitness, fun, and adventure. You know, we're really proud to be sponsors here of the San Diego Crew Club classic and really wanted to give out a giant thank you to all the volunteers and the workers who make this happen. This is one of the preeminent regattas here on the West Coast and it wouldn't happen without all of you. So a big thank you. You know, we love water, we love rowing and obviously we love you. So thank you so much. Uh, racers, please get into your lines, get ready. Uh, once I see that we have good enough alignment, I will start you with this call. Rowers, are you ready? Attention, row. And at that row, these rowers have the challenge of crossing over the buoy line once, turning around on the other side of the race course, coming back and crossing over the buoy line one more time. They're rowing a figure eight. However, they choose to draw it on the course. And it's uh, it's a bit of a challenge. We don't want to be hitting any boats. We don't want to uh, crash into any boats. So rowers, I'm seeing you're looking in a good alignment. You're looking quite uh, comfortable. Uh, we've got some great rowers here. Like I said, if you look in the red boat, we've got Ed Ives. Ed Ives from, from UW. Uh, he's also an Olympic silver medalist and a cancer survivor. We love people who survive illnesses and continue to row. Rowing is one of the healthiest activities that are out there. Beside him, you'll see Jim Dahl. Jim Dahl. Oh, no, that's not Jim Dahl. That's Igor Baraska. Igor Baraska, a mechanical engineer and econ major from Split Croatia, Brown University. Beside him in the double, we've got uh, Eve and Verita from the East Bay Rowing Club. These two are going to cook up some speed for us, and they're going to drive some, some results. Uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about them. Uh, next to them, we've got Chaz and Evan, two assistant coaches from USC Trojans. They're going to do their athletes some pride. And next to them, we've got Adam Hall. And uh, uh, he's a specialist in law, specialist in law from Harvard, also a rowing and wrestling coach. And finally, in the yellow boat, uh, we've got Jim Dahl, a guy who's placed seventh at uh, the uh, at, at Boston, second at Boston a couple times in the single. So, rowers, are you ready? Attention, row. And there we go. They're off to a good start. Keep going. We've got the East Bay crew. They took a little bit of a lead off the start. We'll see if they can keep it as they come down the course. Uh, in the East Bay crew, in the blue boat, we've got Eve and Verita. Eve, uh, such a, a wonderful woman. She started rowing just in 2021 over COVID. Uh, she lives in Oakland, and she actually has a house on Adam Street. She was telling me that at one point she had a boyfriend by the name of Adam, and she's excited to be racing against a guy by the name of Adam in this race, Mr. Adam Holland. Uh, she actually won first place in the mixed eight yesterday. So cheers to her and her uh, partner, Verita, who just joined her last minute, uh, filled in for Pamela, who had to scratch la scratch out. And uh, Verita, here she is. Uh, she loves puzzles, and she's, <laughs> she's getting into a puzzle right now with Jim right here. And we can see that there's a lot of challenges as the boats cross over one another. They're trying to avoid one another. And uh, uh, looks like we've got Igor in the lead, uh, who's, who snuck in there. Igor is a bobsledder, bobsledding Olympian, as well as being a bronze medalist uh, in Sydney at the Olympics. And we've got a bit of a cluster <laughs> at, the, uh, <laughs> at the turnaround point. And we see we've got Adam, we've got Ed pushing together. There we go, making their way through it, making the most of it, having some fun. And it looks like we've got Igor in the lead uh, with Chaz and Evan behind. Uh, Chaz and Evan. Chaz uh, is an EMT in training and trained to be a fireman. He recently lost 15 pounds, mostly from rowing more and drinking less beer. <laughs> a great job on, on losing that weight, Evan, uh, or on losing that weight, Chaz. And we got Evan. Evan started rowing one month ago and is an aquaphobe. He's scared of the water. So congratulations, Evan. 
uh, for uh, for showing up. No, actually, he just earned his master's and is an old uh, a rowing coach uh, from uh, Oxford Brooks and USC. Uh, he actually even won the Cox Four at Royal Henley. And here we've got Igor coming in through the final. A great job, Igor. And now we've got Chaz and uh, Evan running up. And right behind them, we've got Evan coming in, Adam Holland coming in uh, behind Jim Dandridge. As Jim gets out, here we've got Adam. Uh, not only is he a rowing and wrestling coach, but he's a law guy at the Brooklyn Klein Center at Harvard. And he focuses in cease and desist letters uh, that you get on the Internet. I wonder if we're going to cease and desist letter if we post any images of Adam on the Internet from him. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, after that, we've got the two lovely ladies from the East Bay Rowing Club, Well Road, Women Well Road, uh, coming into the to the final piece. Uh, these, you know, <laughs> these boats. And we want to thank everybody for being excellent participants and great sports. You know, in these boats, the ultimate recreational boat for your for your sailboat, for your cottage, for your lake home. Yeah, uh, these boats are incredible. I put I love putting my kids on them. I got my kids at the age of four rowing, rowing on boats like this. Uh, throw your dogs on them. Yeah, they're they're very collapsible, transportable, and they give you independence. We have a lot of people who love using these boats because they can just store them. Uh, and and uh, the, all the boats below are completely inflatable. Uh, the rigging is completely collapsible and can be transported in small little bags anywhere, uh, anywhere you want in the world. So congratulations to all of the rowers. Congratulations to Igor for, for, for coming out on top once again. So big thank you once again to all of our participants. Give them a big round of applause. Uh, Ed Ives, Igor Baraska, Adam Holland, Jim Dahl, Eve and Pamela from East Bay, and Chaz and Evan from USC Trojans. So here's myself, Adam Creek. Thank you all for showing up for contributing to this regatta. Uh, stay fit, have fun, have an adventure, love what you do, love what you row, and enjoy your time together.
I was like, wait, what the hell are they saying? Oh, and then it's like, Megatron? Yeah. Like, okay, why did you get two points? I heard two points, they have like, one. Yeah, I got Nick Filter. Yeah. They did, yeah. <laughs> it's so oh. funny. Two. It's so funny, too, like, he's... Everything. So I was like, oh no. <laughs> I think it was like in what, half slide the whole way? Or, um, the button. Now you can barely walk. I don't know.
again. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Freedom Rose Inclusion Doubles event that have just taken off. In lane one, we have Unity Boat Club. Two, three, four, and five are all from Unity. This is a minority owned boat club represented in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, Washington, DC, and Northern Virginia. These athletes are peer three athletes, inclusion doubles, meaning 50% of the crew have some sort of impairment and their support rower uh, does not. We'd like you to give them a big hand. They're doing a thousand meter race today as they come through. Looks like lane three is out of head. Rowers in this boat who represent Freedom Rows, Greg Quarles. Greg is from uh, Washington, D.C. and Alabama, and also competed in the Valor Games, Warrior Games, and in Dusseldorf, Germany, competed in Victus.
Looks like lane one is pulling up. Sean Lee represents that boat. Sean also competed at the Invictus Games last September with Greg. Freedom Rose has 66 members rowing on the water today, representing 12 clubs out of the 34 Freedom Rose clubs nationwide. They represent all branches of service. We have three boats really tight coming here into the finish. It's a two-boat race? Well, yeah, it's a four-boat race. All right. All our Freedom Rowers are wearing red visors today with the Freedom Rowers logo. If you see a Freedom Rowers, please thank them for their service. Lane one is coming into the finish from Unity Boat Club. Looks like lane two is also Unity. Go Unity! Woo! Nice race. We, I could feel it, but our captain made a really good call right before. He was really good. Well, this is, she's only rode with us once, and she hasn't talked in 25 years. Her second time talking in five years. Yes, there's more coming. That was the first five. The next race coming up is going to be the men's inclusion double. In this event, one of the crew members has some sort of an impairment. Their support rower does not. They are using a fixed seat. 
So the fixed seat does not slide, which requires a slightly narrower rigger and shorter oars. So as you watch these boats go by, you might take some of those details in and imagine what it would be like for yourself to row and not able to uh, use the sliding seat. Yeah. I'm on carpool duty for lacrosse, and I have to prep for Taco Tuesday. I'm too busy to try to jam. We get it. With Active and Fit Now, it's easy to find a gym that fits your schedule. With no long-term contracts, plus tons of on-demand workout videos and a well-being coach to help keep you on track. Click the link and get Active and Fit Now. ...is threatened by enemies often unseen the alert marine. and unexpected in the midst of an uncertain and evolving world the need for marines to defeat these shifting threats is critical because the need to ensure stability for our nation has never been greater when there are battles to win for america's future there is one constant marines the future if you're all about messing around in boats, having a good time, having a good piece of equipment for your lake house, for your sailboat, or you know, these boats are great. I know that I've seen that you can basically pack them and carry them onto an airplane. Wherever you like to go, wherever you want to row, this is a way to keep rowing. You can't put your single in the overhead compartment. Rowing an oarboard is stable, safe, and fun. It converts a paddleboard into a performance rowing boat. Now you can go rowing and play in the waves. Oarboard is revolutionizing the sport of rowing. My age should be there, it's like four inches. Mm -hmm.
have a vote for the next one. Okay, we have a start for the next race. There are seven votes in this event. Might mention that some of the programs here today represented at Freedom Rose belong to Unity Boat Club from Washington, D.C., Raleigh, Durham, and Northern Virginia, Atlanta Rowing Club, Warriors of Oklahoma City, Nashville, Tennessee, Community Rowing of San Diego at Nashville City, Otsego Area Rowing near Cooperstown, New York, and Casitas Rowing. These are 12 of the 34 Freedom Rose programs that are located throughout the United States. We have 66 members of the Freedom Rose team rowing today. This event coming down includes uh, here are two rowers, some with big seats, and the bow rowers are short rowers with sliding seats. Lane one is Endeavor Rowing. This event includes both PR2 and PR3 rowers. PR2 rowers use a fixed seat in the stern position. A bow rower is in a sliding seat. You'll also notice some PR3 rowers who are both using sliding seats. Thank you. Strong showing with Endeavor Rowing coming down in lane one. The light blue unis. Thank you. 
Unity Boat Club is indicated by the yellow and red uniforms. They're out of Raleigh, Durham, Washington, D.C., and Northern Virginia. Appear to be coming in in second and third position in this event. Nice job, Endeavor. Good job. Our last remaining boat in this event is Mike, is Mike Smithson and Andrea Theus, former national team member. She is the coach of Otsego Rowing in the state of New York. Mike is a Navy veteran, is uh, returning to adaptive rowing. And our final boat across the finish line is Unity Rowing Club.
moments to come. Thank you, they're not straight now. Next race coming up is going to be the men's Freedom Rose 8 and the mixed inclusion 8. Freedom Rose is a program that is partially funded by the Veterans Administration through U.S. Rowing to enhance and improve the lives of our injured veterans. There are 34 programs nationwide. Okay, looks like we're off for the eight. They'll be coming down the course in lane one. It's the men's eight. Consists of uh, teams from Nashville Rowing, Unity Boat Club, Detroit Boat Club, Warriors on the Water, Community Rowing of San Diego, and CRI Boston. In lane two, you have a composite crew from Oklahoma City Warriors, Atlanta Rowing Club, and Community Rowing of San Diego. In lane three, we have a composite team. First year here at the Crew Classic from Western Reserve Rowing, Otsego Area Rowing, Community Rowing, and Casitas Rowing. In lane four, we have a composite team, all from Oklahoma City Warriors. Lane one is a men's crew. Lanes two, three, and four are composite teams of both uh, men and women.
in a pretty tight one, two, and three. Lane two is the group from Atlanta. Lane one is pulled ahead. That is the men's eight. Lane two is the Atlanta eight. Lane three is Western Reserve Rowing with Osego, Community Rowing of San Diego. First boat is approaching the 1,000 meter mark, men's eight for Freedom Rose. Lane two from Atlanta and Oklahoma Warriors trailing in second place. And lane three is the boat from Western Reserve Rowing, Otsego and Casitas Rowing. Boats are just passing the causeway. like lane three is making a move on lane two. Men's eight out in front. So the team with Western Reserve rowing and community rowing, Osego rowing is making a move on the Atlanta boat right now. Thank you. 
Okay, we have the eights coming into view to the finish. Men's eight for Freedom Rose in the lead. Pretty close with lane two and three with Atlanta and Oklahoma. Come on, Freedom Rose, into the finish. Nice job, Freedom Rose. And finishing this race is the composite boat from Oklahoma City Warriors. Nice job, Freedom Rose. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our afternoon racing. We are back with event 44, Women's Youth 8 Plus. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Holy Names. Lane three, Long Beach Juniors. Lane four, Wesley. Lane five, St. Ignatius. Our first five Women's Youth 8s are on the course. This is Heat 1. Our finishers in this, one and two, will head to the A final. Three to four, we'll head to the B final. And five and six to the C final. As we've been doing with racing throughout the day, what you are seeing right now on the screen has already occurred. So we are catching up with those boats at their start, at which point we will join the live racing and we will be back up and running. And you will see how those boats have sorted themselves out. Reading through this start, however, we are looking at Marin in lane one, currently up. A little tough to tell when you see these views here. 
So you're not exactly sure where the cameras, where the boats are. We give you some skewed perspectives on how the racing is going. So we look for that overhead camera, just like we're seeing here. Out in lane five, looks like St. Ignatius. Holding on nice and tight there with lane two, Holy Names Academy. So sitting up Marin in one. Wesley in lane four being in that fourth spot. And I believe Long Beach Juniors will be off the back. Marin now passing that 1,000-meter mark. They have taken a decisive lead here, starting to open up water on Holy Names Academy as they move into this second half. And this is a really nice time for them to be making those moves, knowing that they've got that bridge crossing there, that gap where they're going to be catching a bit of tide and a bit of wind. Now as we move into afternoon racing, tides and winds will have shifted from what they may have experienced this morning. So there is going to be a bit of a new experience. So Cox and they may have been getting information from other boats, other teams, other coaches about what that morning racing was like. They may be expecting something a little bit different this afternoon. You can't necessarily rely on old information when it comes to water or wind conditions. All right, what you're seeing in front of you, that lane five, that's St. Ignatius. That's a team, a high school team, scholastic program from San, San Francisco that rows on Lake Merced, but it's a seasonal program. So they generally only row in the springtime and they are truly a testament to the walk-on athlete. They get a lot of really great athletes at St. Ignatius and uh, whatever their fall and their winter sport is, they then turn them into rowers in the springtime. And, you know, they might start out a little bit behind in the beginning of the spring, but man, do they catch up as the spring progresses. So St. Ignatius right here doing a really nice job right next to Wesley University, but out front, it is going to be Marin. Marin is is the defending champion in this event. Marin with a very solid lead by about a length and a half of open water over lane two, Holy Names. Holy Names from Seattle. Adrian, those multi-sport athletes are always some of my favorites. I think it, you know, when you look at juniors athletes, it's one of the best ways to go to develop young athletes. Specializing too early can often result in, in burnout and a lack of enjoyment for the sport. There's almost something magical to being able to jump into a seasonal sport, enjoy it for the time that you have, do your best that you can to get good at it, but then also enjoy being able to compete in other sports and being able to find yourself and become an athlete that can be versatile in what you're doing. 100%. You're speaking to the choir with me. Uh, not everyone necessarily agrees with that, but <laughs> you definitely will find some of those kids that are able to jump into different sports, especially while they're in high school, because once you get into college, almost impossible to do so. Uh, but right now, look like Marin as we come up to the spectator area, really all by themselves there against the shoreline, just kind of putting on a show, making sure that they get into one of those top two spots to progress to final A. So the progression here is the two top boats will move on to final A, places number three and four to final B, and then five and six move on to final C. So right now it does look like Marin and Holy Names will be those two boats followed by Wesley and the St. Ignatius, and then Long Beach. And this is, and this is one of the story's four teams. Wow. This is what is to, uh, to be taken up. And so we can see for three more heats after this one. And, uh, We'll see how these finals play out.
and here comes Long Beach Juniors. Long Beach Juniors now crossing that finish line. As that race is done, we will now start to prep for heat two of our women's youth eights. I'm sure at this point they are lining up down at the start line. All right, we're going to be back on track here with the women's youth eight heat number two in lane one, Newport. Lane two, Connecticut Boat Club. Lane three, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane four, Austin. And lane five, River City. And that looks like a clean start. And Shane, it definitely looks like um, maybe a little bit more of a challenge um, with the water. Definitely not, not anything that these athletes can't handle, but it looks a little bumpier than it was this morning. Um, maybe a little bit uh, cleaner catches, a little better um, in terms of, of release. You want to make sure that the blades release from the water, water free and clear of any sort of chop on the water because that'll definitely slow you down. But right now, all crews doing a great job getting out of the gates. We'll come back with a boat placement here in just a second. Yeah, Adrian, like you were saying, I mean, you do have uh, in the afternoon, like you get that classic San Diego wind that just starts to like and kick up. And I can attest to this from yesterday's racing. That afternoon racing does get windy. Um, but as you said, it's nothing that these crews can't handle. Right now, this is a very manageable wind. It's a normal part of racing to have some level of wind that does occur. And uh, now that they are settling in, they're starting to hit that landmass. You know that they're going to get a little bit more protection from that wind. Here's that calm bit where they now get to get into the meat and potatoes of their racing, settle in, get comfortable, and just start putting some power through those oars. And we had a close-up shot previously of that Newport boat there in lane one. They are looking like a really strong consolidated crew. And indeed, they do have the lead here um, at the halfway point. They are looking at about a length open or a length uh, uh, up on the second place crew, which is coming out of lane three, that San Diego rowing club. San Diego right now with about two to three seats over Connecticut Boat Club in lane two. And in your fourth place position, it will be Austin Rowing Club, followed by River City. But right now, Newport just kind of pouring it on here as they continue to inch just a little bit farther away from the other two boats. Great racing here side by side with Connecticut and San Diego. Yeah, San Diego Rowing Club looking like they're a little bit hungry right now. They're trying to, wanting to uh, connect with this race and wanting to drive there through Connecticut. Um, but Newport definitely trying to stay on that power and nudge those crews away. We're dealing with a, little, a couple technical things here on the uh, on the announcer's side, but I think I'm free and clear. Right now it is Newport now with a bit of open water, a little bit of change up here between Connecticut and San Diego. Connecticut now taking over that second place position. Very important to note that just two crews will advance to the A-level final. So Connecticut now turning it on right when they need to, to get into possibly one of those top two positions to move on to the A-level final. It's not over till it's over, though. We've still got plenty of water left. San Diego, it was really close here to Connecticut. They actually had a little bit of the lead, and then Connecticut just kind of took off, taking over that second place position. But San Diego still in it. In fourth, it continues to be Austin. River City continuing in that fifth place position. Again, all boats will advance to another, uh, another final. Just depends on what level. Top two to the, to the A-level final the next two to the B-level final, and places five and six move on to the C-level final. But there we go, Newport now, plenty of open water for them between 
themselves and the rest of the field. And this being the first of the uh, events where we are going to see an A, B, and a C final. Yeah, and part of that is because this is the most subscribed to event in the entire Crew Classic for this weekend. The women's Youth 8 seeing 19 entries, which is maybe some of the, the most that they've had uh, ever or in recent memory. So testament to not only the strength of, of junior rowing, but to women's rowing in general and the popularity that we've seen at the NCAA level. It just all feeds into it and uh, just really awesome to see that. And some international participation here. We just saw the team from Australia they did a great job. Uh, and we are looking at a good cross section here with Texas represented, Southern California, Central California, and Connecticut. So awesome to see all those different levels um, of rowing um, in every heat here. But really, really good racing here between San Diego and Connecticut. It's just kind of going back and forth. So Connecticut right now does have the advantage, but not by much. San Diego is still in it. And here as a crew that is showing themselves to be an East Coast team coming to a West Coast race and leaving their stamp on what is historically a very West Coast heavy race. It's always nice to see those East Coast Yeah, and Shane, talking about the um, expertise coming out of the Connecticut boat, coached by Liz Tron, that is a all-girls program in Connecticut, continually sending boats to the Youth National Championships. They've won out here in San Diego. This last summer, they actually sent a pair off to the World Championships, so they went through the whole trials process. I mean, man, what, what a great uh, buffer to that team to be able to have that level of international experience. So bring yourselves down to the beach as we get into the final strokes here, but it is Newport well by themselves out in front coming into the final strokes. At this point, they are followed by Connecticut in that solid second place position. San Diego chasing. Austin just off of the stern deck of the San Diego boat. And then River City in fifth. And really loving that commanding position here of Newport sitting in lane one. They are looking strong as they come across the line. To me, that says we're going to see a really exciting A final when we finally get to that point. I think we've had some commanding performances here, at least in these first two heats. So as we get into the finals, we're going to have some good racing when we see that tomorrow. There's San Diego Rowing Club coming in third, Austin in fourth, and River City going to be crossing that line in fifth. All right, and we don't get much of a break here. We're already into race number 69. This is heat number three of the women's youth eight. And like we said, total 19 entries over the course of this end, uh, of this event. So we've got a lot of action on the water. Top two boats to the A level final and the remainder will move on to uh, B and C level final. In lane one, Oakland Strokes. Lane two, NorCal Crew. Lane three, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane four, Texas Rowing Center, and lane five, TBC Racing. This is a great shot of the starting line and gives you a really good indication of what these groups are going through when they sit there. You can see that pontoon on the left-hand side of your screen if you're looking to the monitors that is the starting boat the official starting the race is standing on top there they're calling the boats to alignment you have those stake boats which hold the boats in place and they're moving those boats forward and back to make sure that there is an as even a start as they can possibly get then the official standing on top of that pontoon will lift a flag call attention for the race and when that flag drops the race begins so those athletes eyes are to the flag that goes up and there's the drop of the flag, and you can see those crews then take off right into that race. Looks like we've got a decently clean start here. No obvious errors, which hopefully means that we'll settle in and get to watch some nice clean racing here. 
All right, and as we're looking at the, the screen right there, that is Texas Rowing Center. You can tell by the star in the center of the unisuit, they've got stars on the blades as well. Um, and good to see them there. Always a strong crew, a good entry in this youth eight. But out in front, it is gonna be Oakland Strokes jumping out to an early lead. They had a pretty aggressive start. Always nice to start your event uh, with a solid lead. Sometimes the strategy is to come from behind, maintain, you know, maybe a little bit of relaxation and just kind of chip away. But Oakland Strokes, I think what they're doing is let's get out in front and stay out in front. So right now that coxswain looking across at the bow ball of the NorCal boat. So they have one full length on the rest of the field. NorCal and Marina Aquatic Center right next to each other, too close to call, maybe slight advantage going to NorCal for that lead for that second place position. Marina in third being challenged by Texas Rowing Center. And then right there as well, TBC Racing all the way from Washington, D.C. At this point, it almost looks like it's a three-way across for that third place position. Marine Aquatics, Marina Aquatic Center, Texas Rowing Center, and TBC Racing all vying for that third spot. Oakland Strokes holding up in that lane one, commanding that position right now again. We always say this, and we've said this in many of the races, but the start does not necessarily tell us where the race is going to end up. But it is a good indicator of how the teams are squaring up, how they're feeling out the race, and gives you a good indicator of the kind of power and togetherness that a boat can generate right out of the starting gates. That's right. And, you know, the nice thing about this event is that this is not a one and done. So they're going to get another chance to go down the race course. And while San Diego is an important event, it definitely sets a tone for the spring. It is not everything. All of these boats focused on getting a spot at the Youth National Championships um, at the end of May, beginning of June, um, or meddling and, and placing at their regional championships or perhaps even the scholastic championships. So as we come down the race course, it is Oakland Strokes with NorCal just sitting right there there has not been any sort of a change in separation between Oakland and NorCal so Oakland trying to hold off a charge here by NorCal NorCal not letting them walk away anymore but they have separated themselves out from the remaining crews right now it looks as if uh, Marina excuse me as if Texas Rowing Center is holding on to that third place position just barely over Marina and TBC Racing and of any of those three boats there, I'd say Marina Aquatic Center starting to drop back a little bit. We'll see what Texas Rowing Center and TBC Racing do here as they start to hit this island. We'll see what kind of race plan they've got planned here. But Oakland Strokes, NorCal Crew, they are both looking strong off the front. Love seeing that NorCal Crew is almost tying themselves to the Oakland Strokes performance. They're not ready to settle back and join that second group of Marina Aquatic Center, Texas Rowing Center, and TBC Racing. They're kind of stepping up a little bit, taking a look at that Oakland Strokes boat and saying, we are here to race. We're not going to let you guys go. We're not going to let you jump off the front. We're going to make you earn it, and we're going to stay here and hold our spot. Yeah, very aggressive rowing and pretty smart there by NorCal. They are, again, they're holding tight to the Oakland Strokes boat. If you look as if, you know, the coxswain can take a look across, you can look behind her and see that, you know, we're solidly in that second and qualifying position. Maybe we just hold it right here. Maybe not put all their cards on the table. Hard to tell exactly what the race plan is. But again, they are still within contact to Oakland Strokes. And this is a great opportunity for them as they, if, if they do move forward into that A-level final to figure out what do we need to do in our race plan to make sure that we're a little bit closer. And then when you're looking at racing conditions like this, where you start to see these afternoon races, winds begin to pick up. And that's a pretty normal use case on most uh, courses. You will see afternoon wind be winds begin to pick up. As that happens, you'll notice one of the more important things that a crew can do is to try and come together, work on that blade speed into the water. Because the more technical you can be, the more together you are, you almost can fly through that water rather than trying to power your way through the water. It goes a long ways towards letting the boat set itself rather than fighting that boat for performance. And so you let that boat run itself out. You just work on keeping it set and balanced so that you can row as a team rather than trying to be a superstar out there on the water. Yeah, and the conditions have changed a little bit from this morning, but, you know, again, nothing that is um, too alarming. There's a little bit of a cross headwind, maybe makes it a little more challenging on the technical side. As Shane said, getting the blades in the water 
and always is is pretty important but making sure that the finishes are clean as well so the finish meaning when they take the blade out of the water making sure that it's pulling free and clear and that you're not tapping down on the water which can definitely slow you down but this race up front here between oakland and norcal super interesting as it has stayed right there in the same position for about 1250 meters so it's going to be interesting to see what the tactic is as we come into the final 500 yeah real credit here to the norcal crew for pegging themselves to oakland i mean oakland took that early lead but norcal has been unflinching in their ability to stay connected here often when you see that kind of a jump happen from a crew you'll see any crews around them just start to slowly let that distance slip away as they, they don't love being in that behind position, but you can tell NorCal crew has really committed to being here. Now, the question is, who's going to turn it on? Because, you know, if you're the Oakland Strokes and you're looking at this and saying, I've probably got position one locked up, how hard do I want to work? Because we're in an afternoon race and we're going to have a final tomorrow. So do we want to turn it on to ensure our position one and to establish some dominance right now? Or do we feel like continuing to row in this position? Let's just lock in one. Let's not work it too hard. Let's let NorCal sit there and try to work harder than we are to stay connected with us. And then when we cross that line, perhaps we've asked them to expend a little bit more energy than they wanted to maintain that position. There's just a lot of jockeying happening, I have to imagine, between those two boats right now. Meanwhile, we're looking at Marina Aquatic Center, Texas Rowing Center, and TBC Rowing there. If I were to guess, I would say we're looking at Texas Rowing Center, followed by TBC Racing, and then Marina Aquatic Center in that 3-4-5 position. Right now, Oakland Strokes, all these boats now in their final 250. Oakland Strokes still looking just as strong as they come into the finish. Almost the same positioning as they have had with NorCal Crew this whole race. Those two boats are going to finish 1-2 in their respective positions. Yep, both boats rowing at about 40 strokes a minute there in the final 250 meters. And there's NorCal as they come across that third place boat will be Texas Rowing Center. Great job for them as they continue to hold off TBC Racing. And then finally, Marina Aquatic Center in the fifth place position. And that's going to wrap up our race 44, Women's Youth 8 in the third heat. As we say that, our fourth heat is surely getting lined up at the start line right now. At any moment, I imagine we will be getting footage of them and we'll be able to see the beginning of that race. All right, we will pick up race number 70 in progress as we take a look at the finish of this last race and those nice overhead shots. But we'll give you the race lineup for this final heat of the Women's Youth Eight. Just four boats in this next heat. It is lane one, Sagatuck. Lane two, Capital Crew. Lane three, Pacific. And lane four, Indianapolis Rowing Club. I don't know why, Adrian, but I just love seeing starts. There's always something about how strong crews look whenever they take off the line. There just always looks like there's so much connection happening in the boat. The way that the stroke rates are high, I just love watching starts in boats. It's always fun to have those close-ups. Well, as anyone knows that's been on the water, the start is really the most exciting part of the race. I mean, there's so much pent-up energy. It's like letting the horses out of the gate. And, you know, probably for coxswains, one of the most exciting times as well. You've got to make sure that that boat goes straight. This is 2,000 meters of a straight shot a little more than a mile all the way down the course. And, you know, if you oversteer, if you use the rudder, it slows the boat down. So for the coxswains, the start is also super important to nail it. Early look at the standings right now. It looks like Saugatuck and Capital with perhaps Capital up just a hair, but a little tough to tell. Following that, it uh, looks like we've got Pacific and then Indianapolis Rowing Club sitting in that fourth position off the back. It looks a bit like Pacific is trying to tag themselves to Capital at this moment in time. I mean, that's a smart move based off of how Capital was moving at the start. But look at Sagatuck here. They just took almost a length out of Capital in maybe a 10-second window of time there, which is a stunning amount of distance to take in that short of a window of time. 
and it does not look like they're stopping. I think they took a nice controlled start. And man, that settle looks incredibly strong for them as they moved out to either decks overlapping or maybe a hair of open water there. So if Pacific is smart, they're going to tie themselves to capital to try and race themselves down the water. Hopefully, if those other crews are successful, they may be thinking, hey, maybe Sogatuck came out too hot too early just to try and establish something and they might not be able to hold on to it. I have to imagine that's what they're hoping at this moment in time. Yes, this is setting us up for some really great racing tomorrow. Sagatuck was third in this event last year, so of course hoping to improve on that finish, but they're looking like they're in a pretty solid uh, solid position right now to advance to that grand final and definitely come up to challenge Oakland, Marin, and Newport. Just behind them, Capital Crew. Capital Rose on Lake Natoma in the Gold River area near Sacramento. We all know that anyone from the West Coast, you've spent a lot of time at Lake Natoma, and that's their home course. So Capital Crew doing a nice job here solidly in that second and qualifying position. They were sixth in this event last year at the Crew Classic. Just behind them off the stern deck, it's going to be Pacific, Pacific Rowing um, on Lake Merced in San Francisco. And then just behind them, Indianapolis Rowing Club all the way from Indiana. All right, we're seeing a little bit of bumps coming in off of the water there, that afternoon glare. Sagatuck really doing a nice job. I've got them clocked at about 36 strokes a minute. That's pretty impressive. Uh, good level of fitness. Sagatuck from Westport, Connecticut. We've got another Connecticut crew out here. We saw Connecticut Boat Club in one of the previous heats and Sagatuck um, also from that area of Connecticut. So behind them now by a good amount of open water continues to be capital. So we've got like kind of four different races going on here. We've got Sagatuck, Capital, Pacific, Indianapolis, just kind of all doing their own thing and their own um, in their own lanes, but they will all progress on to a final. The first two will go on to the A-level final. The remaining uh, th places three and four will go on to the B-level final. And I just clocked Capital at about a 36 stroke right there. Again, that seems to be the stroke rate du jour of the race today. Most crews tend to be settling there. And uh, you find off often that that higher rate can actually be a little bit more helpful, even in those windy conditions, because it means that you're not spending as much time with those blades flying through the air. It gives you that opportunity to really sink them in and just kind of chip away at the race, which is exactly what these crews are doing. Sagatuck with their commanding lead, still present. Capital now sitting in second trying to hold on to that position, but as it's standing now, it's looking like we've got kind of our finishing positions there with Sagatuck and Capital taking one and two, obviously still more racing to go, so anything can happen. But following Capital, we've got Pacific, and then in that fourth place position, Indianapolis Rowing Club. This is the time to make your way down to the shore to catch the fourth of these heats for the women's youth eight as they come to the finish line. This is the marquee event on the women's side for junior rowing. I would say with all the, the 19 entries, this is going to be one of the most competitive races. I'm so excited to see what's going to play out on the water tomorrow. Surely there's going to be some really tight racing in all level finals. So not just the A final, but that B level final is going to be hot. C level final is going to be hot. It's pretty great here. Sagatuck for the win as they come into the final strokes. A high level of fitness. You can see that as they come into this headwind, keeping the stroke rate up high and continuing to push away. And it will be their bow first across the line in this final heat of the women's youth eight. And I clocked them up in the 40s on their stroke right there. So they went for it. Even though they had that lead, they were not happy to just sail it across the finish line. They wanted to execute that sprint, perhaps in an effort to think about what they've got coming at them tomorrow, knowing that they secured their spot in that A final. That's right. And then one of the things that we had mentioned earlier, too, with the collegiate races is that oftentimes, you know, with these heats back to back the way that they are, you can really come off the water and compare times. You can take a look like what happened in that previous heat. Every heat is different. You know, you're, you're going to get a little different pressure depending on who's next to you. Um, Sagatuck definitely was not challenged that much in that race. So um, but still good to come off the water and kind of check times and see if you're in the same window. And here we go uh, with Indianapolis across the line. And that wraps up that women's youth eight. We will now move over to the men's youth eight. 
And that was a good bout of racing that we saw there. And now as we turn our eyes to the starting line again, the men's youth eight, we have a two heat race here with our one through four moving to the A final and the rest remaining heading to the B final. Now in this heat one, we have in lane one, Marin, lane two, NorCal crew, lane three, Newport Sea Base, lane four, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane 5, Wesley. Lane 6, Capital. Lane 7, Marina Aquatic Center. Looks like in lane 7 there, Marina Aquatic Center sculling themselves over into place. You can see that that bow has drifted over a bit, or perhaps they came in at an angle to get that stern over to the stake boat and then scull their way over into position. This is, that, this is that view, Adrian, that I just love of the Crew Classic, though. It's the SeaWorld Tower there. You see the gondolas heading over. Anybody that's at SeaWorld at this moment that happens to be in a gondola are getting the best getting view the best in the shot. house. Absolutely. And every so often, you'll hear a little whoop whoop from one of those. <laughs> it kind of gives you a little bit, a little pumped up there on the, on the start. We had that yesterday in our race. We had some good, good cheering coming from the gondolas overhead. As long as it's not too distracting. <laughs> All right, and we're getting ready for a start here. It looks like all boats are ready to go, and here we go. You know, as you take the take a look at the start, a start can really be a signature of a crew and their ability to connect with each other. There's often this, as, as we've said over and over, the start offers this opportunity to either be frantic or connected, and you can watch frantic crews and often those crews who are frantic are ones who have not quite come together as a crew yet. They haven't learned how to work together. And so you get eight people all trying to fight to push themselves into the lead. And when you finally come together as a crew, you realize that it doesn't take any one superstar out there. It really takes each of the athletes in the boat committing to each other and just giving up to the process in order to make a boat go fast, especially out of the start. That's right. And we're looking right now. That's Marina Aquatic Center right in front of us. They are in lane seven. So a little bit farther away from lane one, They've, that coxswain's got to look all the way across and through all of those different crews to try and figure out their placement. And right now there's still a good amount of overlap. The only uh, crew that's just a little bit off the back is going to be capital crew rowing out of lane six. But right now our leader is going to come out of lane three, that middle lane that was the first shot we got, the first close-up shot that was so beautiful. That was Newport Sea Base. So Newport Sea Base holding on to the top position sitting just over NorCal and San Diego Rowing Club for second or third. Next to NorCal is going to be our fourth place crew, which is Marin, uh, Marin, excuse me, Marin is the winner of this event from last year. And even as I am talking, this is changing. So everything's tightening up a little bit down there. Right now I'm looking at Marin, NorCal, San Diego, and, uh, and Marina Aquatic Center almost straight ac across. We're getting a good look at those crews from behind. Right now we're looking at lanes one, two, and three. And it looks like from what we're seeing right now, Marin sitting in the lead, followed by Newport Sea Base in second and NorCal crew in third. If that is indeed what the current lineup is based off of those first four lanes that we're able to see. That's right. Marin doing a nice job. They got out of the gate a little, I don't want to say slow because all these crews are extremely fast, but they know they don't have to win the start. They got to win at the finish line. So Marin coming on a little bit of a slow burn for them there, but they came out and just kind of chipped away at that lead that Newport Sea Base had generated from the very beginning. So these top three crews uh, really pushing themselves away with a little more distance between themselves and the rest of the field. So Marin right now looking at about a six to seven seat advantage over Newport Sea Base. NorCal just behind Newport Sea Base by about a length, maybe a little bit of open water. And then we'll have to pan out to see where the rest of the field is to find the placements here. Then we had gotten a bit of a look there at Wesley and San Diego Rowing Club, but a little tough to tell at the current moment without the grand perspective of the racing overhead. 
that looks to me like one, two, and three. That would be Marin, Newport Sea Base, and NorCal Crew still sitting in their one, two, three positions. NorCal Crew has now moved out of camera position, so all we're seeing are what I believe to be the first and second place positions. That would be Marin and Newport Sea Base as they cross through that second bridge. Really reaching to try and get to that sand because they know that there's a little bit of safety in the sand when you pass the bridge. Yeah, maybe the, the water calms down just a little bit. You're not getting as much of a pull out with the tide. Uh, Marin doing a nice job, looking like a very mature, lots of horsepower in that boat. You can tell with all of the run that that boat is getting. Um, again, kind of an elevated stroke rate. I'll get the stroke rating on them. I'm getting them at about a 35. What about you? Yep, got them at, at, at about a 35. So that's just about where they're going to be. That's a nice, co probably comfortable, if anything can be comfortable in a 2,000 meter race. But that's a good, comfortable base pace. That's where they're going to find themselves as being the most efficient. And indeed, they're doing a nice job of continuing to push a little bit farther afield of Newport and NorCal as they chase behind them. So we're looking at a few different races here. Newport Sea Base kind of by themselves there in that second place position between third and fourth. We'll keep our eyes on Marina Aquatic Center and NorCal. And then behind them, it looks to be Wesley, San Diego Rowing Club, and then finally Capital. And I'm trying to clock that Newport Sea Base stroke rate, and it looks like they're really starting to run high right now to try and claw back some of that space. Not sure if they think they have an opportunity here to sprint into that first place position, but they are certainly turning up that rate in an attempt to do so. That has, yeah, we're seeing a 39 to 40. That's about what I was seeing as well, Adrian. Um, we're seeing Newport fall a little bit further behind them. We'll see if maybe they had some massive sprint planned up their sleeve and if it's going to pay off for them to take that one position away from Marin. But I think at this point, with how far ahead Marin is, it may be a little too little too late. Yeah, Marin is a hard crew to beat. They have been so dominant in, um, in both on the men's and the women's side um, for this last year and it looks to not be letting up at all. So here they come. All the way to the finish, it's going to be Marin, their bow, first across the line in this heat, followed by Newport Sea Base on the chase, looking comfortable in that second place position. NorCal crew in third. And now in that fourth place position, we've got San Diego Rowing Club in the red shell, followed by Wesley. That looks to be then Marina Aquatic Center on the outside and Capital sitting in lane six off the back. All right, our second heat now of the Men's Youth 8 San Diego Rowing Club Cup. Again, the first four go to the A final, and the remaining in the race go to the B final. So last heat, we had seven in the race. This time, we've got six. In lane one, we have the Oakland Strokes. Lane two, Newport Aquatic Center. Lane three, Saugatuck. Lane four, Bell and Jesuit Crew. Lane five, Pacific. Lane six, Long Beach Juniors. Those crews taken off through that start. Lane four looking like they're jumping out. Bell and Jesuit crew looking like they want an eager lead here from that fourth lane position. Yeah, Bell and Jesuit, a private school from Miami, Florida. They are always really fast. And uh, right here looking like they're going to test themselves against uh, some of the best across the country. We've got a couple of California crews. We've got a Connecticut crew right next to them. And in the, the lineup here, uh, Oakland Strokes was second last year in this event. Newport right next to them was third. Saugatuck was sixth. So we're going to see a lot of uh, these boats really just going after it here. Saugatuck right now holding on to an early lead just by a couple of seats between Oakland Strokes, Newport, and Bell and Jesuit really just right next to each other. You know, I think something that happens in conditions like this, Adrian, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel like these conditions often give 
almost like a, a neutral mentality to every team where it's almost like, hey, we all know that we've got the same conditions, but that almost levels the playing field. Whereas a team that, you know, in flat conditions, you may think, oh, they may have us out horsepowered a little bit. You you almost think, well, we can out row them in a race like this. Our technique may come out over the top of this. And so it gives us almost a, a better fighting chance. That's at least when I'm on the water, I'm thinking mentality like that. All right, all things are set back. Like we've set the dial to zero here. This gives me a real equal opportunity to compete. I think there's definitely less room for error in uh, in challenging conditions. Again, I don't think these conditions are too challenging, but there's a little bit of chop out there. So the cleaner you can row, the better. Um, really making sure that you prioritize getting those blades in the water quickly, especially when you're moving into a little bit of a headwind. It's going to slow down the race. So you're going to spend a little bit more time out there, not appreciably, but you can see um, right there with the flags, that's a little bit of a crosswind. It's going to be pushing um, pushing the boats down to, to one side or the other. And right now, again, like we saw in the previous heat, coming on a little bit later is lane one, Oakland Strokes. So Oakland Strokes kind of sitting there in third, second position, um, now pushing themselves into the lead position, taking over from Bell and Jesuit. So Oakland right now in that lead, Bell and Jesuit in the second place spot. So as I'm looking at these standings now, based off of what we can see, it looks like Oakland Strokes, lane one, sitting in that first place position, followed by Sagatuck in second. Following them in lane three, Bell and Jesuit crew. And in fourth, Newport. Following them, it looks like Pacific in that fifth place position. And then Long Beach Juniors in sixth. Wow, this is going to be a great race all the way to the line here between Oakland, Sagatuck, and Bell and Jesuit. Again, apologies if I uh, slaughter and mispronounce the names of any teams out there. I'm going to say that ahead of time. Uh, but Bell and Jesuit, yeah, they're holding on tight there to that Sagatuck. It's hard to tell from our angle whether Sagatuck or Oakland has the lead. Oakland had pushed themselves back into that first place position. But Sagatuck is definitely on the surge here. And I would say looking to the Bell and Jesuit crew in Newport, we've got a really awesome race happening between these two. And the nice part about a race like that, when you see those that 3-4 position getting challenged, it often nudges both boats closer to the leaders and almost brings the entire race up to the front. And I love seeing racing like that because it means that you've got basically a four-boat race happening right now. Now, while you may say, okay, Oakland Strokes are sitting out front and we've got Sagatuck sitting in that second position, by Bell and Jesuit crew challenging Newport, they've almost put Newport into position to overtake Sagatuck, which is what it looks like we're starting to see right now. Newport starting to challenge Sagatuck. And as long as Bell and Jesuit crew stays on the heels of Newport, that's only going to benefit both of them. And I hate to throw this pun out there, but, you know, a rising tide may lift all boats in a situation like this. That's right. And so as we come into a little bit better angle, um, we are seeing that lead that Oakland Strokes has. Um, again, it's going to be, they're, they're going to have Sagatuck right there. Sagatuck's not going to go away. I can see that caution looking across at the Oakland Strokes boat, urging the crew to kind of stay in contact. They don't have to do much to stay in the second place position because they are continuing to pull away from both Newport and Belen Jesuit. Um, in these final strokes. So coming down to the spectator area, we're going to see it tighten up a little bit between lanes one and three, Oakland and Sagatuck. And it really looks like Sagatuck trying to put a press on two Oakland strokes here, seeing if they can give them a bit of a challenge. Not sure how much that number one position is going to mean to them, but they were definitely putting a press on for this final 250. Definitely a time to do it when your crew is that close. And if you've got the horsepower in the boat to make it happen, why not? Let's see if you can make a move to try and lock things in. But this may be one of the tightest finishes we've seen in a little while today. We're going to see four crews finishing in rapid succession here. That's right. And definitely on the men's side, this is one of the tighter tighter heats that we've seen. And these top four boats unofficially will move on. All the four that are right here in front of us finishing. Um, so we'll have Oakland, Sagatuck, Newport, 
and then Belen Jesuit moving on to that grand final. And that was definitely a race. So one of the things we've seen throughout the day is kind of holding a little bit back through the heats, just doing what you have to to make sure that you qualify. But those guys were out there racing. I mean, those were real those were real sprints. We're looking at it right now coming through with Pacific. Pacific rowing about uh, two lengths or so of open water ahead of Long Beach Juniors coming in to the sixth place spot. Coronado Brewing Company has been brewing abundantly hoppy West Coast style ales in the great tradition of San Diego craft beer since 1996. Founded by Ron and Rick Chapman in their hometown of Coronado, Coronado Brewing is a local brewery committed to bringing the spirit and flavor of San Diego to beer enthusiasts everywhere. Stop by the Coronado Brewing Beer Garden to enjoy one of their award-winning beers. Coronado Brewing Company. Stay coastal. Discover Mission Bay's 27 miles of sandy shoreline and 4,600 acres of aquatic recreational space, providing adventures for all ages. Enjoy family-friendly activities and everything from boating and kayaking to paddleboarding and biking at the world's largest aquatic park. Stay, play, and dine on Mission Bay. Check out hotels, events, and more at discovermissionbay.org. From ergometers to exercise classes, Active and Fit Now provides a flexible and affordable fitness program that sets up members like you for perfect workouts. Sprint to the Active and Fit Now booth to learn more and register to win a Garmin Phoenix 6X Pro Solar Edition smartwatch. The Oarboard is revolutionizing the sport of recreational rowing. Transform your paddleboard into a performance rowing boat for the freedom to row anywhere, anytime. Stable and safe, it rows in wind and waves. Boat wakes, no problem. Training, fitness, fun, and adventure with the amazing Oarboard. Oarboard is super portable, breaks down fast into its wheelie bag so it travels as luggage and stores easily in your home. It comes with two-part carbon sculling oars for easy transport. For a challenging workout or a leisurely row, the Oarboard Sup Rower is the top choice for recreational rowing. Visit the Oarboard tent on Vendor Row to learn more. Wintech and King Racing are pleased to be the official boat supplier of the 2024 San Diego Crew Classic. As the world's largest, most sustainable, and most innovative boat builder, they champion accessibility above all, offering a wide range of boats for every type of athlete and budget. Their extensive global network of distributors means that their mission can be carried out anywhere. Backed by 200-plus technicians at their state-of-the-art manufacturing facility and grounded in the time-honored design of the legendary Klaus Filter and Graeme King, you can count on the quality and performance of any one of their boats out of the 2,500 that are made annually. The Marines are a family that fights together, finding individual purpose in a collective cause, the protection of our nation and the advancement of its ideals. Side by side, they welcome obstacles and thrive on challenges. Each Marine stands as a vital part of a united force greater than any individual, more fulfilled than ever before. Visit the USMC tent on Vendor Row to learn more. Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We're committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. Visit the So Sporty tent on Vendor Row to learn more. San Diego Tourism Marketing District is a tourism improvement district serving all areas within the city of San Diego. SDTMD uses fees collected from local hotels to support the marketing and promotional efforts of a variety of programs, services, and special events throughout America's finest city. SDTMD's support for tourism marketing allows San Diego to maintain its status as an aspirational first-tier visitor destination, and it's vital to the strength and success of the city's tourism economy. The San Diego Crew Classic is proud to once again have the support of SDTMD in 2024. 
RivalKit is pleased to be the producer of the 2024 official Crew Classic Uni. RivalKit understands the necessity of high-quality, consistent gear, which allows rowers to push their limits in training and racing. Get your official 2024 San Diego Crew Classic Uni at the RivalKit tent in the center of Ender Row. Sitting now at the start line, we have race 47, the women's under 17, the Cox State Referee Cup. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Oakland Strokes. Lane three, Newport. Lane four, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane five, Capital. Lane six, Wesley. Lane seven, Pacific. Lane eight, CCHS Crew. All right, the challenge with these quick starts is that if you are not ready to go, they're going to start the race anyway. So we're seeing now a little bit of a challenge there um, on the outer lane, lane eight. The referees will be right on it, get that crew back into, um, into their lane. But as we go, it was a fairly clean start for everyone else. We've got eight boats across. There's a lot of action out there, a lot of overlap um, right now. The early leader is going to come out of lane six. That's Wesley University. Wesley, again, they are from Australia. So coming out here on a training and travel trip, what a, an amazing opportunity for those athletes, those young athletes to come across to the States and test themselves out on the waters here of Mission Bay. And you saw as that CCHS crew who took off to the hard right off of the start, it looked like they were starting to make some adjustments, trying to skull to get themselves into position steered hard right the thing they have to be careful about now is not over steering so that they overcorrect and come back hard into the course um, they start getting into problems there when they start jumping into other lanes it's okay if you're heading to the outside of the race there's nobody there to impact with but if you come back too hard then you end up in an almost opposite situation as we look at the race now we've got one two three four five and six lanes that are in sight here it looks like we've got oakland strokes maybe taking a slight lead with marin right behind them and hot on their heels then on to newport in lane three looking like they're in that third place position i would jump then out to wesley looking like they're in four followed by capital and san diego rowing club panning over we're getting a good eye here of what looks to be pacific and then on the outside, I would say we're unable to see CCHS crew right now, but I'm assuming that they are out there. There they are. And there's a view of that outside crew. Yeah, there's Cathedral Catholic, again, a scholastic program here in the San Diego area um, and focusing their sights at the end of their season on scholastic nationals. But up front, it is between Marin and Oakland Strokes. Good battle here. Marin looks to have taken back over that lead just by about a seat or so over Oakland. It could be this way all the way down the race course. Last year, and again, it's kind of hard to compare year to year with these age group um, races. This is under 17, eight, um, but Marin was the victor followed by Oakland Strokes and then Newport. Um, so we are looking at kind of a, a repeat of that as Marin is currently holding on to that top spot followed by Oakland. Oakland pushing themselves bow to stern over Newport. And a really interesting signature that's kind of come out today from both Marin and Oakland Strokes, I'd say we've seen this from both crews, is this real quiet, calm speed that they've taken through the middle of the race. And so it's interesting to see both Marin and the Oakland Strokes sitting right next to each other in this race because they almost have the same signature. Nobody's really jumping out too hard. You're not seeing a lot of urgency. You're just seeing this gentle press away through each race. 
where each of them sitting in lane one tend to take this dominant lead. But what's fun here is seeing Oakland and Marin right next to each other right now, holding on to that power with each other. You're seeing the same. It's like a, a copycat of each other. They're both trying to sit, take this calm, collected presence in this race. And I think it's going to nudge them both forward. Now looking out in lane three, Newport still looking out to lane six. Then Wesley still looking strong, uh, but San Diego Rowing Club making a bit of a push up there to challenge Wesley. So you may have a little bit of a fight for that fourth place position. Yeah, and as our angles change, we'll be able to see that a little bit more closely. But I think you're right. Wesley holding on to that fourth place spot. So again, um, this is really just kind of a, a race for lanes as we uh, move down the race course. All of these crews will carry over to tomorrow's grand final, um, but they'll be in a little bit different position as they come down the race course tomorrow. But what is sure is that Marin and Oakland will most likely be right next to each other as they continue to battle it out coming into the halfway point. And generally, as you start to see the end of that sandbar there, that's the end of that landmass. That usually puts them a little past 1,100 meters, maybe closer to 1,200. And so that gives you a good indication of about where we're falling in the race as they pass that beach there, which is going to take them onto their second bridge. And Marin and Oakland, both Bay Area crews, Marin rowing on Corte Monera Creek um, in the county of Marin. They're right in the shadow of Mount Tam, just such a beautiful place to row. Oakland Strokes rowing in uh, the Oakland Estuary, just the same place that the Cal men row as well. Um, Newport, obviously, down in the Newport Harbor. And uh, then Wesley coming all the way from, um, from Australia. They are in their 153rd year of rowing. So, wow, I mean, there's a lot of history in that program. It'd be really awesome to talk to those athletes and find out how they want to carry that tradition, that legacy um, with them over here at the Crew Classic, what they want to learn. I bet they're meeting a lot of other athletes and what a great um, experience for them. And this continues to be a great race between Marin and Oakland here, sitting in lanes one and two. And now we're starting to see what looks to be, at least from this angle, San Diego Rowing, uh, Newport starting to make their way up. But also San Diego Rowing Club looking like they're still in the fight right now, wanting that fourth place position and giving some challenge to Wesley two lanes over. And right in between them, Capital, you've got to imagine they're feeling a little bit of the pinch happening between the race on both sides of them, hoping that that will perhaps pull them along a little bit, give them a little bit of motivation to drive harder as they start to hit the end of their race. Yeah, and a lot of these athletes, um, pretty young, you know, under 17, that could be uh, some freshmen in high school, it could be some sophomores, but generally um, in their first couple years of rowing. So maybe some novices, hard to tell. Um, but as they, as the coaches come through with their, you know, with their crews and their rosters, they kind of figure out which, which basket do I put my eggs in and what, what is the greatest hope for being able to qualify for a youth national championship. So here at the Crew Classic, you get a chance to race in different categories. The U17, um, this referee cup is one of those categories that um, will be contested at the youth national championships later this spring. And these boats now moving into their final 250. As you make your way to the beach, you're going to see these boats flying by right now. Our women's under 17 is closing out here. Marin still holding on to that lead with Oakland Strokes sitting in lane two in second. You hear those cowbells going. A lot of those Marin supporters standing down there cheering on their team as they come home. Now we've got Newport in that third position there. You can see that NAC on the side of that white boat. That's Newport coming in, hoping to hold on to that third spot. San Diego Rowing Club looking like they have moved into fourth, having pushed out Wesley a little bit. And then we've got Capital following behind Wesley. And then Pacific sitting out in seven and Cathedral Catholic in eight at the back of the race there.
All right, and we're looking at another race start about ready to go off. This is the men's under 17 8. We've got seven boats on the course here. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Newport Seabase. Lane three, Los Gatos. Lane four, Oakland Strokes. Lane five, NorCal. Lane six, Wesley. And lane seven, Capital Crew. And we've got a start. Yeah, what we saw with that start, these are quick starts. So again, uh, the coxswain's got to be ready to go at any minute that the referee says. And we're looking at two crews here. That's Oakland Strokes and NorCal getting a little bit friendly with each other. The referees are going to be right on it, make sure that they get back into their lanes. Um, no interference or anything. And we definitely don't want to add meters on to the race. So a straight course is going to be the fastest course. Uh, but with a lot of action out there, it's challenging. These uh, it's very rare to get into situations where you've got seven to eight boats across. So this is a great experience for all of these crews. I like to think about those oars overlapping as just a nice, friendly high five to get the race started. Just two friendly crews saying hey to one another. Hey, just happy checking. we're out here together and we get to race at the same time together. What a great time we're having. Just want to make sure that you're awake and, and know that we're here. <laughs> It's definitely looking right now like we've got Marin sitting in that one position right behind them. Oakland Strokes, two familiar names in those one and two lanes and positions in the race. But again, we have plenty of crews. Sorry, Marin and Newport Sea Base. We've got plenty of crews here in this race to help it play out. Yeah, and coming up here um, is Wesley. Wesley out there in lane six. And definitely the special guests in our junior racing this year as they are the international uh, the international entrance to these youth races. So putting on a good show here is Wesley out in lane six. So right now your leader is Marin. They're followed by Newport Seabase and then all the way out in lane six, Wesley. So those are your top three crews at the moment. Also in the hunt, it's going to be Los Gatos. Los Gatos in the fourth, third or fourth place position. It's pretty tight there between Los Gatos and Wesley. Back in fifth, it's going to be Oakland Strokes, followed by NorCal, and then finally Capital. And this is really the time of the day when if you're here as a spectator, you may be new to the sport of rowing. This is a great opportunity to really take your shoes off, make your way down to the sand, enjoy what San Diego has to offer and what the Crew Classic brings to you, which is just an amazing rowing environment. There are a few opportunities to be able to spectate and enjoy the sport of rowing for a first time in an environment that's as welcoming as San Diego and Crown Point here. You get to put your feet in the sand. You get to have some drinks at the beer garden. You get to get some great food, walk around. You get to see boats and see great racing happening. So this is an amazing opportunity. I'd encourage you to find your way down to the sand for some of these finishing races here because it offers a really wonderful opportunity to spectate what happens as the end of the race comes on. Yeah, let's be honest. No one doesn't like to come to San Diego, especially with weather like this. It's a great place for mom and dad to come and, you know, support the kids as they come down the race course or support their college athletes, support your spouse if they're in the master's races. Um, so always a good time, I think, for everybody. Kind of a little mini vacation. Might as well enjoy yourself while you're watching some fast races. I think the spectators almost appreciate the San Diego Crew Classic more than the rowers There's do There's a points. lot to appreciate on land, for sure. All right, we've got some beautiful up-close shots here. This is that NorCal crew. But you can really see what the athletes are going through as they come down the race course, really making sure that the bodies are swinging in time, blades entering into the water together. Again, a lot of these athletes, probably in their first couple years of racing um, and really putting it themselves into a nice high-pressure situation here at the Crew Classic. But what we're looking at is a lead from lane one. That is Marin. Marin was second in this event last year. Next to them, um, a little bit off of their stern deck, is going to be Newport Sea Base. So it's shaken out a little bit. There's a little more separation between crews. So Newport Sea Base in that second place spot, followed now by Los Gatos. And then Wesley continuing out in lane six in that um, fourth or fifth place position. So as we pan out, we'll see a little better placement between crews. But what is clear is that Marin is your leader. 
and that water just looking absolutely beautiful right now with that afternoon sun starting to shine down. Certainly one of the things that the athletes get to enjoy while being out here is the warmth they feel of that sun on their shoulders. It is certainly not a cold race. This is one in which the athletes get to enjoy the elements and be out here, which certainly helps when you are deep in the throes of a race. You get to just be present to the race, to the work. And at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that we see with rowing is that from an outsider's perspective, rowing looks easy. It looks like you're just moving back and forth, putting an oar in the water and things go fast. But in reality, what's happening inside that boat is just an explosion of energy as their worlds melt into a tiny black hole that they can see nothing in front of them. And so as they get through here, at least they have the fact that they have nice warm weather on their shoulders. That's right. It's burning lungs and legs. That's the way that I like to think about it. So these guys definitely need to have a big dinner when they come off the water tonight. Get ready for the hot racing tomorrow because all of these crews will move on to the grand final tomorrow. Just maybe shaking out in a little bit different uh, lane, but they've definitely earned, earned their, uh, their spaghetti tonight. And when you hear the cowbells, you know that those boats are coming down towards the finish. Those cowbells starting to go. We've got Marin in one, Newport Sea Base in two, Los Gatos in three. Still looking pretty close here between Wesley and um, I'm going to say Oakland Strokes. So Wesley and Oakland Strokes for that fourth or fifth place position, maybe slight, slight advantage, I think is going to go to Oakland Strokes for that fourth place spot. Yeah, I think based off of what we're seeing here at the finish right now, as we get a true perspective, it looks like the Oakland Strokes have that leg up. We're probably going to get Wesley in that next position, followed by Capital and perhaps NorCal Crew at the last, but I can't be certain on that position. It may be Capital in the last position and NorCal Crew in that sixth position. Here come Oakland Strokes crossing the line. Next coming through is Wesley, followed by NorCal, and then Capital. And that is your race for the men's under-17, Cox State. Lining up now, we have Event 45, the Women's Youth B8, the Zlack Rowing Club Cup. Sitting in Lane 1, Marin. Lane 2, NorCal Crew. Lane 3, Saugatuck. Lane 4, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane 5, Newport. Lane 6, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane 7, Pacific. Lane 8, River City. This is a two-heat race, and this is the first of our heats. That quick start means that those crews were off quite quick. Those coxswains not having the ability to raise their hands or hold their crews. When that flag drops, hands are not being recognized, and that race is off whether they like it or not. 
Yeah, so much action out here. The coxswains really have to make sure that they've got their head on a swivel as they make sure, especially if you're out there in lane seven or eight, taking a look all the way across at lane one to kind of keep tabs on where your competition is, but also keeping the rowers' eyes in the boat. That's so important not to offset the balance of the boat by having your athletes look out. That's why the coxswains are considered the eyes and ears of the boat. What I love about an eight lane race in shots like that is it just looks like a cacophony of noise and raucousness happening as that race is taking off because you see eight lanes by eight oars with, well, eight oars with eight shells across. It's just a lot happening at every given point in time, and it makes for some really great footage. Absolutely. And here with this youth B8, again, you know, we've moved to age group categorizations of different boats. With the B8, the youth eight, I look at that kind of as the junior varsity eight, um, the second uh, the second eight um, in the program. Again, hard to tell because uh, some programs are much bigger than others and you have a whole variety of ages and experiences. But the much bigger crews are going to have the ability to race more boats in different categories. And right now doing a really nice job here out of lane three, it's going to be Saga Tech. Saga Tech looks like they have even a little bit of open water here early on in this race, followed by Marin. Marin was second in this category last year. Overall, uh, Marin in that uh, second place position, just ahead of NorCal, as well as Marina Aquatic Center in fourth. One of the best things that you can do to try and get your eyes on what's happening on these races, especially early on, because it can be tough. If you're standing on the beach looking down the course, it can be really hard to see where the race is happening. And so unless you have a pair of binoculars, looking to the big screens or tuning in online is your best opportunity to see lots of the shots of the action. Because rowing, while a great sport, this is the best way to see it during a regatta. It's the ability to have these drones flying overhead, tracking the racing, because it gives you such a wonderful opportunity to see the racing from overhead. You see all those boats like we were just looking at there, and it gives you a really clear perspective of where the race is going. Yeah, and I'm going to correct myself from that last call because that was not Marina in the fourth place position. That was Newport. Even as I've said that, the positioning has changed a little bit. Saga Tuck still out in front, um, but pretty close, though, between... Newport and NorCal uh, for, excuse me, Newport and Marin for that second second place position. Really tight between Marin and Newport. We're going to keep our eyes on lanes one and lane five for that second place spot. Um, again, this is a heat. So the top four boats will advance to a grand final. The remaining will move on to final B. And both of those, both of those finals are going to be pretty fast. Just depends on uh, which level you find yourself in. But right now, Sagatuck looking like they are holding on to that top spot. And now here we go with a little bit better of an angle. It does look like Marin is in that second place position. Also pretty close to them is going to be Newport and NorCal. Sagatuck looking very impressive in this race right now. That is quite the move to jump out from that lane three position. That tells you that they mean business. They are here to race in this one, and they want to make sure that they set themselves up going into that final 750 when they hit that to make sure that they are in the hunt, they are in the race, and they don't want to leave any stone unturned as to what they could do here and how they're going to execute their race plan. Yeah, and in those outside lanes, you can see these nice up-close shots here of River City right next to Pacific. River City, Pacific, San Diego, pretty close to each other as we come down um, a little bit closer towards the where the tents are in the spectator area. San Diego Rowing Club also in the mix. We'll see if we can get um, better placement for you as we come down a little closer uh, towards the finish. But right now, open water for Sagatuck as they come down the race course. Also open water on either side is going to be for Marin in that second place spot, followed by uh, NorCal crew in the in lane two. So NorCal looking like they've locked themselves into third, um, but Newport also in lane five, pretty close into where NorCal is. All right, those cl cl crews are getting close to the finish line. They're about to start hitting those tents. So now's your time to make your way down to the beach. If you have a dog in this fight, in this race, if you will, now's a great time to start heading to the beach to see these crews as they come by, making sure that you are ringing your cowbells 
chanting for your teams, making sure that they know that you're here, you would be amazed out on the water. I can speak from experience. You can hear those crews on the beach. You're close enough that no matter where you are lane wise, you can still hear the cheers for your team as you go by. So it is well worth for you spectators that are here to make sure that you are known and heard. And I can't believe I'm going to say this, but you can never have too much cowbell. So when you hear those, when you hear that cowbell coming from mom and dad, you know you're nearing the finish line. Sagatuck looking pretty golden here as they come towards uh, the final strokes for them, looking pretty solid and relaxed. There's no sense of urgency coming out of that crew. They can look down the race course and kind of feel comfortable about where they're at. Again, um, they know that they're going to be in one of those top qualifying position unofficially, but here. Here we go, final 250 meters and coming into the final strokes here in this Women's Youth B8 Zlack Rowing Club. So a trophy that's sponsored by our local club here on Mission Bay, uh, Zlack. Saugatuck sitting, sitting at about a 40 on their stroke rate right now. They are not going to leave anything to chance and they are looking strong. Every time that Orbla gets into the water, they are putting some horsepower behind those oars right now. They're taking that rate up. They are going to sprint this thing all the way through the finish to make sure that they lock in that position. Looking like in lane one, we've got Marin going to take that second place position. Looks like NorCal maybe in third place. Marina Aquatic Center, though, perhaps challenging. I'm sorry, Newport challenging from that outside position there. Looks like Newport may have moved up into that third position. With NorCal Crew, I believe, in fourth place. Then we've got Marina, followed by San Diego Rowing Club. That looks like Pacific, I'm sorry. Then San Diego Rowing Club. Well, then River City. And now Marina coming into that final position. And we're already back in the racing action here with yet another heat of the women's youth B8. This is another eight boat race in lane one, Newport, lane two, Oakland Strokes, lane three, Connecticut Boat Club, lane four, Marin, lane five, Holy Names, lane six, Capital Crew, lane seven, NorCal Crew, and lane eight, TBC Racing. Great close-up shot there of TBC Racing as they started out this race with some really powerful strokes. You can see a lot of horsepower in that boat, and indeed they are showing their speed here in the early moments of the the opening part of this youth b8 a lot of overlap here though between crews a lot of action on the water it does look like newport out in lane one does have that lead position just by a couple of seats over oakland strokes also looking pretty fast here and in contention for that top first or second position is marin in fourth it will be connecticut boat club followed by Holy Names out of lane five, but being challenged by TBC Racing. So pretty close here. Um, again, a lot of overlap between Holy Names and TBC. Um, I'm going to give the advantage right now to TBC Racing. In seventh, it's going to be Capital. And then in that eighth place spot, it will be NorCal.
All right, and there's a little update here. Newport looking really strong here along the shoreline. Newport in that top position. They're followed by Connecticut, or excuse me, Oakland Strokes in second. Very close to Oakland, it's going to be Marin and Connecticut. So Marin and Connecticut pushing each other all the way down the race course, maybe seeing if they can come up and challenge Newport for that top spot. Top four boats will advance to the grand final. And right now we're seeing some great racing amongst those top four crews. Also with uh, TBC Racing there uh, out of lane eight, looking looking very, very solid. I do love seeing Connecticut here. You got to love that, you know, primarily being a, a West Coast or an easy to access West Coast race. It's nice to see some of those Northeast crews make their way out here. And for those Northeast crews, they do spend so much more time indoors during the winter than we do out here. We have the luxury for those of us that are on the West Coast and even here in Southern California, our training year round gets to be outdoors. We don't ever get off the water. We get to spend a lot of our winters on the water. And so we, we can often take this for granted because we enjoy rowing here so much. And so I love to see those Northeast crews make their way here, seeing Connecticut in the race. You got to imagine how much they're loving being here and how much they're enjoying this weather. I don't know. It's been pretty cold this weekend and this and this has been a pretty wet winter. So pretty mild on the East Coast. Hard to tell, though, how much time on the water the crews get. But they're definitely not showing any signs of uh, coming out of the winter, just working indoors. It definitely looks like they've had some time on the water. Connecticut, always a very fast crew. But right now, that lead does belong to Newport. They're being chased by Oakland Strokes and then really hot on their heels. It is tight here between Marin and Connecticut. It's just kind of gone back and forth between those two boats for that third or fourth place position. We're also going to keep our eye on lane five, Holy Names. Holy Names and TBC Racing have been pretty close to each other for good portion of this race and then NorCal and Capital rounding out the field. Marin looking like they're starting to put a little bit of the heat there on Connecticut as they're starting to make a press through that open bit of water there. Newport and Oakland, though, still holding that one-two position. I think Marin's going to challenge and see what they're able to do as they move through this gap before they hit that next landmark. Rate-wise, it looks like they are about stroke for stroke right now, Connecticut and Marin. And so this is basically a battle of horsepower at this point. Who is able to put more onto the oar at the same rate? Currently, it looks like Marin is winning that race. Well, and interestingly, we've got the top three boats from last year in this race again. Probably totally different crews, but Newport was the winner in uh, the grand final last year, followed by Marin and then Saugatuck. Um, so actually, sorry, I, that would be the top two boats that are in this heat. And I'm cloaking, clocking both that Marin and Connecticut crew at a 36 right now. I just keep saying it, but 36 is about where almost every crew is ending up for this race. And Adrian, you called out that over the years, stroke rates for during race body pieces have start steadily climbed. And I would say that that is definitely true, looking at 36 being a very comfortable pace for a crew at an opening race for the season, it's only going to climb from here. Yeah. And that's what you have to do in order to maintain that uh, really strong base pace. And, you know, the level of fitness of these athletes is really just phenomenal. And obviously as they get older, only going to get better. And then they move up into college. And that's why a lot of these athletes become Olympians. So we're, we're looking at future Olympians out here on the water in San Diego. It's so much fun to kind of project where they could be five, 10 years from now. But right now it is Newport well ahead of the rest of the competition. We've got Oakland there in that second place position, really just all by themselves and now moving themselves solidly into that third place spot. It is going to be Marin just a little bit over Connecticut. You can tell plenty of people here for these teams. As we see Newport, Coming in for their finish, followed by Oakland Strokes. Marin sitting in that third position. Connecticut in that blue boat sitting in fourth. Following Marin, we've got Holy Names in five in that fifth position. Then it looks like we're going to jump out to that lane eight, TBC Racing. 
Then we're going to have Capital Crew in lane six, followed by NorCal Crew rounding out the backside of the race. Definitely not going to want to miss those grand finals tomorrow. Each level is going to be pretty fast, and I'm looking forward to some really fast racing tomorrow. Very competitive here in, um, at all levels, but with eight lanes across, always a lot of action, some good side-by-side -side competition. So we are on the men's youth B8, the Gene Jessup Hervey Cup. This is a two heat race with our top four making their way to the A final. In this race, lane one, Marin. Lane two, Newport. Lane three, NorCal Crew. Lane four, Long Beach Juniors. Lane five, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane six, Newport. Lane seven, Pacific. And it looks as if we have hit a breakage in our first 100 here. That race is stopped, which means we are most likely going to reset. We will come back to you with what is next. So it sounds like we had a false start up there for that heat one, which means that they're going to bring in heat two into the starting blocks. They're going to send heat one off to the side to loop back around and reset themselves up. So heat one will now become heat two. So if you were expecting to watch heat one come down the line, you are going to have a little bit of a break here. Those of you that were intending on waiting a little bit longer to watch heat two, Make your way up front because your race is going to be taking off here in just a moment as they line up. The second heat of race 49, the men's youth B8. This will be the second heat, race 78. Camp Land on the Bay has a full marina and complete range of boat and water sport rentals for use on Mission Bay. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Camp Land on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 2024 San Diego Crew Classic. Concept 2's ERG Data app lets you set up workouts, including the Concept 2 workout of the day, right from the app. You can customize your display, connect your Apple Watch, and more. Download ERG Data today. The original Broken Yoke Cafe started in 1979 in Pacific Beach and has since become a Southern California favorite for breakfast, brunch, and lunch. 
Broken Yoke Cafe is more than just a place to eat. It's a gathering spot for friends, families, and communities. Our cafes are designed to be comfortable and inviting, providing a relaxed atmosphere where conversation flows and memories are made. We are proud to be part of your mornings, whether it's a casual weekday breakfast or a leisurely weekend brunch. Life begins after breakfast at Broken Yoke Cafe. Coronado Brewing Company has been brewing abundantly hoppy West Coast style ales in the great tradition of San Diego craft beer since 1996. Founded by Ron and Rick Chapman in their hometown of Coronado, Coronado Brewing is a local brewery committed to bringing the spirit and flavor of San Diego to beer enthusiasts everywhere. Stop by the Coronado Brewing Beer Garden to enjoy one of their award-winning beers. Coronado Brewing Company. Stay coastal. The Oarboard is revolutionizing the sport of recreational rowing. Transform your paddleboard into a performance rowing boat for the freedom to row anywhere, anytime. Stable and safe, it rows in wind and waves. Boat wakes, no problem. Training, fitness, fun, and adventure with the amazing Oarboard. Oarboard is super portable, breaks down fast into its wheelie bag so it travels as luggage and stores easily in your home. It comes with two-part carbon sculling oars for easy transport. For a challenging workout or a leisurely row, the Oarboard Sup Rower is the top choice for recreational rowing. Visit the Oarboard tent on Vendor Row to learn more. Rival Kit is pleased to be the producer of the 2024 official Crew Classic Uni. Rival Kit understands the necessity of high quality, consistent gear, which allows rowers to push their limits in training and racing. Get your official 2024 San Diego Crew Classic Uni at the Rival Kit tent in the center of Ender Row. All right, our race 49 men's youth B eight plus. That is the Coxed eight Gene Jessup Hervey Cup. Heat two is lining up on the line now. We had a false start for our heat one, so they were sent back around. Right now in heat two, lining up, we have in lane one, Oakland Strokes. Lane two, Los Gatos. Lane three, Marin. Lane four, Saugatuck. Lane five. Newport Sea Base, Lane 6, Marina Aquatic Center. Those are our six crews in this race. This race looks like it is off. Wow, those overhead shots are absolutely beautiful. You can really get a sense of the the placement here between the boats in terms of their side by side. Some some boats getting a little cozy with each other, but um, all boats at this point look to be rowing cleanly. So as we come down the course, what now what we're going to look at is a lot of overlap. And as we get a little closer to that uh, dropping to, the, to that first 500 point, we're going to see a little more separation between boats because right now lanes one, two, and three are really close to each other. Oakland, Los Gatos, and Marin, all Bay Area crews, they race each other quite often throughout the season. So familiar with each other, probably a lot of those guys that uh, maybe know each other from cross racing. So between Oakland, Los Gatos, and Marin, not much separation. In the fourth place position, we're going to move over to lane five. That's Newport Sea Base, and Newport Sea Base right in the mix, just ahead of Sagatuck and Marina Aquatic Center. And it looks like Marin has taken themselves out to a bit of an early lead here. If I were to call it, I would say Oakland Strokes in two and Los Gatos in three, but that is a very tight two and three, so... I'm not sure I feel comfortable calling any position between the two of them. Then we are out two in lane five. It looks like Newport Sea Base maybe a seat or two up on Saugatuck in lane four, but also hotly contested there. So I don't think anything is too early to call at this point. 
We're not seeing anything out of lane six, Marina Aquatic Center. To me, that says that they are perhaps a bit off the back. Saugatuck having to take a bit of a jog there on their course. That could definitely hurt them a little bit. It looked like they may have been out of their lane there and nudging Newport Seabase over. So definitely, you know, we've said this before, but when that boat gets off course, it definitely adds drag to the boat, which slows things down, takes the crew out of their rhythm because you can feel that shift in the direction that the boat is moving. It means that those athletes have to compensate a little bit and so you can send that uh, you can send that crew into a bit of a, a challenge trying to keep up with that speed when the boat is moving back and forth. Challenge for the coxswain is if they're having any issues steering, it's not to alert the crew to that and keep everyone calm, keep everyone on pace. Right now, Sagatuck looking almost side by side with Newport Sea Base. Newport Sea Base with a bit of an advantage there for that fourth place position. Um, and then Marina Aquatic Center continuing in sixth. But now well out in front, it is Marin. You can see that nice straight shot all the way down the race course. Marin in a position that they can look down the race course behind them and really see that they've got some now good spacing between themselves, Oakland and Los Gatos. In this race, it will be four crews advancing to final A and the remaining two boats moving on to final B. So just a reminder that this is the second heat. So this is technically race 78, the second heat of the men's youth B8 Gene Jessup Hervey Cup. The first heat had a false start. They are back around. We'll be seeing them in the next race. So right now we are looking at heat two. Currently we are seeing Marin up in that first place position, followed by the Oakland Strokes in lane one and Los Gatos in that third place position. You can see our next three crews there looking like they're in one, two, three, Saugatuck, Newport Sea Base, and Marina Aquatic Center respectively in their lanes four, five, and six. That's right. And that fourth place position is going to be quite a race because that is a spot that's going to send you off to that A-level final. So between Sagatuck, Newport Sea Base, and Marina Aquatic Center, it's sure to tighten up as we get a little bit further afield towards that finish line. So let's keep our eyes on lanes four, five, and six. Uh, but well ahead, looking pretty comfortable. It is Marin. Marin with a good lead right now over both Oakland and Los Gatos. And you're getting a really great picture of the racing overhead right now, which gives us a clear insight into how these boats are stacked at the moment. We've got Marin clearly sitting in lane three in that lead position, followed by Oakland Strokes in second in lane one. Los Gatos, lane two in that third position. Saugatuck, lane four in that fourth position. Newport Sea Base in five and Marina Aquatic Center in sixth. Crews are starting to hit the beach. Here they are in their final 500. Lots of bodies down on the sand right now, catching this race as it finishes here. That doesn't look like standings are going to change much. But this is that opportunity to make them known that you are there cheering them on, helping them along in their race as they are about to reach the conclusion of their heat. These are really the building blocks of the varsity program here. This B8, this is a very, very fast boat. Um, not one that is raced at youth nationals, but certainly a lot of competitive athletes here that round out the varsity program. So right now, Marin looking great coming into that final strokes so with about a half a length of open water over Oakland. Oakland with about two lengths of open water over uh, Los Gatos. And then Los Gatos looking at a solid third place position. Sagatuck moving into fourth, leaving Newport in fifth, and Marina Aquatic Center in sixth.
And we are now back to our heat one of our men's youth B8, the Gene Jessup Hervey Cup. Again, in lane one, Marin. Lane two, Newport. Lane three, NorCal Crew. Lane four, Long Beach Juniors. Lane five, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane six, Newport. And lane seven, Pacific. This was heat one. They're coming back down the line after a false start, and their race is on now. Yeah, getting a little bit of those jitters out, um, coming off of the line after a false start, having to stop and then recalibrate, turn around, go back and do it all over again. Takes a little bit of the nervous energy out and it kind of makes you wonder, you know, hey, do we need to uh, make some changes in our start to make sure that we're a little bit more solid and that we do not false start? Because that would be... Um, that would be brutal to have to stop a second race. And I'm not sure that the officials would. I think that they um, would just, you know, keep going and, um, and you know, get this race down the race course. And certainly Marin with a nice start here. They already have a length advantage over Newport. Newport behind them in that second place position, followed now by a San Diego rowing club rowing out of lane five. Marin looking strong out in lane one, walking themselves ahead of Newport. Newport looking like they could be about even with what I believe are San Diego Rowing Club in that red shell, followed by Pacific and then Newport. What we're not seeing right now are NorCal Crew or Long Beach Juniors represented on the screen. My guess is that they are off the back. And so what we're seeing are lanes one, two, Five, six, and seven currently on our screens. Marin well ahead in that lead right now. And I believe San Diego Rowing Club and Newport challenging for second place at this moment. Now in these two heats, top four are going to the A final and the remaining will all be heading to the B final. Also important to note, there's two Newport entries in this heat. So this is a Newport B and Newport C. Generally, Newport will have a, a whole fleet of boats um, as we come through the San Diego weekend. I know it's quite a large program. They've got a lot of kids that are in development. Um, so really a testament to the strength of that program here to have two entries in this event. All right, beautiful overhead shot here as we see Marin continue to hold on to that lead in lane one, followed by Newport A. And then just off of their stern deck, it does look like uh, San Diego, maybe a little bit of open water for Newport A, but San Diego Rowing Club continuing in third. We'll look on the outside to Pacific for that, uh, for that fourth or fifth place position, followed by Newport B and then NorCal and Long Beach. And I believe based off of our last location, we can assume that Newport B and Pacific sitting on the outside are going to be in that four five position with San Diego Rowing Club sitting in third. Right now seeing that lead crew Marin really holding on to some distance there over Newport A. Newport A doing their best to settle in, stay strong, probably make sure that they're fighting off San Diego Rowing Club three lanes over. Could be a little tough when you've got that much space between you and the next crew that you're challenging to make sure that you're staying in contact. You don't want to turn that head too much on a swivel and throw the boat off. Your objective is to just use that peripheral vision to look out of the side of your eye rather than turn your head over. And so when you've got that much distance in the boat, in between two boats, it can be tough to resist that urge to want to look over and to want to peek and see what's happening, you just have to keep your head in the boat and continue on at your own race, hoping that your coxswain is paying attention to everything happening and making sure that you are getting the calls for the most important things that you need to know as the athlete. Definitely some different stroke ratings out here. We've got Marin uh, rowing at a comfortable about 32 strokes a minute because of where they're at 
on the race course right now, again, looking, um, I never necessarily want to say comfortable because rowing a race, a 2000 meter race is never comfortable, but they're looking like they're in a solid lead position and that they will move on to that A-level final. So they don't need to really ramp it up, um, but they do want to try and execute a really solid race. So Marin right here against the shoreline with that lead position, followed by Newport, and then super close together, it's going to be in that third place spot, San Diego, followed by Newport B. And here comes Marin across the line. Newport shortly behind them. And I'm going to make a little correction to myself. That is San Diego followed by Pacific and then Newport B. There's San Diego Running Club looking strong in that third position, crossing the line. Pacific about to get their horn and flag. There they are. Newport showing there in that blue shell. And then there we see what I believe is Long Beach coming down the course. They will be at the back of the pack here. All right, so this is actually our first final of uh, the San Diego weekend, This is, or the first final for our juniors. This is final level C, and just two boats are on the course. Coming down the center of the race course, it's going to be River City, closest to our shoreline, and then uh, Marina Aquatic Center, a little bit farther away. So uh, River City rowing out of lane three, and then Marina Aquatic Center in lane four. So this is a bit of a dual race, and these boats kind of side by side, as we come into the early strokes of this event, we'll follow them. We'll pick them up a little bit farther down the race course, but right now there's a good amount of overlap. Boats are really just side by side.
All right, in this final sea, again, River City and Marina Aquatic Center right next to each other, almost stroke for stroke. A little bit of a different mentality when you're looking at just one other crew to race. So really trying to make sure that you row cleanly. They, you know, really had just been on the race course. So they only got a, a little bit of time to rest, to recalibrate, kind of figure out what they want to do on this piece. They really want to make sure that they come off the water feeling good, feeling strong and consolidated. And this is competitive. These boats really are side by side. I'm going to give a slight advantage right now to River City for that lead over the Marina Aquatic Center. But both boats pretty close. And when you've got two shells like this on the water, I mean, this is almost a practice, what, what you experience in practice, where you may not have a fleet of boats able to race each other. And so these moments can be so much more intense because there's nobody else to race other than that singular boat. And so you're able to put all of your focus onto what that other boat is doing and how your boat is performing. And this can be a really excellent testing ground for how a crew is able to perform. And as we come into the finish, it looks like these two crews are staying about where they have the rest of the race. But this is making for a really great finish. These, tr these two crews in close contact with each other. And true that the heats really uh, kind of shook it out so that we've got um, crews of similar speed in the finals. And that's what we're looking at right there in this third level final, River City and Marina, really close to each other. River City rowing in uh, the Port of Sacramento and the Deep Water Channel. And then Marina Aquatic Center rowing in Marina Del Rey right next to where UCLA rows. But this is a race all the way down to the line. Great race here between Marina and River City. And indeed, it looks like Marina might have overtaken River City just at the finish here. What a move. In. And the bow first across the line will be Marina Aquatic Center. And there's River City. Wow. Marina Aquatic Center held back that whole race and staged that sprint. What an amazing push at the end there to put themselves into the lead to take the first victory of the weekend in that final. All right, lining up now, we have our A final of the Men's Masters Club Quad. Wyandotte. We have in lane one, Texas Rowing Center. Lane two, Wyandotte. Lane three, River City. Lane four, Lake Washington. Lane five, Cambridge. Lane six, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane seven, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane eight, Pacific. This is a loaded race, eight lanes across. 
our men's masters club quad. This is our first final. These were our our one through four placings from the heats. These boats lining up, looking like they are off and running. And in this Masters Club quad, we're seeing a good cross-section of competitors from all across the country. We've got Michigan, Texas, California, Washington, Massachusetts, really just a um, great opportunity here for um, all of these clubs represented from across the country to come out and compete against each other. So with eight boats, um, we're really looking at, um, at seven boats. One boat is gonna be an exhibition boat, that is lane eight. So right now we're gonna pay close attention to lanes one through seven. Right now it looks like our leader is going to come out of lane two, that's Wyandotte, they're from Michigan. So Wyandotte looking to pull about a length up on both uh, Texas Rowing Center and Lake Washington. So Texas and Lake Washington close to each other for that second or third place position. In fourth, it's going to be River City, River City rowing out of the deep water port of Sacramento. Just behind River City in fifth place, it will be Cambridge Rowing Club, Cambridge from Massachusetts, of course. Cambridge just slightly ahead of San Diego Rowing Club. And then it uh, looks like two entries here from San Diego. So San, San Diego Rowing Club A and B right next to each other for that sixth and seventh place position. All right, it does look like our leader continues to be Wyandotte there in lane number two. Good challenge though, between lanes one and four. So again, Texas Rowing Center and Lake Washington pretty close to each other. In fourth, it continues to be River City. And then we move to the inside of the course for that fifth place spot, which is gonna go to Cambridge. Cambridge followed by both San Diego entries. And there's that great overhead shot, which gives us a really nice clear picture of what's happening in the racing. You can see that this race is spread out quite a bit at this point. Looking like in lane two, we've got Wyandotte appearing as if they are in the lead next to lane one, Texas Rowing Center, which may be challenging for that lead at this point. Then out to lane four, Lake Washington, followed by River City in lane three in that fourth place position. It's a bit of a toss-up right now between Texas Rowing Center and Wyandotte, both of those two crews sitting there. All 
All right, it's heating up a little bit there in lanes one and two between Wyandotte and Texas Rowing Center. Texas Rowing Center really pouring it on here in the last half of this race. See if they can come up and challenge And Indeed, I think that they have taken over the lead from lane two. Still pretty close behind, though. It is Lake Washington. Lake Washington rowing out of lane four in the Seattle area, primarily Masters Club, focusing on Masters racing there in the Seattle area. Just behind them, River City. River City with both a Masters and a Juniors program. They row on the same body of water as UC Davis. So a lot of action in the Sacramento area in terms of rowing. And these top four crews pushing themselves well ahead. This is a final. The top four boats... Um, came out of the heats, out of the uh, multiple heats to fill out this race, eight boats across. In fifth, it continues to be Cambridge, followed by lane seven, San Diego Rowing Club, and then lane six, San Diego Rowing Club. Again, lane eight Pacific is an exhibition. All right, and in this final 500 meters here, we see that black flag as they come into the spectator area. Texas Rowing Center taking over that lead position that Wyandotte has helped for most of this race. So Texas really heating it up, taking up the stroke rating, coming against the shoreline here. You can see that bright yellow boat looking really strong and consolidated is that Texas Rowing Center boat. Wyandotte in the bright red shirts looking also strong, but just not able to hold off the charge that Texas Rowing Center is pouring on. And now this being an age handicap race, it's important to note that the finish, the results are going to be found when you actually look at the results page because they will be applying the handicap to this race after the fact. So what you are seeing is the actual placing right now may not be the actual placing of the race when it all shakes out after the handicaps have been added to the race. It looks like lane one there, Texas Rowing Center finishing first. Wyandotte following behind. Then we've got Lake Washington crossing, followed by River City. Then I believe we're going to have Cambridge from lane five. Then San Diego Rowing Club in lane seven. Then we've got Pacific, lane eight, and San Diego Rowing Club from lane six. And a lot of spread in between these boats. But again, as it is a handicap race, we're going to wait to see for the official results. Um, because like we said earlier, you could win the race, but actually come in last. You could come in last and still win. Is a win still a win if you don't win? I guess that is the question <laughs> when it comes to handicap racing. All right, and as our final crew crosses over the finish line, we're going to actually pick up the next race already in progress and at the halfway point. That is the Women's Masters Club Quad. Again, this progressed from heats, so we had four boats come out of the heat uh, to round out this grand final. In lane one, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane two, Endeavor Racing. Lane three, Lake Washington. Lane four, Texas Rowing Center. Lane five, Zlack. Lane six, College Club Seattle, Lane 7, Texas Rowing Center, and Lake eight, Lane 8, Lake Union. So two Texas Rowing Center entries. So we'll try and keep them separate here as we try and gather our wits about us with an eight-boat race. Um, always good to give it a little bit of time so we can find the placement as things shake out down the race course. And here we are at the thousand with these boats. Once we get the opportunity to see an overhead shot, that'll be able to tell us where the current standings are with these boats. And we'll see how the racing has shaken out through the first half. It looks like Endeavor Racing sitting in the lead right now with Texas Rowing Center in second. 
followed by San Diego Rowing Club in third and Lake Washington in fourth with a possible Lake Union sitting on the outside being in that third place position. A little tough to tell at this moment. Again, this being a handicapped race, though, it's important to keep in mind that the finishings will be adjusted based off of age handicap. In the sixth place spot in that bright yellow boat, really easy to see there in the center of the race course is Zlack, Zlack rowing here on Mission Bay in San Diego. In the seventh and eighth place position, a little too hard for us to call between College Club Seattle and Texas Rowing Center, that second entry from Texas Rowing Center. So those boats passing that red flag means they are inside that final 500 meters here. When you sniff that out as an athlete, you know you've got 1,500 down, 500 meters to go. It seems like anything is possible, and yet it is light years away. And so this is one of those moments where you've got to commit to go. And when you know a race with an age handicap, you know that going is important because you cannot leave anything to chance if there's an opportunity that, that another crew could make a change in position based off of the age handicap against you. So regardless of if you want to go or not, you've got to put pedal to the metal to make sure that you finish strong in every single race where an age handicap matters. Right now, Endeavor and Texas Rowing Center sitting almost side by side. And then we have a three-boat race across with San Diego Rowing Club, Lake Washington, and what I believe to be Lake Union on the outside there. So three boats sitting in potentially that third place position. I think we're definitely going to see Endeavor or Texas Rowing Center take one and or two. And then we'll see what that third position looks like as those boats come into this finish line. Yeah, and this is really an all-star crew here at the Endeavor Racing Quad. That is uh, Cass Cunningham in the second seat there. She's also the coach of this boat. So, man, she can really give them some good insight on the race course in live time. So um, a great crew with uh, women with a lot of experience in that quad. So rowing beautifully as they come into the finish, holding off a good charge here by that Texas Rowing Center boat. And now we're getting a real look at that San Diego Rowing Club, Lake Washington, and Lake Union spread. It looks like it's going to be Lake Washington ahead, Lake Union behind them, and San Diego Rowing Club coming in that fifth place position. Now we have Zlack coming across the line. And my apologies, I've been calling Lake Union that whole time. That was Texas Rowing Center that came in that third place position, I believe. And now we have Lake Union crossing. And this is race 82, the Men's Masters Club Quad.
we're going to be picking up the start here and then we'll be picking up right in the middle of the race at the thousand where we are live right now lane one we have long beach lane two Antares. lane three lake Merritt. lake four Antares. lake lane five east bay lane six pacific and Antares Rowing Club from Mexico. This is truly an international race here at San Diego uh, Crew Classic. Antares Rowing on, at the site of the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. So a uh, storied, storied body of water that they get to train on every day uh, must be something that's truly special. And this is the B final. So two races ago, we saw the A final. This is the B final coming down the course for the Men's Masters Club Quad. And at any moment, we'll be picking up the live racing with this race, seeing where they are. It looks like we have Lake Merritt sitting in the lead right now, followed by Long Beach. Then Antares in lane two in that third position, followed by East Bay. And then Antares again. And perhaps that Pacific boat is off the back and we're not able to see them right now. And Lake Merritt, a uh, small community program that rose on, no surprise, Lake Merritt in downtown Oakland. Really quite a picturesque spot surrounded by uh, tall buildings with the Oakland skyline, but really a special place to row. Um, those of you that uh, row Masters will probably have raced there in one of the regional championships for Masters. Um, Lake Merritt always putting out some really strong sculling boats, and we're seeing that here in this B-level final for the Men's Masters Club. So Lake Merritt, Slipping back now to that second place position, Long Beach overtaking them for that lead. Antares out of Mexico City in that third place spot, followed by East Bay, a true community club rowing on the Oakland Estuary. East Bay is comprised of a lot of uh, Oakland citizens anywhere between um, in, in that Oakland area, some with experience, some that are brand new to rowing. Um, but they take very seriously getting people onto the water and giving them equal access um, to all sorts of uh, opportunities to row and learn. So East Bay out here in that fourth place position, they're followed by the second entry from Antares and then finally Pacific Rowing Club, uh, which rows on Lake Merced in San Francisco. And a really nice push here by Long Beach to have overtaken Lake Merritt in the final strokes of this race. That was an excellent timed opportunity to make their move and push through Lake Merritt. Here comes Antares. We'll call that Antares A boat coming across the line. Then East Bay from lane five, making their finish known, followed again by Antares B. And then in the red unis out there on the far lane, we have Pacific making their way down the course. And as this race wraps up, that leaves us with one left for the day. This will be the Women's Masters Club Quad B Final coming up next. And now we've got the Women's Masters Club Quad, the B final taking off there. The race is on. They're about to hit their halfway point. But right now on the screens, we are seeing their start in lane one, Lake Merritt. Lane two, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane three, Sacramento Aquatic Center. Lane four, College Club Seattle. 
So we have those two bright red boats right in the center, San Diego Rowing Club, right next to the Sacramento Aquatic Center, also in a bright red boat. Um, so we'll keep an eye on those two crews as they come down the race course on the outer outer ends. College Club Seattle getting a little bit of steering here from the referees as they come out of the start. Um, again, these athletes with varied levels of experience. Some of these athletes may be taking up an oar as they um, have been in their 40s or 50s, maybe even 60s, a new opportunity for them. And that's one of the things that's so great about Masters Rowing is that you see a lot of different levels, a lot of different types of athlete that come into the sport. But well ahead already is Lake Merritt. Lake Merritt looking pretty clean here, rowing out of lane one, right up against the shoreline. They are followed by an entry from San Diego and then Sacramento next to them. In fourth, it will be College Club Seattle. Lake Merritt sitting in that one position now as we catch up with their live locations here. Lake Merritt sitting well in the lead over what looks to be Sacramento Aquatic Center in two and San Diego Rowing Club in third in flip-flop positions. So Sacramento Aquatic Center in lane three, but second place, San Diego Rowing Club in third place, but lane two. And then we have College Club Seattle lane four off the back at this moment. And these guys getting a little bit of the brunt of the wind now. The wind has picked up just a little bit. Of course, it's not anything that's super concerning, but definitely makes for more challenging conditions, maybe a little bit uh, slower as they progress down the race course. Um, but all boats rowing cleanly. We just want to make sure, you know, one of the, the refs as they follow these boats down the race course want to make sure that everyone is safe and that they are um, exactly where they need to be. There is no coxswain in these boats. So generally what happens is that the athletes are steering with the power of the oars. Uh, sometimes there is a steering mechanism attached to the foot of the bow person. So um, hard to tell, but uh, much easier definitely if you have a rudder that helps to steer that boat. But who is doing a great job is Lake Merritt. Lake Merritt already coming into the spectator area. So well ahead of the rest of the field, Lake Merritt with that solid lead in this B-level final. They're going to be followed by Sacramento Aquatic Center and then San Diego Rowing Club in third with College Club Seattle just a little bit outside of that screen. And again, this is our Women's Masters Club quad, our B final, which attached to it is going to have an age handicap. So important to note, again, all results that we see of the actual finishings are not the true results. Those true results will come after those age handicaps have been applied. So make sure that you are checking the San Diego Crew Classic.org website for live results. And that will give you the official finishings of how these crews have done throughout the day. No matter how trustworthy we are here in the booth, it's important that you look to the live results, not just those of us on the microphone, for your action. And now we are seeing Lake Merritt well inside this final 250. They have taken a commanding lead in this race as they are bringing their way to the finish line. Behind them, we know that we have Sacramento Aquatic Center and San Diego Rowing Club who are battling it out for that second position. And College Club Seattle sitting back in that fourth spot. And this looks like San Diego Rowing Club in that third place position to Sacramento Aquatic Center. 
Off the back there, we see in the yellow jerseys out in lane four, College Club, Seattle. And here they come crossing the line, Sacramento Aquatic Center. In lane three, taking that second position, San Diego Rowing Club. In lane two, taking the third position in the Women's Masters Club Quad B Final. All right, and encouraging our last crew here um, of the day. This is going to be our final race for this second day of racing here at the San Diego Crew Classic. Tomorrow we will be back with really fast boats in grand finals, B-level finals as well for both juniors and collegiate as well as revisiting some master's races. So it's going to be a great day of racing. It's going to be even better weather I'm going to put myself out there and say that, and we'll see you tomorrow.